Good afternoon, everybody. Today is the Board of County Commissioners' regular meeting of August 26, 2020. We have uh, just two commissioners here in the room, Patty Clapper and myself. And then George Newman and Greg Pushman are on the Zoom meeting from home, and Kelly McNicholas Curry is in Iowa. <laughs> Assistant Deputy County Manager Rich Engelhardt is at the airport for his part of the meeting, and we have Andrew Shoemaker here in the room doing IT for us. So welcome, everybody. First on the agenda, we have to see if there's any additions or deletions, and I don't believe that there are. No, sir, we don't have any additions or deletions to the agenda today. Okay. Second, we have public comments. Uh, the call-in number is posted on our agenda and also on the grassroots screen. Um, we also, first off, we're going to have Valerie McDonald, our emergency man management uh, person, give a report on a wildfire update. So, Valerie, we'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Valerie McDonald, Pitton County Emergency Manager. Joe and I were at the BOCC meeting two weeks ago to give you a pretty grim report about wildfire conditions in the entire Northwest Colorado. I'm sorry to say nothing has improved in the last two weeks. Um, all of the data that we follow has worsened. Our conditions are much more dangerous than they were in 2018 when we had the Lake Christine fire. Fuel moisture levels continue to drop and the energy release component, the data we follow continues to increase. We had a briefing from the Weather, National Weather Service yesterday and I just want to forewarn everyone, we're going to have a little bit of a reprieve in the weather here. It will be a little bit cooler. They expect some precip today, but it's short lived. And after the next couple of days, the extended forecast for three to four weeks is hotter and drier again. And with the little bit of reprieve we're getting right now, with that will come lightning and winds. And as we've mentioned before, under these conditions, if we get a fire start, it's very, very difficult to suppress them. With the stage two fire restrictions, we, we've done what we can to um, eliminate, not eliminate, but to lessen the possibility of human caused starts, but we still have the lightning risk and, and numerous other things. So we don't want people to let their guard down. If you want more information on how to prepare, you can go to pitkinswildfire.com. You know, do the basic mitigation work around your house, clear defensible space. But at this point, we really strongly urge we're, we're actually pleading with the public to have an evacuation plan. Uh, sign up to receive the emergency alert notifications, pitkinalert.org, and be ready to go if you get an evacuation notice. And I will stop at that. Are there any questions? Thanks, Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. Any questions from board members? I don't see any, Valerie. Thank you very much for the update on that. Thank you. Okay, we have a long list of people on the phone. Some of you are probably here for things later in the agenda. And we don't have names attached to these, so I think, do they have a way they can raise their hand? Yep. So folks, if you press star nine. <laughs> if you press star nine on your phones, that will raise or lower your hand. So if you want to speak now in public comment, please press star nine, and we will call on you as you raise your hands. So we have the number ending in 8771. Let's call on you first. Your hand went up first. You may speak now. Hello, this is Natasha Kyler on behalf of Res. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, good afternoon to you. I just wanted to let you know that I'm calling in to listen and to be available in case there are any questions regarding item number 12 on your agenda. That's the conservation easement, which pertains to the Aspen Consolidated Sanitation District and the Pickens Solar Project. 
I understand that the county's attorney's office has recommended approval of that ordinance and that this is the second and final reading. And I just wanted to let you know I'm here and thank you for your consideration on that matter. Okay, and what was your name again? Natasha Kyler. Oh, Natasha, hi. We have met before. So, Na <laughs> Natasha, you? you could speak when we get to that item later, later in the day, too. But thank you for letting us know you're here. Thank you. Okay, next up we have the number ending in 5635. Right. Go ahead. We can hear Hi. you. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is Lee uh, Mulcahy, and you guys know, y'all know I'm grateful for so many things. Uh, the most important, I think, is, um, is is I have a pistol for my mom, and um, I know you guys love her. So uh, our, I guess you saw the article about um, AFSHA breaking more laws. Uh, recently and you know um, I think just to put it one sentence if we could Tom Smith has served this community well but I do think it is now past time for him to retire he's been Apsha's uh, attorney for over three decades he's made a lot of money he's built a big old castle in Carbondale but it's time for Tom to move on and let me just read from the article please the Aspen Times last week asked the Colorado Open Records Act for an audio recording of a portion of the executive session in which compensation was discussed. Smith said a recording does not exist. According to the open meeting law, a board must have an electronic recording in the executive session, except if the board's legal counsel certifies that the discussion involves a matter of attorney-client privilege. Smith, who represented the town of Assault in 2016, was found culpable along with the Salt Town Council for violating the state's open meetings law for not properly noticing executive session. Uh, and I would point out that Smith, in the article state, Smith added that he, along uh, with other Apsha and city staff, were not present for the compensation discussion. He said that he left the room after the discussion about litigation, which was properly noticed, was over. Okay, now, um, you believe that, I've got a lot of swamp land that I'd like to sell you. Uh, you know, um, Tom Smith has been investigated by the Colorado Supreme Court's Attorney Regulation Council for dishonesty before. And I don't think we need to go through another divisive uh, lawsuit where, uh, where public officials are, because I would point out that a member of this board, uh, actually the representative for this board on APSHA, let me find it here in the article, Or just let me paraphrase. Uh, when in the Times sent emails to the uh, board members asking about this this uh, breaking of the law, and one of the board members, a, a member of this board, responded and said uh, he did not even admit that they, he said they discussed it uh, not in a public session, but he failed to mention that they did it in executive session. And I think he, we all know he knows better, but he's going to be. He's term limited, and he's off that board in January, and I guarantee you we will still be on appeal wherever. So I, I think that my appeal to this board is to, to, to lobby your fellow board members for peace, for, 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 for negotiation here. We, you know, we, the, the last settlement that we presented to Tom, he's completely resistant to any kind of settlement. He's like, he's not going to even present it to the board, and that included us selling the property as long as we can rent it back. And and I think the way forward is peace. Thank you guys so much for the time. I hope I didn't run over. You guys all stay healthy. All right, thank you, Lee. And you're just right about on the right time there. Okay, anyone else uh, wanna raise your hand? If you wanna talk about something later in the agenda, wait till later, we have a lot of public hearings later on during the agenda. So was that star nine, Andrew? Star nine, if you want to raise your hand to speak now about an item not on the agenda.
and no one's raising your hand, I'll assume that you are here to listen to, uh, or to comment, listen to and comment about things later in the agenda. Okay, um, moving on, we'll go to commissioner comments. Patty. Yeah, um, I just want to remind people the census, the census date has been jumping around and now for some reason it was moved from September 30th to, um, no, from August 31st to October 31st to September 30th. So you have a, a little over 30 days to get your census done. It takes five minutes online. You don't have to have a code number. You can just go on there, put in your information. It doesn't take but a few minutes. Please do it. It's really important for the county to provide services. Um, we really need everybody to count. And Kelly, correct me on this, but I think the website is my2020census.com or .org. I can't remember, um, but it's really easy to find. Does anybody remember it right off the top? No. <laughs> I will get back to people because I know I have it somewhere to verify that. Kelly's looking for it right now. <laughs> but it's really important that people get their census done. Please, we depend on that money to provide services, a whole range of services um, throughout our community. It also helps with redistricting our congressional district uh, which may add another congressperson to the state of Colorado, and it would be nice to have somebody on this side of our congressional district to represent our values and our positions. Kelly, does she have it? Kelly? Yeah, I do. It's my2020census.gov. .gov. Okay, thank you. So please, get her done. Not or if Patty's done. I'm done. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Kelly. Okay. Um, thank you, Pat. It, you know, that's the equivalent of a $2,300 check being written on your behalf to the state of Colorado. Um, so we just ask people to recognize that those resources are incredibly valuable, so your response really matters. I also want to point out, since Patty mentioned it, that you may remember long ago in 2016, the voters in Colorado passed ballot initiatives to create independent redistricting commissions. And those will look at um, the legislative districts in, in the state, at the state level of government, as well as the reapportionment for federal um, government seats. And those commissions are now accepting applications from individual citizens in Colorado who wish to participate in helping to have a, um, you know, free and fair and independent approach to how our district borders are designed. Um, so, you know, um, you can find that information pretty easily in a Google search. Uh, the, the makeup of commissions is split evenly among Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliated. So your party preference does not matter, but your participation could very much matter um, in helping us have fair districts and you know equitable voting across the state. So I would encourage people to consider that if they find that to be interesting. Um, elected officials are not allowed to sit in those commissions, so it really is a truly citizen-based uh, process. Um, I also want to take a moment to um, you know, also on the thread of our democracy, just vehemently denounce some of the rhetoric and efforts that are happening across our country right now to undermine the legitimacy of the 2020 election. And there are um, incitements of intimidation. There are incitements of violence that are being made. This is not how America functions. This is not in keeping with the history of our country. This is how third world dictatorships or emerging nascent democracies behave. This is not, this is not to the standard of our country. This is not who we are as Americans. Every person should have free and fair and easy access to the polls without intimidation by anyone and to be able for their votes to be counted 
um, fairly and quickly. So I just want to urge that everybody take the time to educate yourself wherever you live as to where your voting, your ballot originates. Usually it is at a very local level. The advantage of our elections in America is that they are highly decentralized. So what you may hear from rhetoric from our national leaders um, and others around the country is likely to be false. Our elections are decentralized. Your count, typically county clerks, in some states they're at the municipal level. These are nonpartisan people, nonpartisan offices who are working very hard to count your vote and to make sure that your vote um, is obtainable by you and your ballot is obtainable by you. So take the time to figure out what that office is, ask questions of those offices, and ensure your registration information is up to date. Now is the time to do that. For Pitkin County, that's at pitkinvotes.com. That will give you all the links to any questions you may have as far as to check your voter registration, to check the address your mail ballot will be mailed to, to check when it will be mailed to you and when you should look for it in the mail. It will give you options if you do not feel comfortable having your ballot come through the mail given all of the service delays with the post office, how you may either pick up that ballot in person or cast your vote in person. And you can do that early. November 3rd is too late to be thinking about all of that. So I have real concerns about what November 3rd may look like in this country, how these elections may be finally counted and certified, and the threats that are being made right now are completely intolerable. And I think it's up to each of us to denounce them and to ensure that all of our neighbors can freely and fairly cast their vote. Thanks for the time, Steve. Well stated, Kelly. Hey, well spoken, Kelly. Other commissioner comments? I would like to take this moment to reiterate what Valerie McDonald said about wildfires. It is, even though in spite of a couple of small rainstorms in the last couple of days, things are still extremely dry, it only would take a couple of one or two lightning strikes in different parts of the county and anybody who lives in Pickens County would be in an area that could potentially have to be evacuated. So I urge everybody to be planning an evacuation right now just in case so you will be ready. You will have thought through the steps you're going to take. You will have your go bag packed with essential things like financial records or a copy of the, your hard drive from your computer, uh, your essential medicines that you might need in the next few days and those sorts of things, um, irreplaceable family photographs, those kind of things you should have in your go bag. So take the time now just to be ready because in the event of an emergency, you might not have time to get anything together besides just getting yourself out safely. And that's the most important thing, getting yourself and your family to, to a safe place. You might lose everything else you own, uh, but if you think ahead, at least you can take some important things with you. So thank you. Um, any further commissioner comments? And I'm not seeing any. We'll go on to our consent items. Uh, I have the second one I want to ask a question about, so we'll do these one at a time. The first is the minutes of August 12th. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? second okay uh, let's move is there any discussion any questions on any of the minutes seeing none all in favor of approval say aye 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 okay five two oh in favor second item is a ratification of the assessor's determination of an abatement petition for over $10,000 for Blaine and Alexa Wessner residents. 
And um, I'll ask my question first. And Larry Fight is here in the room. He will be uh, able to answer my question. I'll give it a shot. Okay. So looking at the map on this one, Larry, uh, the, t the two properties are adjacent. I presume it's because they're adjoining lots with Correct. the same ownership, but that's Correct. why Correct. the abatement um, is, is here before us. Um, but on the second lot where the house isn't, they've, there actually is a driveway and it looks like a building pad has already been constructed there as if there is going to be a house there. Is that taken into consideration uh, when you're looking at, um, you know, the use of the two adjoining properties? Well, uh, if enough construction has been commenced uh, that it could be classified as residential of its own accord, uh, we would do that. Uh, so my guess is that uh, with that particular property, for the time period in question, uh, there was nothing uh, constructed on the property uh, that it would reach a, a residential classification of its own accord. Um, I don't know if uh, it seems like they have since built uh, or started building a second house, uh, and I can't remember if it was on that lot in particular, uh, but uh, for the dates in question, there was not uh, enough on the lot uh, in question uh, to classify as a residential parcel of its own accord. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, with the two adjoining lots, it still is classified as residential because it's attached to the and, and under common lot. ownership. And it's not classified as uh, developable. I don't know. What no, it, it previously had been classified as vacant land. Vacant and, land and is separately saleable. Uh -huh. uh, and it's only because of this change of uh, the, the application of this law that it's received the, the residential classification now because it's contiguous to the home on the adjacent lot and both are under common ownership. Okay, okay. I was thinking that was going to be your answer. I just wanted to just double check on it. No, I Because when I that. looked at the map, it looked like they were already probably doing construction there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Time um, So, uh, uh, yeah, I don't have any questions. This is just we're still cleaning up those, those adjacent lots that are yeah. undeveloped. And this one was originally part of the pile uh, that first came before you guys back right. in June, and and for whatever reason it just uh, didn't get didn't get in the pile. Missed. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. Okay. I, um, yeah. If there's not any more questions, I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, it's been moved to approve. I can second. Greg seconded. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you, Larry. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, nice Larry. To you. Good Stay to see safe. you in person. Yes, you too. <laughs> okay, moving on to individual consideration items. These are first readings set for public hearings on September 9th. First one is a resolution amending, uh, let's see, amending resolution number 100-2014 and approving an amended intergovernmental agreement between the BOCC and the Aspen Fire Protection District for maintenance, repair, and fuel supply for the district's vehicles. And I see we have Brian Pettit on here to present, and I also see Rick Ballantyne here from the Aspen Fire Protection District. Good to see you, Rick. So, Brian, we'll turn it over to you to present. Thanks, Steve, I appreciate it. I'm Brian Pettit, I'm the Public Works Director for the County. Uh, in addition to Rick Ballantyne, the Aspen Fire Chief, we have uh, Justin Dukeshire, our fleet manager, is available too, to answer questions. But uh, just as a matter of history, about five years ago, the board directed staff to enter into an agreement with Aspen Fire to provide maintenance, repair, and fuel for all their equipment and vehicles. So for the last five years, we've been doing that in the fleet department. And I will say uh, from a county perspective, it has worked very well. 
I think the, the team orientation there is uh, beneficial for the community. We have highly certified technicians taking care of their equipment. And with that, I will uh, toss it to Justin to go over kind of the nuts and bolts of what the agreement is and uh, how it's changed from the last agreement. And then maybe uh, Rick would like to chime in on his perspective of how the agreement's been working. So Justin. Great, thank you, Brian. And Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Justin Dukesher, the Fleet Services Senior Manager. I believe I've met everybody before at some point or another, so it's good to see you again. Um, just to reiterate what Brian said, we've been in an internal agreement with uh, Aspen Fire for the last five years. Um, I think that relationship's gone well. I think it's continuing to grow, and I think it's a great benefit to the community, the county, and overall public safety. So we would, the fleet, <laughs> viewpoint on this is we would like to continue with this contract or renewing this contract with a few changes. Um, just to get everybody up to speed, the, the county's been raising fees and costs have been increasing over the last, you know, forever, but over the last five years as it relates to Aspen Fire. So really the contract remains the same except for an increase in labor, which was at 110 per hour. Now it's gonna move to 160 per hour which is in line with all the county labor billing across the board. Um, they're gonna, we're gonna increase their parts markup percentage from 15 to 25%, and then they'll get fuel at the current county rate. Um, the Aspen Fire right now has 29 units we take care of. That's up about 10 or 11 units as well from back in 2014 when this, when this contract was first signed and initiated. Um, so we, we've seen an increase. Um, and, it, and it's been great for us. So with, with, the, with the markups and the increases, um, this is designed to cover our costs, our overhead, and our specialty training. Um, we have, right now we have three master um, emergency vehicle technicians, specifically in fire. There's less than 500 certified master technicians in the country, and we have three right here in Aspen. So we, we, we're pretty proud of that. And, wow. Um, Chief Valentine and Aspen Fire has helped us uh, achieve that goal as well. Hmm. Thank so, you. thank you, Justin. You're that, welcome. That kind of answers the question I had, which was, what kind of special training do you have to have? And that's really great to hear that we already have people who have done the training and are qualified for working on this really highly specialized equipment. Yes. We, we train all the time, we test twice a year. You can only test twice a year for EBT specifically, and that's in addition to the rest of our certification program that we have here. Uh, Greg? Yeah, great, thanks Justin. Rick, good to see you here. Um, uh, just regarding the term, I understand it says uh, so agreements for a one year term, but it automatically renews for five. So is that what we had before? term was the same but uh, you want you had to make some changes so you brought it up this year is that right i remember yeah. we saw this we saw this last year that's was it correct. last year or was it be <laughs> no it was it was five years ago you haven't seen it since so oh, really okay they, i thought we'd already they, done this they, i haven't been here that long <laughs> I've, I've been just i've been watching all your meetings for for decades now <laughs> uh, Brian, so. Maybe I just forgot that I wasn't on the board. Okay, I thought we'd seen this already, but okay, I, I get, I get it. Thank you. Seems like a year to me too. Now I do remember it, Greg, because I was there at that meeting five years ago. <laughs> okay, uh, Rick, do you want to weigh in on on this? You're muted, Rick. There you go. Oh, I know. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Try this. Try this. Try this. Try this. Something else. What did you have on? His phone or something? <laughs> Let's see. What does he have to have on, Andrew, to make it work? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. That's good. Okay, I, I, I had to get on my phone. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate something earlier that Valerie said about wildfire danger, and we are certainly in the thick of it right now. We've got a couple engines out that we'll, when they come back, we won't be sending them out again. But 
Uh, I just want to mention that during the last five years, when we put this, since we put this IGA together, it's been great for our fire department. Our safety of our equipment is better than it's ever been. We try to adhere to something called NFPA standard number 1911, and these guys have done a great job, and I've, we, we very much have enjoyed the uh, partnership with the shop. Great. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Okay. Okay, hey, uh, bring it to the board. Um, does anyone have further questions? Or we could take, do a motion right now. I would like to make a motion to approve a resolution um, amending resolution number 100-2014 and approving an amended intergovernmental agreement between the Board of County Commissioners and the Aspen Fire Protection District for maintenance, repair, and fuel supply for the district's vehicles. This is a first reading. We will set for second reading and public hearing on September the 9th, 2020. And I want to thank the fire department. Rick, thank you. And um, thanks, staff, for making this work so well. Thanks. I'll second that. Okay. Patty moved, Greg seconded. Are there further questions or comments from the board right now? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Brian and Justin and Rick for being with us here today. Uh, we'll thank you, thank you very much, and we'll see you on uh, September 9th, if not sooner. All right, thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have an ordinance authorizing acquisition of the Jerboz in holding at the Redstone Boulders open space. And we have Dale Will here in the room with us. Yay, nice to see you. <laughs> thank you. Dale's been tra traipsing all around the western United States. We're <laughs> glad you're back. <laughs> Thank you. Grandpa. <laughs> uh, right. Grandpa to you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm Dale Will. I'm the Acquisition and Special Projects Manager Director for the Open Space and Trails Program. And <clears throat> what we have uh, here is a 1.9 acre lot normally open space doesn't chase property that's quite this small except that this particular lot is entirely surrounded by our redstone boulders open space and it's belonged to the Jerboz family for some time we've had conversations on and off uh, before they decided to list it uh, we weren't able to come to an agreement on the value at that time uh, we were somewhat surprised when we saw the listing come in at less than the amount that we had been discussing informally uh, and because of the pressures we're all seeing in the real estate market right now uh, the open space board decided to jump pretty quickly on this uh, the property uh, if it were developed would compromise some of the open space qualities of the redstone boulders open space which also includes a trail on the old East Creek Road that goes directly behind this property and is one of the nicest gentle hikes available in the Crystal Valley. Uh, anyone that's been on it uh, knows that it's a very gentle grade connecting the Redstone Campground over to the village and although that trail does cross a, a couple of developed properties, uh, we felt that having this one develop would uh, change the experience along that trail. Uh, and in addition, the property is outside of the Redstone Historic District, but on Redstone Boulevard. And a couple of Redstone residents have uh, contacted the Open Space Program, expressed concern about the integrity of the Redstone Historic District should someone try to build an upscale house that doesn't really fit the flavor of the village on that location that would be pretty near the uh, the row of cottages on the north end of Redstone there so the open space board directed me to jump on this and uh, make a an offer at the listing price uh, there had been another offer pending and um, Usually we try to bargain a little bit, but in this case we went straight to the listing price to make sure that we could secure a contract on this property. The Open Space Board unanimously recommends that you um, approve this acquisition and 
should it go forward, this property will essentially be consolidated with the Redstone Boulders open space. The only improvements on it today are a fence and a wellhead. Uh, the Gerbazes have kept some horses on it over the years, and uh, we would take that fence down and do whatever revegetation might be appropriate. And it would essentially protect the status quo of that corridor along Redstone Boulevard. Patty. So is the property to the due, I guess it would be east, is that Forest Service? Yes. So up above it would be Forest Service. I, I pulled up the map, and it is, you're right, it is smack dab, and, and it's, it's definitely an inholding um, within that open space. So this is more than appropriate, and we thank the Jurabas family for finally allowing us the opportunity to bring it into open space and trust. George? Yeah, Dale, this is, uh, this is one of those hidden gems that um, Open Space continues to try to seek out. I recall the, the little the mining claims we've uh, hopefully have uh, completed up, up 100 Creek. Um, <laughs> right. I think with Flynn <laughs> and up Castle Creek, we, we've uh, d discovered some uh, little in holdings. And so they're all really gems that would really, as you say, would really impact the uh, the nature and feel of the surrounding open space. So, so I think this is a great uh, purchase. Um, uh, two quick questions: What what is the, uh, the current uh, acreage of Redstone Boulder open space? Oh boy, oh, you might have caught me a little bit flat-footed on that. Um, I think in the AIS, and I didn't print it. I think I list the acreages of the two properties that now comprise the. Boulder's open space. Yeah, the Boulder open space is 19 acres. The Delaney River parcel is 21 acres. So 19 plus 21 is 40 acres that we have there protected. And it's really more than 40 acres. As Patty noted, to the east on the edge of that property is National Forest, and it reaches all the way to the Crystal River. So we've got a, about a half mile wide corridor that connects wildlife from the high country up in the Avalanche uh, Creek area in the in the Maroon Bells Wilderness back to the east, all the way to the Crystal River. And so, as you said, we're just going to incorporate this into the existing uh, Redstone Boulder open space, and so that will just uh, be part of that parcel, and the name will go along with it. Correct. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, any further questions or comments? I would comment, uh, I would thank the Jerboss family, who I've known different members of the Jerboss family for years. I don't know which particular ones are the ones owning this, but we really appreciate them, uh, you know, talking to Dale in previous years about Pickin County acquiring this land and getting the opportunity to buy it now. So, uh, let's see, I don't, did, do we have a motion yet? I don't think so. I'd make a motion to approve. I'll second that. Okay, George moved and Greg seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye, thank you, Dale. Thank you. Aye. 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 And the uh, public yes. hearing. Thank you, Dale. Public hearing will be on September 9th on this and the second reading. Thank you. So we'll see you a little then, later. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we see you later, Dale. Yeah, I'm, I'm You're here for the bonds? The yeah, I'm a farmer, okay. Okay. Okay, next we have uh, an ordinance. Here's right. Oh, uh, an ordinance amending ordinance number 12-2009 and accepting an amended access easement and improvement and maintenance agreement from the Stone Road Association and lot owners in the West Sofus <laughs> Ranch subdivision. A mouthful. And we have Ryan Neely here to uh, lead us on the discussion on this. Ryan, go ahead. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. All right, well, uh, I'm covering this issue for Phyllis today, but I've also been working on it with her uh, for about, oh, I don't know, probably almost a year now, really. Um, 
This is an ordinance, amending ordinance number 12, 2009, and accepting an, or, an amended access easement improvement and maintenance agreement from the Stone Road Association and various lot owners in the West Sopris Ranch subdivision. Um, today is first reading. Public hearing is currently set for September 9th in the event that you approve this on first reading. Um, the long and the short of this is in 2009, the county entered into an access easement agreement to provide uh, access for the county and uh, other, you know, our contractors to ask to uh, access the uh, various tower sites at the top of West Sopris Creek. Uh, since 2000, well, the 2009 agreement called for the county to do the road grading uh, for Skookum Lane and Stone Road, which are two, well, Skookum Lane's an offshoot of Stone Road, which connects between the uh, tower site and West Sopris Creek Road. Since 2009, the Homeowners Association came in and uh, basically paved the road. So our in-kind contribution of, pla uh, of road grading is really no longer uh, practical up there. So what we have worked out with the Stone Road Association is an annual $15,000 payment for uh, ongoing maintenance of Stone Road and Skookum Lane. The $15,000 number came out of the original 2009 ordinance and access easement whereby the easement agreement itself called out as a penalty of $15,000 in the event the as a payment from the county to the Stone Road Association in the event that we didn't grade the road in any given year. So that dollar amount was fixed at the time and that is what is being memorialized in the new access easement today. Uh, the access easement amendment or the amendment to the access easement also does a couple other things, uh, namely, and I think most importantly from a budgetary perspective, it eliminates the county's obligation for assessments uh, to stone uh, from the Stone Road Association. Our, our contribution is fixed at $15,000, except it'll fluctuate based on any changes of the annual assessment to the other members, but we will, won't be on the hook for a special assessment in the future going forward, which uh, since we're a non-voting member in the association kind of makes sense if they want to do a major upgrade to Stone Road or something like that, we don't want to be on the hook for that uh, if we can avoid it. That is the long and the short of it. Uh, Phyllis and I are recommending that the, abort, the BOCC approve this on first reading and set a uh, second reading in a public hearing for September 9th. Uh, I will answer any questions that I am able to and uh, we can go from there. George. Uh, Rye, who's going to be responsible for plowing? Uh, the association is, has been and is currently responsible for plowing of the roads. The individual homeowners, I believe, can buy into the plowing contract that the association has or uh, perform plowing on their own driveways up there. Some of the driveways in the subdivision are pretty long. So our, so our annual $15,000 uh, membership fee um, covers or um, uh, does not uh, obligate us to do any road maintenance, grading, plowing, upgrading. That's right. We're basically, uh, the quid pro quo here is access to the translator site for 15 grand a year. Um, and you know, I think based on what we are doing before, it was it's probably a pretty realistic dollar amount once you get plowing in there and eliminate our grading obligation. And this comes out of, this is 
being funded out of the translator fund, correct? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, well, that's, that's what it says in the. Um, oh, in yeah. The there, yeah, I see it right that, there. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Um, Rye, I, I haven't really looked at the Google Earth. Usually, something like this, I'll look at Google Earth and see. But if we didn't have this road, would there be any other p possible route we could get in there? Or something would have happened to this this road, or would no, we have to go uh, on a helicopter in that case? It would pretty much be a helicopter. I mean, you can hike up to the site from somewhere else, uh, Steve. But of course, for for practical purposes of everyday access and getting equipment and material up there, we need roadway access. You've probably seen the road if you drive up West Sopers Creek heading towards. Uh, Prince Creek Road. It's pretty prominent on the right, and it, you know, it gets up onto the top of the spine there uh, in the crown, and you kind of cut back over to the translator, and uh, it's really pretty much the only way to get up there. Okay, and I, I guess the reason I asked that question is there is such a network of bike trails and horseback riding trails and whatnot around on the crown that I thought there might be some other potential route in there. Yeah, I mean, I think from if you, I'm sure there's a way to get on the various road systems, probably <laughs> from either private property in the uh, area east of Carbondale or in the area uh, north of the Crown in the Roaring Fork Valley. I know there's a bunch of historical old uh, cattle driving roads and four-wheeler roads that hook up with the whole system of roads up on the Crown up there, Steve. But from a practical perspective of getting uh, there on a paved road and uh, not you know, going through somebody else's private property, which we would likely then have to set up some kind of access agreement mm -hmm. for, this really is the uh, the best way to do it, as far as I'm aware of, and I think that's the conclusion that the translator folks and Phyllis has reached as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ready for a motion, Steve? Uh, yes, certainly, Greg. I'd move that uh, we approve an ordinance uh, uh, number 012-2009 amending ordinance 012-2009 and accepting an amended access easement and improvement maintenance agreement from the Stone Road Association and lot owners in the West Sopris Ranch subdivision. Is that, is that the correct one? George seconded? Yeah, it's the correct one, Greg. <laughs> okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve on first reading, set for second reading September 9th. Uh, is there any further discussion? None. I would just add one thing, Steve. Uh, GR Fielding, the county engineer, is keeping track of me while I'm doing this, and he said <laughs> we would need to cut in a new road from the BLM road in order to access um, the translator site. So this really is the only way to get there. So. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, um, uh, Steve, I just wanted to thank the, the homeowners for association for making this agreement with us it, it 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 works for everyone and really appreciate their their willingness to do this all right so any further discussion all in favor say aye 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 okay you have it rye thank you very much thanks rye thank you see you again in a little bit okie doke okay Next, we have a resolution authorizing an amendment to the rental car license and use agreements to reallocate space for rental car operations. And we have John Ely on uh, to present this. And this uh, was not in our packet, but it was emailed to us this morning. No, this one was in our packet. The other one was emailed to us. <coughs> Actually, oh, okay. the, this, this one, item. okay, got it. Yeah, it's the other one that we don't didn't have in the. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
I think we can talk about both items five and six together. We have several on uh, the call here to, to uh, assist with um, the presentation. How'd you do that, Rich? <laughs> um, so the uh, the first item is a uh, is as you said, Steve, the resolution to amend uh, lease agreements, uh, uh, which are titled license and use agreements uh, with the rental car companies. Um, all four parent companies at the airport uh, and the second handled together is a resolution to do the same with the airline and general aviation uh, fees and charges. Um, so I'll, I'll let one of the riches pick it up. From <laughs> yeah, thank you, John. You might have noticed we had three riches on there for a while after yesterday trying to get us uh, going here. But uh, I do need to have, if you can have uh, IT, you have Brian Elliott, um, the authority to share his screen. We can uh, show a couple of slides there. <clears throat> but uh, the resolutions that, uh, that John was talking about, the first one uh, deals with the rental car license and use agreements and really reallocating the space for the rental cars. So uh, a little bit about that. And we have Chris Padilla here joining us. Um, this is uh, goes back quite a ways in some discussions uh, that we had with the board and also the rental car agencies and allowing some additional space. So I'm going to just turn it over to Brian. Uh, he can walk through these slides and talk about this capital improvement project. We're just now, uh, since the project just finished up, now allocating the, the proper charges uh, for those space uses. So Brian, if you wouldn't mind. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Brian Elliott again from Recondo and Associates. Uh, what I show on the screen uh, currently, I hope, um, is the configuration of the rental car lot uh, as of the date of execution of last year. And the matter before you today is consideration of recognizing changes to this lot that have occurred since completion of the airport parking project. As you can see, uh, prior to the improvements that were completed that provided the cell phone lot an expansion of the um, long-term lot and improvements to the employee lot. Rental cars uh, that were being cleaned proceeded along this roadway into the uh, service facility area to either be staged for cleaning or actually cleaned. And then when they were completed, they were, they were stored in one of these uh, finger lots here or taken back to the main terminal area for, for renting. Uh, what's occurred as of the result of the parking improvements project uh, are, is, is this layout. And as you can see, that uh, area is no longer accessible. Uh, the project improved uh, the economy lot and the employee lot in this uh, light blue area here. And as such, the rental cars did not have access or do not have access any longer to their wash facility here. Instead, uh, they proceed down airport road um, along the parallel parking that's available for cell phones into uh, the facility and, and the green area is all shared. Uh, cars come in, uh, they come either directly into the stacking area if the wash area is full or they move into the stack uh, to the wash area and when cleaned and fueled, they either proceed uh, into their designated spaces here or they return back to the airport for ready, um, uh, ready availability for future uh, rentals. Uh, the allocation of the space, uh, the different colors you see in here, are, are made based upon market share. So Avis budget has the greatest market share at Aspen. So they have about 46% of the market and they have therefore about 46% or so of, of the stacking area space as well as the uh, uh, return space excuse me, the uh, staging space here. Uh, uh, Hertz has the next highest allotment, uh, Enterprise National here, and then the new operator that just started last November uh, 6th is in the purple. Uh, these space allocations and this project were completely uh, coordinated uh, with the industry by staff. And as of June 20th, June 2020, they've been uh, operating uh, and paying rent on this space. Um, so the, uh, the matter before the board is a, approval of an amendment uh, with each of the rental car companies to recognize this uh, new allocation of space and associated changes in uh, square footages for each. And um, also included in this are gonna be the rates and fees. 
uh, will really affect the car rentals for their indoor uh, terminal space. Um, and the staff is recommending that uh, we take that incremental increase and defer it into uh, 2021 uh, for the car rental companies so that they can have a chance to uh, build up some of that cash to be able to pay it back. Okay, George. Yeah, do we have uh, down the road in the future, uh, hopefully uh, in the immediate future, do we have the ability to electrify uh, these lots to uh, provide the opportunity for rental cars to utilize uh, e-cars and, and be able to plug in? Yeah, George, I know that's one of the discussions uh, that uh, was contained in the vision uh, committee's uh, uh, dialogue that they were having regarding anything we can do to do some electrification there. Right now, we currently don't because our, our service wouldn't provide it. But yes, uh, the intent is eventually is we could electrify it. Uh, there's also thoughts eventually, uh, depending on cash flow and how we can make it work, is possibly doing carports out there that could maybe house uh, solar uh, to try to assist with that. So we started giving some thought to that, um, but uh, nothing in the plans right now. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, further questions? We all. So I don't, are you looking at taking these one at a time uh, to go ahead and approve those? Is that, uh, is John Ely, is that okay? Because this was, uh, this is a first reading setting the second reading on uh, the 9th of September in, in the public hearing for that. That's fine. Um, they both need to be voted on independently, but we can discuss it all at once or, or separately, however you want to do it. So let's go ahead and vote on this one right now, I think. I'll make a motion. To I, I can make a motion. Oh, I'll second Patty then. <laughs> okay, Patty moved and Greg seconded. Any further discussion? George? No. I, okay. I didn't have my... Okay. Hey, Steve, I would just say to tag on what George said earlier, certainly we've, we've all been focused on electrifying and, and looking forward to doing that. Um, I just ha had an anecdotal story about running into a, a guy who had rented a Tesla and was touring Colorado in a rental Tesla out of Denver. So we know they're renting the vehicles. We're, they're renting EVs now. Um, wow. And we can certainly be uh, encouraging our rental car agencies to be uh, renting the, the Teslas because we know they work. Um, and there may be some others in their fleet soon as well. So anything we can do to encourage that, I'm, I'm in favor of. Thanks. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. And now, John, let's go on to the airport fees and charges. And maybe Brian's the one to uh, lead the discussion on that, too. Okay. I can, uh, I can certainly introduce that. And, Greg, back to your point. I. Um, you know, it, it dawned on me, maybe uh, we worked with uh, Rafta for the buttermilk uh, on some stations. Maybe maybe something in between we can start looking at something. Yet. But again, I, I, I think hear where you all yeah. are coming from. Ra Rafta and Holy Cross, I think, were part of that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I appreciate, I appreciate the comments. Um, yeah, this is now uh, amending the airport fees and charges. Uh, this is the lease agreement as mentioned. Uh, we're, we walked this in today. Uh, I believe it was sent out in emails and in your packet. Uh, yeah, hard copies, I believe, for those that are in, in the room there. But it's a resolution. Again, this is the first reading on a resolution uh, with the pub, setting the public hearing again for the ninth. Um, this really is just a, a change in our fees fee structure. And I'm going to have Brian walk through that with you. And one of the conditions of this, Chris mentioned earlier, uh, this will affect the rental companies. And that's uh, part of the motion, if, if you all agree to defer that. It's around a 20 $100, $2,200 overall cost uh, by deferring that. It's not a whole lot, but uh, for the rental car agencies within the uh, building itself. So it just allows them a chance to kind of build up some of their uh, financing given uh, uh, kind of the downturn we, we're experiencing here. So, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, to Brian if you want to walk through this. Uh, and as uh, Rich indicated, this is related to uh, amending airport fees and charges. It's the result of conversation that staff uh, has had with the airlines uh, over the past four to five months. Um, essentially, 
uh, from the perspective of the county in terms of its rates and charges uh, setting. Uh, the, the board, of course, uh, per pursuant to code, uh, authorizes uh, the setting of rates and charges. Uh, the last change in rates and charges occurred in 2017, uh, and prior to that was 2015. Um, and so from the airline's perspective and what the county has been working with the airlines on is basically having fixed rates uh, over the past three years. Typically, airports uh, would see and airlines would pay uh, increased fees or changing in fees every year, but you've held those constant since 2017. Um, second thing is that in terms of the financing of the terminal modernization project that was just completed, um, the amortization of those costs have been removed from the airline rate base and uh, the county is pursuing a passenger facility, facility charge application approval with the FAA to pay for that. Uh, in addition to that, in terms of keeping airline rates and charges low, uh, the county has moved to reduce or defer some of its capital projects, and it has scrubbed and continues to take a look at operating expenses to reduce the requirements on the backs of the airlines. Uh, the airlines also are benefiting from uh, the county's allocation of CARES fund funding <clears throat> in the sense that 40% um, of those funds are being applied to the landing fee requirement to reduce uh, the requirement and thereby the, the landing fee. Um, unfortunately, uh, what that translates to though is the county will absorb a greater loss based on that allocation. But it's being done uh, in the sense of partnership and cooperation with the airlines and understanding uh, the financial uh, strife that they are experiencing at, the, at this time. Uh, notwithstanding all of the things that the county has been working with the airlines uh, on in terms of keeping rates and charges uh, at a reasonable level, um, there is a need to increase um, rates and charges for the remainder of the fiscal year and then also as you begin to build budgets for 2021. So this table presents the various uh, terminal uh, charges, landing fee, fuel flowage, and space charges uh, for the airlines. And you can see dollar amount changes in the far right-hand column. Um, the signatory rates uh, are proposed to increase from $75.81 to $82.86. And these are areas like ticket counters and office areas behind the ticket counters where their ticketing kiosks are. All of that space is signatory. Uh, you also have classifications for seasonal carriers. At, uh, at the time, no one's paying that rate. You also have outside space uh, that is assigned on a preferential or shared exclusive basis uh, among the airlines. Those rates you can see also are proposed to increase. And on the landing fee, um, the rates are increasing there, both for the airlines and GA. And just as a footnote, an asterisk, uh, the locally based general aviation uh, aircraft uh, weighing 12,000 pounds or less um, are, are exempt from fuel flow, I'm sorry, landing fees um, for, for the airport. Uh, the fuel flowage fees remain unchanged and uh, the shared space, so this would be any space such as the hold room or the bag claim area inside the terminal that's shared uh, also increases by that uh, $7.05. Um, happy to answer any questions on these proposed rate increases. And uh, just kind of follow up from uh, yesterday's question that Kelly had about where we're, we were tracking for employments. Year to date through July, we're about 39% uh, below last year. So that's tracking uh, slightly a little bit better than the 140,000 employments that was uh, that we are the condo and uh, has uh, estimated at. So just as a follow up. Answer. Um, Steve. Okay, uh, let's go to Kelly and then Greg. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate the follow up on how that forecasting is tracking. Um, to me, what, how is seasonal defined? Are we defining, you know, when are they paying these seasonal rates? Is that a calendar determination? Is that based on operations or employment numbers? So in the past, it was Delta used to be a seasonal uh, carrier. 
for for example so they would only participate during the summer times and the the winter time so the shoulder season they wouldn't um they wouldn't have any flights coming in so they would became a seasonal so they were considered a seasonal aircraft or um airline um but then they went over and signed an actual contract with us as as a signatory and to service the market year round and that's what put them over to uh, a signat a signatory and a seasonal thanks so much Okay, Greg. Um, if you could just reiterate, Steve, uh, Chris, you said that the employments are at 61% of last year. Is that what I inferred? You said it was down 39, but I, I got lost there. If you could describe. So uh, the, the estimated employments was about 140, 144,000. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. Um, for this year, the adjusted uh, employments. Right now, year to date to July, we're down. Uh, 39% of last year's employment through July. So if you say half of that of, the, of last year was about 300,000 or about 300,000 employments, then, you know, you're looking at 150 uh, and right now we're tracking at about 40%. So slightly, just a little bit better um, year to date than what we had. Okay. Had. But we don't, Great. we have, we don't know what snow season is going to look like. Right. Thanks. And I just wanted to, uh, we, we had this conversation yesterday also, but for anyone who's paying attention online, uh, these rates are basically set according to the actual cost of the service. Uh, it's not something we can arbitrarily change in most cases. Is that my understanding correct? Yes, that's correct. The uh, uh, rates and charges to, to the airlines are, are set by formula. Uh, the airport operates under what's called a compensatory approach to rate setting. So it very much is along the lines of a cost accounting uh, framework whereby you identify uh, cost centers uh, around the airport based on various functions. Uh, you apply direct cost into those cost centers. You allocate indirect cost to, to determine a total requirement. And then it, the, uh, that requirement is then recouped through these rates and charges. Patty? Yeah, so um, how, how are we dealing with Delta at this time? Since they're specifically named in the AIS, I believe, or um, are we reserving holding their space for now but not charging them since they're not using it? Are we kind of waiting to hear back from them what they want to do? Do we know? Yeah, Patty, we just, uh, we just heard from Delta that they're um, – still deciding on what they want to do. Currently, they are are still going to pay their rent. Uh, we don't collect the landing fees uh, without planes coming in here, but they still have their signatory uh, right to that space until they give that up. I believe uh, John Ely's reviewed the contract, and I, I think there was a 21-day notice period in our contract um, that they could, you know, bow out uh, of that. So, but right now uh, we haven't heard anything uh, definitively yet. Yeah, because I, I would like to be optimistic and hope that Delta comes back in um, yeah. hopefully sooner than the winter of 2021-22. Um, they did a great job while they were here. They provided great service um, with the connecting flights to Salt Lake City. So, yeah, let's encourage them to be a partner with us for the future. So, thank you. Okay, um, I just had one, it's kind of a technical question, but the GA airplanes over 12,500 pounds don't pay a landing fee. Um, what are the weights of planes that are maybe slightly bigger than that? Uh, are they substantially bigger than the 12,500? What I am curious about if this would stimulate some people to maybe be getting lighter aircraft so they wouldn't have to pay a landing fee here. And a lighter aircraft maybe made out of carbon fiber uh, would be much more energy efficient. Um, so what are the weights of other others, general aviation aircraft that land here? So just to clarify, it, that the landing 
fee is only waived for locally based GA. So pat the patio shelters and the tie downs, they have agreements with us. Uh, anything, any of those aircraft under 12,500 are, uh, they, they don't get charged a landing fee. Um, and just kind of give you uh, an idea of the ratio. Out of all those aircraft that you see parked uh, in the patio shelters and uh, the tie downs and under our agreements, um, there's only about two or three that really falls, uh, that ends up having to pay for the landing fees. So it's a very small percentage. Um, for the rest of the aircraft, you're looking at, so for comparison size, the CRJ 700s are 75,000 pounds. Um, so you can look at uh, the Globals uh, and, the G and the Gulf Streams, uh, you know, below that, uh, somewhere between, uh, my, you know, I'm just throwing it out there. You might want to correct me, Brian, if I'm <laughs> wrong, but probably okay. between 20,000 to up to 60,000 pounds. So, uh, you know, those are the ones that are actually getting, those are the ones that this, this rate change is actually going to affect. So it's really up to that market, whether they have, they're motivated to buy lighter aircraft or not. <clears throat> and I think most, for the most part, I want to say, um, I want to say the industry for newer aircraft has moved towards uh, carbon fiber bodies, just like the, uh, the airlines uh, have started to, or have started using like Boeing and uh, Airbus. Okay. Uh, since I had just read Amory Lovin's paper about carbon fiber aircraft, that's what brought that to my mind, realizing it's like a developing technology right now. Correct. The last place I worked at, we actually made those bodies and uh, frames. So they've been being used uh, military and commercially. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chris. No problem. Okay, uh, any further questions from commissioners? And I'd entertain a motion. Oh, uh, Chris, Chris, sorry, go have, ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, one you, still have on more, this, I, you have still more to present. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Just, sure. another, just the other uh, half yes. of, of uh, so we have the holdover stat agreement and then on this, we're also proposing half of that increase be deferred into 2021 for the airlines uh, for March, uh, April, May, and June pay repayment. So they would, that would be $3.52 that would get deferred out uh, for that rental space out in the 2021. Thank you. Okay. And that was part of our discussion with the, with the airlines to keep ourselves whole, but try to help with the cash flow in this, and they, they seem to agree. So that would be certainly our recommendation of the board to uh, approve it with, the, uh, with that condition. Okay. But Brian can finish up if you can. We do need to talk about the agreement, if we could, uh, Steve, uh, because of the, the type of agreement that we do have. And this is what will eventually come for your signature. Um, based on your decision after second reading uh, moving forward. Yes, thanks, Rich. Uh, so as indicated, all of the uh, airline agreements, Delta, United, and America, are in holdover status. Uh, they were executed at various dates and had subsequent various uh, termination or end dates. Uh, but there is a provision in the agreement that allows for holdover uh, on a month-by-month -month basis. <clears throat> so what it what is attempting to be accomplished here is uh, execution of an amendment that would recognize a change in space and the change in rates associated with the terminal and uh, enhancement project that was completed earlier this year. So uh, we have on the screen uh, the form of, of amendment that would um, be executed by the airlines and the county. And the amendments uh, would, would basically entail this cover sheet along with an updated um, three exhibits, uh, one that would describe the premises and the amount of space by each airline, an exhibit, and then a calculation of the rates. So these are all, uh, exhibit three, three A and four are all part of the existing agreement. And this, would, this amendment just brings um, these exhibits and the space calculations up to date. 
this is the diagram of the completed improvement areas and essentially uh, the project included improvements in the baggage claim area uh, to improve the flow of bags from the ticket counter through TSA screening and out to the baggage makeup area. It also included um, taking a small portion of the Jedediah gift shop area and converting it into hold room here and also converting the airport administrative offices uh, into additional hold room space as well for the airlines. And then lastly, providing a temporary tent uh, baggage uh, staging area for inbound bags during peak season uh, to keep them out of the weather elements uh, as planes come in and bags are offloaded onto uh, the inbound baggage belt or the ski uh, rack here, uh, rather than having carts set outside, uh, they would be phased into this area here. So. The amendment recognizes the additional space uh, that's being dedicated to the airlines as the result of the uh, of the amendment. Okay. Um, questions from the commissioners on this this part. It all looks like it's well thought out, and uh, the airlines have agreed to the these increases now uh, I think it was George yesterday pointed out they will probably pass this on to the passengers flying up with them so it, but if they have higher more passengers flying on a plane maybe the extra passengers would be what is allows them to actually pay for the, the slightly increased fees So uh, I think we're ready for a motion at this point. I'll make a motion to approve. I keep waiting for somebody to jump in. Okay, <laughs> Patty jumped on it. She's <laughs> she's uh, on on her toes here today. <laughs> Patty moved to approve. Is I'll, there a second? I'll I'll second again. Thank okay, you. Greg seconded. Any further discussion? Thank you, gentlemen. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, and good to see you again twice in two days. <laughs> so, thank you. Same. Call the question. Thanks. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, and George gave a thumbs up, so we all approve that. Thank you, board. Yeah, Patty, you don't have like a buzzer that you have to hit. We all have I to know. like hit the buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> Race for it. <laughs> I just wait. Thank you, Somebody's going to jump in. Somebody's going to jump in. Okay. Next on the agenda is uh, one reading public hearing. This is an application for a new brew pub liquor license submitted by Aspen Brewing LLC. Hi, Jeanette. And Jeanette's here. Hi, Jeanette. Haven't seen you in ages. I miss you guys. <laughs> Want to uh, see the anyway, <laughs> we'll move along. Um, what we have before you today is an application for a new brew pub, our very first ever in Pitkin County, liquor license submitted by Aspen Brewing. Uh, Aspen Brewing Legacy LLC, DBA, is Aspen Brewing. And joining me online today on their phones, I believe, is Don Bryan. And Robert, and then, I, excuse me, Robert, I'm not sure if it's Runco or Runco, but we'll call him Robert. Um, <laughs> he is the council. For <laughs> so anyway, the application is for an establishment which used to be a, uh, a brewery, a wholesale brewery, and it's located at 404 Aspen Business Center. And in Aspen, it's currently leased from Columbine Storage Center Park. I have a copy of that lease and it goes through August 31st of 2025. And just to summarize for you what a brew pub license is and what they're allowed to do is they can manufacture malt liquors on the licensed premises. They can sell to the public for consumption on the licensed premises and that food has to be provided for that. So it's typical to a restaurant. They can sell to the public sealed containers for off-premises consumption. 
and they can also sell to independent wholesalers for dis distribution to licensed retailers up to 300,000 gallons per year. <laughs> uh, anyway, in your packet, you have a petition from the neighbors um, petitioning uh, for this um, establishment or for this business. Uh, I've also sent out referral comments to the Environmental Health, Community Development, and the Sheriff's Department, and we haven't received any back on, on stating that, that they must be all positive. There's no news is good news. Um, staff has asked the applicant to respond to a parking plan and, of course, the COVID guidelines and compliance. And their response to this request is attached attachment three and attachment four in your packet. Um, there's never been any violations of the brewery. We never received any concerns or violations. And with that, I don't know where I went. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I can hear you. Okay, my screen went away, but I'll keep talking. With that, I guess we'll just open it up for questions from the commissioners, and I believe these two gentlemen are online also, so we'll try to answer them the best we can. Steve? Let's see, I can't see. Uh, Patty, go ahead. Yeah, um, looking at the facility diagram, I have, I have some questions. Well, I have, I have a couple questions anyway. Um, welcome, gentlemen. It'll be nice to see you out there, more than we see you usually. Um, so there is a COVID business, business safety plan on file. Is that correct, Jeanette? Yes, that's correct. All right, check that one off. And on the um, attachment for the facility diagram, um, I don't see an area for food service or restrooms or any of that that's in, in, this, in this facility diagram. Okay. Um, is there another? I think this. I think this is just the portion of the alcohol. But Patty, I can get you a, a complete schematic. Yeah, I just because right. I'm, I'm I'm just because reading the definition under um, attachment one under brew license brew pub license definition. Um, will they they'll be serving food? Yes. Okay. So there needs to be like a. Yeah, there has to be more of the facility because I see no food preparation, no food area, no. So if you could just, you know, give us a more complete facility diagram because I'm sure they have those other areas within their facility because they have but to we'll serve sure food in order to sell alcohol on the site. Okay. And we'll make sure you get that. Okay. Be part All right. Of the file. Um, that's pretty much my. Um, I do appreciate the. Uh, encouraging people to walk or to bike because I think that'll be a great service to that neighborhood out there to have this opportunity so close at hand without having to drive into town and back again. And um, and there is adequate street parking in that vicinity. I know that we have such huge parking issues at the AABC, but apparently it says to use street parking when available. I wonder if one of these gentlemen are online to further expand on the parking. And I'm sorry, I've lost my, I well, can't see you guys. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we can, I, I'm good. Are you good, Patty? No, 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 we've got two people who might be well, able to answer my question. Well, hands raised. I'm not sure if those are, so the 2647, yep. are you one of the gentlemen with with the brew brew company i am yes this is this is robert runco the attorney for the applicant okay no. um i just wanted to provide some clarification first on the the diagram and the um food service at the the location um in in the definition of a brew pub um in the statute i believe you have it in front of you uh the the food service is only required if there is on-site consumption of food at the brew pub. Um, this location will not have any on-site consumption of alcohol, um, no on-site consumption of food. This is just a manufacturing facility only. Um, this is, it, 
As the, um, you've previously been told, this was uh, currently or previously licensed as a manufacturer and wholesaler. Um, because of some change in ownership and some other uh, licenses that the owners have an interest in, um, we need to convert this to a retail type license. Um, the operations themselves will not change from what they currently are. Um, it will remain just producing beer and just selling beer um, to licensed wholesalers or other retailers um, that, that the owners have an, an interest in. So there will not be any um, food preparation, there will not be any food sales, nor will there be any alcohol sales um, at this location. Okay, thanks for that clarification, but on the parking plan it does mention visitors and customers, customers will be encouraged, customers will be encouraged, therefore I was a little misled by your customers who are going to be parking there. Yeah, yeah, they can, I guess they can still come and they can, they can do tours of the facility, you know, it's pretty popular for people to go and, you know, see the brewing equipment and those types of things. So it, it is open for um, customers, but it is not open for on-site retail sales of alcohol. Okay, so the customers can come look, but they can't touch. Or they mm -hmm. can't drink. Correct. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for clarifying that for me. Okay. Kelly? Yes. Me. All right. So now I'm even more confused than I was <laughs> <laughs> about, um, about this application. And I'm sort of inclined to continue this because there's just some unanswered questions here. And, um, you know, so for... So now what we just heard, is this even the correct license for them to be applying for, or are they just trying to convert a different license under a former owner to, you know, the same type of license under a new name? So that's sort of my first question. Are we even, do we even have the correct licensing application in front of us? And then if it is, you know, I just have some concerns with, with know not having evidence of the COVID plan not having the parking schematic provided some of the names on the petition um, appear to be business names and you know the petition says they need to be residents in the surrounding area so I don't know if Louis, you know, Louis Swiss workers live at Louis Swiss or Cracks and Rack workers live at Cracks and Rack um, you know so there's just some details here that you know, I'm not disinclined to support this, but I, I think we need to have a clean application that, you know, meets our requirements. So if we can answer the first question, are we even talking about the right license here? Um, and then, you know, the subsequent things sort of lead me to want to continue this since this is a one read item. Yeah, I, I can answer the, the first question for sure. Um, I, I do believe this is the correct type of license. Um, this is actually a fairly common um, setup amongst um, brew pubs or um, owners of, of retail licenses um, because the owners have other retail class licenses. Um, they're prohibited from having an ownership interest in a manufacturer or a wholesale license, um, which are the current licenses at this location. Um, a brew pub is considered a retail class license um, in Colorado, which is obviously why we're here in front of you today, um, and it is very common um, for chains of brew pubs um, like Rock Bottoms or, or those types of things to have multiple licenses and then some central locations um, that are licensed as brew pubs but are still manufacturer manufacturing only. So we would be approving uses that you don't intend to Correct. Yeah, they, they would have the ability to, do, under their license, they would have the ability to do things um, that they will not be utilizing. Um, and if in the future they decide that uh, they want to add, um, you know, food on-site sales or, or those types of things um, for, you know, additional tours or anything like that, um, we would submit a premises modification application um, to show you where any food preparation, food sales, on-site consumption would occur. Uh, Greg, go ahead. Um, yeah, just in the, if Kelly's done, just following up on, on hers, I just see it's 
uh, on the COVID guidelines, you're adhering to state restaurant guidelines. Um, is that the appropriate guideline for a, a manufacturing facility such as this? Or I understand you're, uh, it seems like a, you're, you're trying to comply with a restaurant brew pub uh, guideline, but actually operating it as a factory of sorts. Is, is this restaurant guideline the appropriate one um, regarding COVID or other health issues? Honestly, um, up until about two hours ago, I would have said yes. Um, but the, the Liquor Enforcement Division actually um, just released some guidelines as it relates to doing tours specifically um, at a manufacturing facility. Um, those, those requirements, however, don't differ um, much from the current requirements for restaurants in terms of um, spacing of patrons, um, and having food available and those types of things if you're doing tours. So during, during COVID restrictions, um, there won't be any patrons um, on, on site. That kind of leads to my question. A lot of breweries or brew pubs would have, I think would have a tasting room where people could try the different kinds of brews, things that are brewed there so then they would know what they'd want to go and purchase. So are you, are you anticipating that this will be something that you'll be adding at some point once the pandemic is over? It may or may not be. Again, that that is completely contingent upon how long this pandemic goes on and, and how that changes the, the entire marketplace, um, especially in light of uh, the, the other uh, licenses held by uh, the applicants here. Okay. Let's see. Further questions from commissioners? Wait, did Kelly get all of her questions answered? Kelly, did you get all your questions answered? No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> You know, again, I, I they, they could be answered verbally, but I really think their application really should include, you know, the presentation of their parking plan, um, you know, the presentation of the COVID plan, um, correct signatures on their petition, and, you know, then we would approve the permit with condition that they would have to come back for that modification of activities should they decide to add food service on-site consumption. Um, so that's, that's my recommendation for, for how we should handle this. So I would I do it. Okay. George? Otherwise, again, in, in, you know, from a broad page, I'm not, I'm not opposed to what they're trying to do, what they've been doing. But I think it needs to be accurate and clean. George? Yeah, just to uh, follow up from Kelly, just in terms of the legality, are, is a petition required? And if so, does it have to be residents and non-commercial? Um, in, in my practice in the past, a petition is not required. Um, however, we, we do have the burden of showing that um, this meets the needs and desires of the neighborhood. A petition has typically been used as that. Um, other jurisdictions recognize residents and business managers or owners as um, parties in interest that can sign the petition in their favor. Um, if you are not inclined to accept um, those types of signatures, um, we would present that the, the historical operations of the exact same brewery in this location um, is evidence of needs and desires for this type of license in the neighborhood since those changes aren't, or since there are no changes to these operations. John Ely, do you want to weigh in on that? You're muted, You're muted. John. Oh, you're, muted, John. <laughs> you're still muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I, I think given the board's comments, it's perfectly legitimate if the board desires to do so to continue the public hearing for the next regular BOCC meeting so that the items that Kelly and the George and Patty to an extent have referred to um, can be presented. And, and 
John, in, in, ter in terms of the need, the requirement the county has for a petition and, and how those signatures uh, need to be qualified? I, typically what the BOCC sees is, are signatures of the, uh, the owner and operators for the license fund. Okay. Well, I would I would support uh, Kelly's uh, suggestion. Kelly wants to uh, make a motion to uh, continue to our next regular meeting um, and just clean this up. So this is a public hearing, and we need to open the public hearing for today before we do anything else. Before I do that, though, there is Wait the Wait a minute. Phone. Let's, George had, did have make a motion. I'll second George's motion, and then we can have, since he did make a motion. I'm, I didn't actually make a motion. I, I uh, actually asked Kelly if she was <laughs> I said I was poor Kelly if she wanted to make a motion <laughs> Kelly do you want to make a motion right now um yes I'll do that then you can in the public hearing so I I move to continue the application for a new brew public or license um by Aspen Brewing to the next regular BOCC meeting on September 9th. And I'll second it. And I have comment. Um, so Thanks. you want to continue so we can have a completion of the COVID business safety plan, um, uh, layout for parking. And do George, do we want to see a, another more complete um, petition with names of local residents and business owners? Well, I've always thought that uh, one of the really uh, goals for having uh, neighbors uh, sign a petition, whether they're residents or owners, is that they are aware of what may be occurring in their neighborhood. And so they have the ability to be better informed on that. So, uh, you know, if there's, if there's not a legal uh, legality in terms of whether it's an owner, a, a, a commercial <coughs> business or an individual signing it, I don't have that problem. It's, it's more of raising awareness that this, here's an application coming forth in, in one's neighborhood. Okay. Jeanette? Just a clarification to, um, on that, George, and commissioners, is the property was posted for 10 days prior to the hearing. So just so, you know, we'll still do these other things, but just wanted to make you aware. It's also on the website, and we have the time to yeah, I just note that our petition form does say that the undersigned are residing within the surrounding area. Um, so I'm just being clean about the PR. Yeah, and, I, and I'm fine with that. If, 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 if you want to add that into your uh, requirement to uh, come back uh, at our next meeting in two weeks, I, I'm fine with that. I will amend my motion to include, um, to request the applicant come back with those items on September 9th. And I'll second that. Yeah. Can I um, repeat the items just so we make sure we've got, clear, got them clear? You want a COVID business safety plan, more expanded more on that. You want the parking plan expanded more. Mm -hmm. And you want a petition of maybe the adjoining neighbors or right there in that immediate neighborhood. Is that what you'd like, Kelly? Who live there? We live there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, yeah, there is the phone number t two that ends in 2500 who has your hand raised. Are you the uh, one of the owners of the business? Hi, uh, this is, hi, this is uh, Don Bryant. Um, uh, we're, uh, we're the investors that are buying the facility. So sorry, I was trying to get in all through the talk. Okay, did did you have any any comments you'd want to make to help enlighten us on the business proposal? Yes, I I do, and we'd be happy to put these in writing as well. Um, there's really a couple of things. One, uh, someone had brought up uh, the tasting area, which is indeed what we intend to do. In fact, uh, I'm in Aspen right now. We're meeting with architects to come up with a design that meets with 
you know, with, with city and county standards and state standards to be able to do a tasting room. And so this is the current layout that you're looking at here. Uh, that's one component. Um, the other component is that we're trying to close the purchase. There was an existing license both for Aspen Tap, which is the restaurant, and a separate license, separate ownership for Aspen Brewery. Well, it was brother and sister, so the appropriate license, as we bought both, was to have one license so that it's, it's transparent between both facilities for employees, for shipping beer, et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually the recommended way to license the facility by, by the state. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, the other part was, it's, it's, I'm not sure if everyone knows exactly where it is, but it's in an industrial park. So uh, what we chose to do with the petition was to go to all of our, quote, local neighbors, which, you know, there's only one residential neighbor in the area there, or immediate area, who signed the petition. Everyone else are business owners in the area. So I just wanted to clarify that was why we did it that way. And the third component was almost all these businesses close at four, which is when we'd open. So we've already talked to other people about using their parking. So we'd have more than enough parking over and above the street parking, bike parking, and current parking. So I just wanted to make that clear, and certainly we can put it in writing, but I just wanted to clarify for the group. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Uh, Patty? Yeah, um, and I think as part of the parking, we just need to verify that parking on the streets there is allowed since I'm not really sure where street parking is t today at the AABC, but I know we've had on street parking issues in the past. The other thing is, is if you are going to expand to tasting, which I don't, I don't, I support, um, then we need to have that as part of this approval with that outlined in the facility description and, and drawing, I think. Um, because that's an addition sure. Sure that, yeah, that I think we're okay with, but we might as well do it now than have to make you come back again. Well, I, I'm meeting them in an hour, so uh, <laughs> and hopefully we'll have it all drawn up so it meets with approval. Perfect. Thank and that's you. what, because I wasn't sure what was required, I wanted to get the architect involved. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll have that for you within the next you know, 24 to 48 hours. Well, it can be part of when it comes back to us on the ninth, and I appreciate your taking the time to do that. Sure thing, no problem. I just want to make sure we all, you know, understood what we intended to do with the property. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for. Um, I'm glad I called you. Saw your hand was raised, so <laughs> appreciate your comments. <laughs> um, Electronically. <laughs> So this is a public hearing. Are there any members of the public who want to comment on this at this point? We have several phone numbers on there. If you want to make a comment on this application, if you could raise your hand on the, by pushing star nine on your phone and that would raise your hand. So we don't see anybody raising their hands. So I will close the public hearing. Uh, people will have a, the opportunity on September 9th to make public comments again. So bring it back to the board. Is there any further discussion on the motion to continue? Okay, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, approved five to zero to continue to September 9th. Uh, let's go on to the next item, which is, this is a mouthful, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of Picking County General Obligation Open Space Acquisition Bonds Series 2020 in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $20 million for purposes of purchasing and improving open space and trails, providing for the levy of ad valorem property taxes for the payment of such bonds, providing the form of such bonds and other details with respect to such bonds and the payment thereof, 
approving other documents relating to such bonds and providing the effective date of this ordinance. <laughs> and we have in the room with us Dale Will and we have Ann Driggers and Gary Tannenbaum all on, both on the Zoom call. So um, Ann, are you gonna take, take the uh, lead on this one? I think I'm actually going to let um, uh, Dale or Gary um, lead the, this off. But I also wanted to mention that on the phone, we have America Murillo. She has a hand raised. Um, she is representing our um, municipal advisors, uh, Piper Sandler. Um, you met Jonathan Haru last time. Um, unfortunately, he's unable to attend this call. So America is on the line to answer any questions anybody has of our municipal advisor. Okay. So, America, welcome. Okay. Welcome. So, give me one second. I just promote her to a panelist. Maybe she can uh, just now she can talk. Okay. So, America, now you have joined our Zoom call. So, yes. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I was on mute. That's okay. So, then, um, Ann or Dale, who's going to do the lead? Is America going to be the one to talk us through this? Well, I think probably open space staff would start out. Gary, do you want to lead or you want me to take off? Um, you could, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically what, <laughs> hi, hi guys, hi everyone. I'm Gary Tinnebaum, I'm the director of Pickens County Open Space and Trails. And um, we did, uh, pretty good presentation for the first reading. And of this, you know, for open space and trails right now, this is a excellent opportunity to provide a pretty hefty amount of capacity for the program to buy open space and to build trails. And um, as you're gonna hear, I'll turn it over to Dale and Ann, that, you know, things have gotten better since our first reading, some things have changed and you know, we can go through that, but you're, you're going to see that we actually are going to even get an increased capacity to do the great work that we do throughout the county. Um, thank you guys earlier for approving the Kerbaz in holding. That'll be a huge, huge piece. And it's just one piece of the puzzle to really say why we need this. We had to act so fast on that one. So we did not lose that. And that would have been a big, big bummer to have a hole in the middle of all of that open space. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a lot more of that coming. And so, you know, I, you know, there are some changes here. I talked to all the open space board, so they're on board with some of the changes and I'll uh, turn it over to Dale and Ann to go through it. Okay. Well, thank you, Gary, just to add a little bit more specifics to Gary's introduction of this. Since first reading, we've learned two things about the potential bond issuance. Uh, one of them um, adding some capacity. The other one, not exactly what we wanted, but still workable. The first thing is that uh, we were educated as to the likely uh, addition of a premium to the sale of these bonds and that is above and beyond the face value of the bonds uh, it, it's not something that's limited by the authorization of debt because the premium is not a type of a debt uh, John Ely and I had a chance to talk about that yesterday and the bond council has also uh, opined that whatever premium might be available in today's market for the sale of these bonds uh, can be added to the total authorization of debt, which is $20 million. Uh, consequently, we anticipate that the actual uh, return on this bond sale will exceed the face value of the bonds by a nice amount. And um, staff are recommending that we stay with the approval of the issuance of $20 million of face value uh, with the premium uh, to be added to that in an amount that will be determined when we get closer. 
uh, to, to the actual issue. The second change from first reading is that uh, the Bond Council did also opine that the duration of the bonds should be limited to the duration of the remaining authorization of the open space program in general, which is 20 years. So uh, unlike what we were recommending uh, at first reading, which would be a 30-year issue, uh, we are now recommending the uh, maximum duration that the Bond Council is comfortable with, which is 20 years. Uh, the effect of that is to raise somewhat our annual service on these bonds to uh, a little over 1.1 million. Uh, but the debt service, even at that amount, uh, especially in light of the real estate market rising and the likely uh, impact of that on the open space revenue overall, uh, the debt service is manageable and consequently the open space staff are uh, continuing their recommendation to issue a full $20 million of bonds to set us up for uh, acquisitions uh, and um, potential capital improvements in the next few years. Uh, we just purchased the um, Thompson Divide Preserve Ranch at uh, f about four and a half million net to the county. And um, in addition, we've, we've purchased the uh, Corame Mining Claim. Today we closed on the purchase of the conservation easement from the Harvey family on the little area that uh, is going to be added to the conservation easement of the Harvey Ranch. Uh, and um, at the uh, land title today, the, uh, the title examiner over there was telling me that they, they've never seen a market quite like this one, uh, mm -hmm. and that if we want to continue to play in this sandbox, we need to have all the capacity we can. So um, we are presently negotiating uh, for additional purchases that you're aware of that we're not able to discuss publicly because of the um, sensitivity of negotiations prior to agreements, but um, we have a very confident um, expectation that the uh, bond proceeds will be utilized uh, for very important open space acquisitions in the next couple of years and uh, properties that if we're not able to preserve them in the near term will uh, possibly slip away from us and never be obtainable again. Uh, with that, I would turn over to, to Ann or to uh, our consultant at Piper Sandler to fill in any additional details. Yeah, I just wanted to provide an update on behalf of Jonathan Hero. Uh, we did meet with uh, Moody's last Tuesday. We're expecting uh, the rating uh, this upcoming Friday, we're expecting a double A for both issues, the sales tax and the open space, and everything is on schedule to close to price and close uh, for the set timeline. Okay, George. Yeah, could you um, um, explain again, Dale, or um, is it Ann? Uh, why bond council decided to uh, revert back to a 20 year versus a 30 year? Well, I did not speak with them directly, but my understanding from talking to Jonathan at Piper Sandler uh, is that uh, they took another look at the ballot question from 2006 and um, that ballot question had the effect of well, it, it, it described the allowable um, issuance and, and that in relationship to the ballot question of 2016, which extended the tax overall to 2040, um, their, their opinion is that, uh, some, somewhat contrary to what we had understood before, that our ability to levy the um, mill levy adequate to pay off these bonds should really uh, be concluded uh, in the time frame of the authorization of the open space mill levy overall. Um, 
I don't have a more detailed explanation of their opinion, uh, but uh, that, that's, that was the way it was delivered to us. Maybe Ann has an additional insight into the basis of that opinion. Um, I do not. That was pretty much as it was presented to me as well. That Bond Council, Kujak Rock, went back and reread and um, changed their recommendation. All right. Okay. Thank you. George, I can check with Jonathan to see if we have additional information that we can provide you with, if you'd like. Yeah, I, I'm just curious because um, even uh, if and when uh, the uh, open space no levy expires in 2040 and i would hopefully uh two two uh, several years before that um we'll we'll see a a, um, a new ballot initiative to extend that uh, because what we we will always have ongoing costs uh regarding the uh, the lands that we own the trails that we will need to maintain uh right dale or gary Correct, George. Yep. And so, yes, there's, you know, you do, the point is, is that we're going to have forever maintenance. So one day we're going to have to, you know, because the county general fund won't be able to absorb this. So one day we will need to go ask the voters for at least at the minimum a permanent maintenance fund. But the, re the reality too with the when dale and i really looked into the difference between the 20 and 30 year it really came down to you know it's like about 350 to 375 thousand dollars a year however what we're seeing in the real estate market is we're going to see a pretty hefty increase in two years and it it, it really is not going to affect the overall it, it, in the end, it gives us a lower interest rate. We're only at 1.32 percent, which is ex which is crazy. And also, with the potential premium here, is we're going to pay almost the whole thing back, you know, and not pay a whole lot on top of it. So, you know, we're going to get the capacity today and be able to pay it off in the authorization of this time. So. You know, we didn't really think we didn't want to push it too far because we didn't really feel that we needed to. If if, if you guys do, we can do that. But I think we, we were very comfortable on staff to go with the 20 year to take on the extra 375, split it appropriately between the the different pots of our fund and make it all work. Yeah, I, I, I think as Dale has said or alluded to, the, the benefits uh, to the program, uh, maintaining that AA uh, bond status, the premium that we're going to see that will actually net, net the program uh, additional dollars, I think is well worth, worth uh, uh, taking those recommendations from bond council. Anne, go ahead. I just wanted to follow up on a question that Kelly had at last time about our essentially our debt debt ceiling and the maximum amount of debt we are allowed to issue as a county. And I went back and did the calculations. So our total um, debt ceiling is just um, shy of $103 million. So we could issue $103 million of debt. Currently, we have um, about 12 percent of that issued um this would add on probably another 10 percent so we would still have um in excess of 70 million dollars available to us to issue for debt which i think is a fairly substantial amount that i can't imagine that we would ever issue <laughs> debt <laughs> Um, and to tag on to that statement, uh, if we issue bonds, for instance, to pay for a new airport terminal, which might be, I don't know how many millions, but it might be 70 million or something, uh, would that count against that, that limit that Pickens County could issue? 
Uh, I would have to look into that specifically because the debt limit is usually um, just for general obligation um, bonds as opposed to revenue bonds, which is what we would have for the airport. So I would have to have our bond okay. council look into that. Okay, so it might be a different pot that we'd be doing an airport revenue bond from. Okay, thank Correct. you. Um, let's see. I can't see people's faces right now. If someone wants to talk, go ahead and cut in. Okay. Um, Kelly? Uh, for, yeah, sorry. I'll just ask. Um, I want to be sure I'm clear that um, seeing the premium on these on the bond sale that if that puts it over the 20 million that we're not in violation of the ballot question it doesn't seem like we would be since we're not taking that on as debt we're obtaining it as revenue but i wanted to check in with john Neely on that you're muted um thanks kelly uh yes the only limitation that we have in the issuance in this particular um sale is to not exceed the voter authorization that was done a number of years ago. The additional premium, which is really rather incredible, I've never heard of that personally uh, being so high, but um, it, uh, it does not represent debt, and so therefore is not precluded by the authorization that the voters gave the county um, in allowing us to issue $20 million in debt for open space and trails purposes. Thank you. Yep. Let's see. Um, Dale, is the twenty-year thing written into the the uh, res to our ordinance, or is that something that is decided at the time of uh, just the technicality of when the bond is actually issued? I believe it's in the ordinance. We received a revised ordinance from the bond council in advance of the meeting. It's only 33 pages long. Right. <laughs> it is in there. Okay, so it does say, somewhere says 20 years. I just hadn't, hadn't seen it and I'm trying to scroll through there now. I just wanted to verify that. Uh, it, well, so to, to clarify, you know, it's, um, I am looking through the whole thing right now. It's, uh, it's, it's a little convoluted how they say it, but. It is convoluted. <laughs> yes. So anyway, but this was given to us by, um, shall the, shall the existing, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, I'm trying to see, and do you know exactly if it if we have to say it because well it says it right here shall be extended for 20 years commence with the tax year two oh no that was the mill levy right they, they're going back through all the history in this yeah <laughs> no that's why i I thought I saw that too patty that's why i said yeah. it was in there they're going back through the history and everything happens to have i think i found it and kelly go ahead yeah, um, I'm looking at page 20 of the oh, yeah, of the right. resolution from the bond council and section four says the final maturity of the bonds shall not be later than December 31st, 2040. Nice job. Okay. Good job. It. She started okay. from the back and went forward. <laughs> we have new bond council mm -hmm. <laughs> in Iowa. So now, in regards to <laughs> in regards to George's Probably. question. Um, where we were maybe going to get more information about that. Um, what's the effect of that if we didn't then found out that we could do it for 30 years instead of 20? You can always go back and re-amend a bond by bringing it back to the board when they're new terms. Well, my understanding, and maybe John Ely could correct me, but that the bond council have a regulatory role in this and that we really need to follow their uh, determination on the eligibility of these bonds 
Well, um, bond council is not in a position to dictate to the county what it does, but bond council, uh, their principal role is to facilitate the sale of the bond. So, and therefore, to present the bond issue as something that is readily uh, uh, available, readily understandable and appreciable in relation to whatever it is that supports the debt, whatever supports the bond, in this case, the property tax. Um, yeah, I'm kind of surprised myself that they went as conservative as that simply because um, the, the debt authorization from the voters does state that the tax shall continue um, past the life of the program if the program did in fact end with the, the current um, uh, tax approval. But the, the mill levy will continue to a point where any authorized and issued debt has been satisfied. So uh, to me, that's pretty straightforward. I'm not, I would be curious as to why they um, didn't rely on that language and are at more conservative approach of well let's look at what the maximum authorization life of the program is based on the last re up um, voter approval um, but uh, that's what we have right now we go ahead and improve this uh, uh, debt issuance then the wheels will be set in motion I'm not sure where we can at what point in time we get to that place where we really can't back off and change our uh, the content of this resolution to something else, to be honest with you, uh, it, you know, this will be working towards a sale that would occur in, uh, I forget the date because we have two of them right now, this one in the, in the next uh, item on the agenda, whether it was beginning of October or uh, end of September. But, um, you know, that's, that's, that's it. I mean, the only way you can change it to 30 years is to buy back the bonds and reissue them. Theoretically, Rob may, might be able to do it within the next regular meeting and perhaps get them uh, a more in-depth explanation as to why the 20 years instead of the 30, but there is a point in time where um, changing course is problematic. Patty. Yeah, I think it's cleaner just to do it in 20 years. Uh, I mean, I know that the language says we can carry the mill, mill levy over, but we can do it in 20 years. Uh, and we're capable of doing that at this time, and everything's working in our favor at this time. I'd rather just move it forward with the 20 year. And then isn't there a time frame when you pay down X amount of years, you can bring it back like we're doing with the next item and um, either rebond or pay off the bond or whatever, you renegotiate the bond, whatever. So um, I, I think I'm pretty comfortable in moving forward with it at a 20 year time frame and, and getting it done and getting that money in the bank now and moving forward with what we have in the plan. So I think I would agree with that, Patty, because that is clean cut date with a 20 year, the 20 year thing is, then there's no, nobody can be second guessing us or saying, for that next you know, questioning, years. well, why did you do it for 30 years when it's only authorized for 20 years? And that way we, we have a clean slate. We do that, we would have to pay more per year on the debt repayment. Is that something that the open space and trails budget could handle given that that one, whatever the one point something million per year repayment? Yes, well, Gary and I just discussed that and we do uh, conclude we can handle it. Uh, there's a, a couple of points about that. One, as Gary mentioned, uh, with the current interest rate available to us of 1.3 over the 20 years, when you add in the premium, really the, the total cost of these bonds is, is going to be our, our ultimate cost in terms of interest is going to be negligible because the premium offsets the 1.3 percent over the 20 years. Uh, secondly, the allocation out of the open space fund we've clarified with Ann, we can allocate the repayment of these bonds to the purpose within the fund that the bond proceeds are used for. And uh, as we've said, our 
most likely purpose for the use of these bonds is not in the capital improvement side, it's more in the acquisition side of the open space program. Consequently, the repayment out of the open space purchasing allocation in the fund over the 20 years is just about one for one what we're going to realize on the bond sale. So uh, we don't really see that there's a, a downside to doing this and we're able to sustain our operations and maintenance in the program. Uh, consequently, that's why staff, similar to what Patty just expressed, accepted the bond council's view on the 20 years and came back with a recommendation to proceed regardless. And one thing we don't know right now is if the premium is tied into the 20-year term as opposed to a 30-year term. Uh, and thanks, Dale, for the calculation. I was thinking, quite frankly, that we were making money on the issuance of these bonds. That was the interest and the premium uh, combined over 20 years. We were actually ahead of it, not breaking even on the on the cost of the issue. Well, we'll see when we get the final premium. It's possible we will make a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Paying us to issue debt. <laughs> Greg. Yeah, thanks, all. Um, I think I'm inclined to go along uh, with what Patty's uh, proposed. Um, it's, I'm frustrated, though. I, I I wish we had an answer uh, and we had we understood more about what the bond council and how they made their decision. Um, and it's a shame they're not. Uh, we we can't get that information today because maybe that would help us. Um, you know, look, look farther forward the way George is, you know, where George is thinking. Um, but I would say that I'm, I'm happy to go along uh, for the reasons stated by everyone else, and I'm looking forward to this. It's, 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 a, it's a great opportunity for us. Well, I could certainly pursue a more detailed answer to this, and if it's possible to revisit this at the next meeting uh, without upsetting the uh, the wheels, as John described them, uh, we can certainly evaluate that opportunity and let you know whether it's it's feasible to take another look or not. But in any event, bring you a more mm -hmm. detailed explanation of this legal opinion. Right, I, I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would just say I don't I don't need that. I'm ready to move this forward personally. So am I. George? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I'm ready to move this forward. This is the first read anyway, and it can't no, be a confirmatory second, 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 second read in two weeks. Oh, this is our second read. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, even, yeah, I'm fine with it. And the I, I, think, I, think, I think the benefits outweigh uh, with, this, with the premium, so. Yeah. And the one thing we could do if we find out, Dale, if you could actually find that out, what we it. could do, we could have a motion to reconsider on September 9th. It would have to be our next meeting. We couldn't do it later than that. It would be the only opportunity if we wanted to revisit it and change it to 30 instead of 20. That would be our only opportunity and the only way I could see that we could do it. Kelly. Can't do a motion. So I would just recommend, I mean, I'm ready to make a motion to move this forward. Dale can come back to us during an open discussion with that answer, and we can decide at that time or during future agendas if we feel like it merits putting a reconsideration on the agenda. Um, I'm not sure it will for me, but, but, but that would be how I recommend. Just so you know, it. my understanding of reconsideration is you vote on reconsideration and it moves to the next meeting after that. I don't think you, re John, clarify for me. Can you reconsider at the same meeting you vote to reconsider? Is that a Sorry yes? Again. Uh, yeah, you can do it all at once. Okay, that that makes it cleaner. Okay, George. And you can you can only do it as late as the next regular meeting. Right, which would be the ninth. George. Yeah, I I, I don't think we need to reconsider. I, I don't want to hold off. Uh, the opportunity uh, for a bond sale uh, to um, maximize our premium amount. I'm sure that uh, once this is approved, uh, this will go out, 
go out to the public and probably for institutions for purchasing. And, and um, I don't want to have any sort of uh, doubt in uh, institutional's mind that they may be reconsidered and, and have to wait. I agree. Okay. So um, I'm going to open the public hearing right now. This is a public hearing. Are there any people on the phone? And we have a few people on the phone. If any of you wish to speak about this issuance of a $20 million bond for the Open Space and Trails acquisition, um, go ahead and raise your hand by pressing star 9 on your phone now. Steve, I did have a comment from someone that I could read to. Okay, let's, we'll, we'll see. Uh, no one's raising their hand at this point. Um, Dale does have a comment, a written comment from someone. He's going to read that to us right now. Uh, this was a comment that was given to me by Tim McFlynn. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Open Space Program uh, and was actually one of the key organizers of the both the 2006 and the 2016 ballot questions uh, worked on the citizens committees that, that promoted those two questions. And here's what he uh, provided to me uh, since he wasn't able to stay on the call long enough. Uh, quote, as a founder, longtime trustee, and manager of the 2006 reauthorization campaign, uh, I, one, enthusiastically support the VOCC approval today authorizing issue of open space acquisition bonds, and second, commend the fiscal discipline and clairvoyance of both boards for brilliant timing of <laughs> adding $20 million plus in bonding capacity for both acquisitions and already under contract um, and others in the pipeline. Bravo. End quote. Thank you. Thank you, Tim McClain. Okay. Well, uh, if, uh, just if a second. Ready, just, if I make a motion. George, just a second. Um, I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand, so I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. I make a motion to approve. I'll second. Okay, George moved. Patty seconded. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Proof. Five to zero. Did Thank you. you very much. Gary's got his yep. grin is going to get bigger and bigger as the day goes on. And Dale, Steve, thank you. Steve, wait, wait, hold on. Okay. Well, we close the public. We do. Time. We do have a hand raised right now. Um, phone number six seven seven zero. Do you want to talk right now? They're muted. We're not hearing anything. They need to unmute. Do they do a star six or something to unmute star their phone? Six star six? Phone number ending in 6770. Try doing star six on your phone. That would unmute you. Maybe they don't want to speak on this item. Okay, we're not. Hi, this is Howie. Oh, Howie. <laughs> of course, it's Howie. <laughs> Howie, we've already voted, but you want to say something right now? We didn't vote yet, did we? <laughs> well, yep. Yeah. It, well, thank you for voting on it affirmatively. <laughs> All right, let's move on here. So, Howie, I don't know what's happening. We're not hearing you. He just muted again. Okay. We Okay, we, we passed this. Howie, Howie I, we think we know what you would have said if you had been able to keep talking. 
<laughs> um, seeing as how you're on the Open Space and Trails Board that voted unanimously for this too. So uh, moving on to the next item. This is a resolution Thank you. of the board authorizing. Thanks, now, how come the other is an ordinance and this is a resolution? I don't know. We'll have to find that out. Authorizing the issuance of Picking County sales tax revenue refunding bond series 2020 in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $5.165 million dollars supplementing resolutions number 92-392, 93-192, and 148-2010 and setting forth certain other matters relating thereto. So we have still America and Anne are on the call. And Anne, could you tell us about this? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Anne Driggs. I'm the finance director and treasurer. Um, this is a refunding, um, essentially refinancing of some existing debt um, that is, um, we're able to get a lower interest rate. Um, the existing debt was issued in 2010 um, and that refunded prior issuances that we had. Um, the purpose of the, of the use of these um, bonds was for um, RASTA. When RASTA was part of the county was when we initially issued this debt and so we continue as Picking County uh, to carry this debt on their behalf and we subtract the, subtract the debt service payments from their sales tax um, that we pass over to them each month. So this has no impact on the county whatsoever. However, um, we will, um, we expect a annual um, decrease in uh, cost to RAFTA for approximately $80,000. So uh, my counterpart over there is um, pretty happy about that. And um, I've listed here under key discussion items the, a couple of things that have changed in the resolution since we presented it to you at the first public hearing. Um, Bond Council has uh, just added some uh, further discussion um, and we've reduced the pr principal amount from 5.5 million to 5.165 as we get um, closer to the, the time of uh, pricing. Um, we kind of know what to expect. So. Um, again, just to mention that um, the impact to the county, uh, to Pitkin County's um, budget is zero. Um, this benefits uh, RASTA as we pass it through to them. Okay, any questions for Ann? So Ann, because this was reduced down to 5.165 million, does that mean that we're also basically getting a premium on this bond issue also? Or is this a different no. a different reason? No, it's a different different mechanism. It was just we weren't co completely sh sure exactly what it would uh, look like. Um, so right now we're, we're clear on how much it will be. Okay. George? <clears throat> yeah, this was actually mentioned at, at our last draft of board meeting and the board of directors was uh, very appreciative of uh, the county in terms of uh, doing this. I would just add um, by putting the, this um, one together with the open space and trails one, it means we get better pricing overall because it makes it more attractive to have them together. And um, while we expect a double um, A AA, um, rating for um, both of the, the issuances, um, the open space and trails one will likely be um, a double A one as opposed to this being a double A two, primarily because of the sales tax being a more volatile uh, repayment source. But in 2019, the sales tax specifically for this 
um, this debt um, covered it 20 times over, which is a um, extremely uh, strong, um, almost unheard of um, debt coverage. Okay. So this is a public hearing also. I'm gonna open the public hearing right now, see if there's any members of the public who wish to comment on this. So there are five attendees. Some of you I recognize as being for the Emma Fields issue. Um, if any of the others want to comment on this, if you could press star nine on your phone to raise your hand on our screen and we'll call on you. I'm not seeing any hands being raised, so I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. I make a motion to approve. I'll second that. Okay, moved by George, seconded by Greg to approve. Is there any further discussion? Seeing I just want to uh, thank Ann and the Finance Department for uh, being able to follow up and um, this is definitely a, a little benefit uh, for RAFTA. Absolutely. Ditto that, George. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thanks, Jack. Aye. Okay, Ladies proof, and gentlemen. Unanimously. All right. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, America, for joining us oh, there's today. Valerie. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay, moving on to item number 10. Uh, let's see, Valerie, you're here. Thank you I am. for being promptly on the scene. We're going <laughs> to continue on. So this is a resolution authorizing Pickin County Office of Emergency Management to accept the 2020 Emergency Management Performance Grant, EMPG, from the State of Colorado Department of Public Safety Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for purpose of funding a portion of the Picking County Emergency Management Annual Budget. And Valerie McDonald will present this to us. This is an annual event, having you come and present this to us. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Valerie McDonald, Picking County Emergency Manager. And I said Steve said it all in the title. I'm here to ask for your approval of the 2020 uh, Emergency Manage Management Performance Grant. It's federal money passed to the state, in this case, the Colorado Department of Homeland Security Office of Emergency Management. They act as the grant administrator. Um, the amount of the grant is $65,000. This would be the seventh year that we uh, successfully applied for this grant. It's meant to offset a portion of the emergency management budget to ensure we have a all hazard emergency management program. Does anyone have any questions? You've heard this 14 times now over <laughs> seven years. Greg. Yeah, I just wanted to met, you know, I'd point out that for seven years you've done a great job. You're hitting it out of the park every every year. And I just wanna to, wanted to know is does it get any easier to make this application or is there, it sounded like there was a lot of work to it uh, previously. Um, it's still worth doing clearly, but how are you feeling about it? Well, I always appreciate you asking, Kelly did last, last time, um, just acknowledging the administrative burden of this grant is a beast. There's the administration end of it and then there are grant deliverables and the federal, the feds have their deliverables, but where it gets dicey is it goes to the state and then they add on deliverables as well. Um, it, it's very subjective on their end, but like, so it, it's daunting. Um, they think they are the boss of me, but I think Picking County, we're pretty independent by nature and, you know, we push back appropriately. Um, I'm okay with it. I've accepted it. I've done it successfully for seven years. It adds up to a, a lot of money, which is important. So I am at peace with it, but thank you for asking. 
Patty? I just wanted to give you seven years of thank yous. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question, Valerie. Um, was the amount $65,000 seven years ago also? Has it been the same yeah, amount? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, what that means what that means is that actually the amount, the, the buying power of what we're getting is actually going down because there is some inflation over seven years. <laughs> so maybe next year you need to try to ask for more, which they're probably not offering more, but... <laughs> Every year they they say they're every year they say they're going to reduce the amount. They haven't, but I, I'm pretty confident they will next year because they've they've overextended themselves. So I expect it to drop down a few thousand. It's just difficult to say no because seven years, six point seven is like four hundred almost. All, let's just round it up. It's almost a half a million dollars at this point. So. All right. Thank you, Kelly. I was going to make a motion to approve. Oh, we have a public public hearing, yeah. so I can hold. Yeah, let's wait for the public hearing. Um, I'll open the public hearing right now, and we'll see if anyone. Uh, there's only actually two phone numbers that might that could potentially want to comment on this. One ending in eight seven seven one, the other ending in zero zero seven two. If either of you want to speak to this issue, press star nine and that will raise your hand and then we'll call on you. I have a feeling they're probably here for another issue, so. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to you, Kelly, to make a motion. Okay. I move to approve the resolution authorizing the Picking County Office of Emergency Management to accept the 2020 Emergency Management Performance Grant from the State of Colorado Department of Public Safety Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for the purpose of funding a portion of the Picking County Emergency Management Annual Budget. I'll second that. Okay, moved by Kelly, seconded by Greg. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, say oh, aye. Yeah, Valerie. <laughs> aye. 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 Thank Thanks, you. Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. Good job. Thank you all for your thank you all for your support. You enabled me to do what we get done. Thank you. <laughs> okay, moving to our next item, and this is yours, Gr. Uh, the resolution authorizing the chair of the Board of County Commissioners to sign and enter. Pitkin County into an intergovernmental agreement with the state of Colorado for Highway Safety Improvement Program grant. GR Fielding, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Steve. Again, I'm GR Fielding, the county engineer. Uh, this is the second reading for this Highway Safety Improvement Program grant. Several years ago, staff had brought forward a local road safety plan that showed 50% of our crashes that we analyzed were winter driving condition related. Um, since uh, since our first reading, I went back and I analyzed the data uh, quickly and uh, we had 190 crashes in the canyon. Of those, 128 of them were winter driving condition related. Wow. Uh, so that equates to 68% of the crashes on State Highway 82 that are in Snowmass Canyon uh, are related to winter driving conditions. Um, so. Anyone who commutes down valley uh, or up valley in the morning uh, during the winter months knows that there's a few places that freeze in Sermass Canyon in the afternoon and more generally that's uh, our most difficult driving conditions during winter driving along 82. Uh, because of this, uh, CDOT put icing sensors in the canyon. Uh, the existing sensor doesn't always pick up when the road freezes. And so working with CDOT, we've identified some new places for sensors. Uh, Picking County has applied for this grant to uh, put in these two new sensors. It'll be a construction grant. These relay the message to the VMSs at either end of the canyon to alert motorists that the highway is iced in, uh, in the canyon. Um, the grants for $125,000, uh, the state will provide both the grant money and the match. 
Uh, what the ask of the county is, is uh, to facilitate the project. So that'll be the staff's time to manage the project, to put together plans uh, and to manage the construction uh, on the state highway. Uh, there is a chance that at some point next year, depending on timing of things, that we would need to use some of our budgeted professional services to help facilitate this. But I, I believe that would be a pretty minimal uh, investment of the county to get this safety improvement on the state highway. And that's all I had for you on this. George? SOTR, uh, when will this go into uh, place? Uh, well, because of the timing, I don't think that we'll be able to move this forward for this winter, so it would be a 2021 project. Okay, thanks. I was wondering, GR, is there any way on our if we get our messaging sign put up, if we could once in a while when the roads are icy, just remind motorists that 68% of the crashes in Picking County are in Snowmass Canyon <laughs> on icy roads. That there's some way we could get publicity out there to that effect to uh, just remind people they need to be extra careful going through Snowmass Canyon. Because when there is a crash there, then the raft of buses are sometimes are diverted over onto Lower River Road, and it's it's can be a mess. Guarantee that. You know, as part of the local road safety plan, we think about completed uh, several years ago. Uh, public outreach was one of the big things that uh, come came out of that study. Uh, since then, we have done a few different, uh, you know, public outreach items around winter driving conditions. Um, we also uh, partnered with the sheriff's office uh, with their Dio de las Muertes distracted driving campaign several years ago. So that's that's definitely something that will continue. Okay. Uh, any further questions for GR? I'll go ahead and open the public hearing then, and we'll see if there's anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this issue. Press star nine on your phone if you wish to speak to this issue about the grant for putting more de-icing sensors in Snowmass Canyon. Okay. Not seeing any hands being raised, so we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for a motion. I will move to approve. I'll second. Okay, Patty moved Kelly seconded to approve. Any further discussion? Greg. Um, Steve. Yeah, um, GR, I was just thinking, uh, well, Steve mentioned the dynamic message sign, uh, being able to alert people to the, the gravity of the, of the ice in the canyon when it's bad. Um, it occurs to me that if, it, if we're going to put this off for a year, um, not that I like adding more signs anywhere, <laughs> but I'm wondering if we could replace some of the signs that are, aren't used, are kind of irrelevant. Maybe that's a CDOT question, but a sign at the entrance of the canyon that says, Folks, this is where most of the accidents happen. Slow down. Um, you know, people are, it's a speed speedway through there anyway at this point. I think 70 miles an hour is the new speed limit, or at least it's the new, the new average. Um, I'm just wondering if perhaps we could direct staff to put some signage in to alert people. I think that's a very good point. If I saw that most of the accidents happened here, I'd probably pay more attention. Well, we, we'll certainly work with DDOT on uh, on anything we can. Uh, since we brought this forward with and started working with DDOT, they've actually uh, made improvements in the in the dialogue of their signs, of the variable message signs uh, that are available here. And so um, it's not that, that the existing sensor doesn't uh, ever work. It just wasn't working as often as maybe it should. Um, and so we can work with them on that messaging, and it might be uh, – uh, one of the things where we can call the canyon and ask them to populate the sign if uh, someone from staff has the observation or from the SO's office. Okay, thank you, GR. George? Yeah, I mean, historically, um, when, when conditions uh, do deteriorate and we get into that freeze-melt cycle, 
there is an electronic sign uh, uh, just past Aston Village that alerts uh, motorists that icing, icing conditions do exist. So we have that message out there. And in addition, um, the Sheriff's Department has uh, implemented a program one or two years ago uh, for when conditions were really bad to have a lead car going through to ensure that traffic was going slow. And that was fairly effective as well. Right, and, and George is 100 percent right. That VMS sign does populate, and that's what the sensors will be. Uh, additional sensors will be connected to as well. Great. Okay. Um, if there's no further comments, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Okay, everybody's in favor. Thank you, Gr. Thank you Thank for you. doing that with CDOT. Okay, we have two more items before we get to land use items. We'll do them and then we'll take a break. So the first one is an ordinance of the Board of County Commissioners accepting a conservation easement from the Aspen Consolidated Sanitation District. And Ryan Neely is here to tell us about this. Roy, you're muted still. That answered my question. Can you <laughs> hear me now? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, let me switch off the Sunfire Conservation easement here and get to this guy. All right. So this is an ordinance accepting a conservation easement from the Aspen Consolidated Sanitation District. Today is second reading. Today is a public hearing. This ordinance, this proposed ordinance, was approved by the BOCC unanimously on first reading. The conservation easement grant that is the subject of this ordinance was a, is being carried out to satisfy a condition of approval in the 2019 Pitkin Solar land use approval for construction of the five megawatt solar project on the Aspen Consolidated Sanitation District property across the river from the intercept lot and uh, not immediately adjacent to W slash J, but in the vicinity of the W slash J uh, subdivision. This particular conservation easement that's being proposed is, does not uh, encumber the entire consolidated sanitation district pro uh, property. Instead, it encumbers a portion of the consolidated sanitation district property that generally uh, encompasses the hillside of the Roaring Fork Gorge and goes down to the Roaring Fork River. During the review process for this, during the referral process for the land use item, the Open Space and Trails Board identified the steep hillsides above, the, uh, above and immediately adjacent to the Roaring Fork Gorge as critical travel cor corridors for deer and elk. And that is why the Open Space and Trails Board uh, made a request for a conservation easement on this property. The BOCC in uh, consideration of the Open Space and Trails Board uh, review or referral process during the land use proceeding uh, included the condition of approval that this conservation easement be granted. One unique aspect of this particular ordinance that is in front of you is that it offers two separate conservation easements that the county, that the Board of County Commissioners would need to be willing to accept to adopt this ordinance today. One is a conservation easement with a perpetual term. And the second is a conservation easement with a term that runs contemporaneous with the special review approval stated in the resolution approving the solar project. 
The reason for this is because subsequent to obtaining the approval for construction of the solar project through the special review, the Aspen Consolidated Sanitation District questioned whether they had the ability to grant a perpetual easement on the property in light of the grant funding that they received from the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, when they acquired the property uh, initially to use for a sludge disposal site. My, uh, through various back and forth with the uh, sanitation district and the project representative, RES Inc., uh, we eventually reached a solution whereby the alternative conservation easements would be offered to the county and held in escrow pending the request from the sanitation district to the EPA to grant the county a perpetual easement on the, pro on the portion of the property to fund in the ordinance. And I think one of the exhibits to the ordinance has the map on it. That is the long and the short of it. Uh, through various back and forth, uh, the sanitation district has expressed their intent to grant a perpetual easement. That language is stated in the escrow agreement, and they are going to work with the EPA and share that work with the county as towards their ability to grant the perpetual easement. The last aspect I wanted to note for you of uh, the escrow agreement and this conservation easement is it will allow them to move into the permitting phase of uh, review for the solar project without without fully satisfying the condition that the conservation easement be recorded in advance of doing that. The escrow agreement was designed to address this and to allow them to move into the permitting phase, uh, at least permitting review, without first having to record the easement. Um, and that is the purpose of the escrow agreement to allow them to do that, or one of the purposes of the escrow agreement. Uh, they are currently not in permitting. They are still in the planning section of their review process with the county. My understanding from Leslie Lamont, the senior planner who is handling the planning phase, is they are very, getting very close to being moved to permitting. There are still several outstanding issues that need to be resolved, but they are getting very close. Um, once they are in permitting, they will be reviewed by the building department for whatever necessary building permits they will uh, they are asking for. Sorry, I just got cut off for a second. And uh, then, assuming they get their building permits, they will be ready to move towards the construction phase, which I understand is scheduled at this point to take place sometime in 2021. So that's what I know about that. And I would love any questions you have. Uh, today is a public hearing, so I, I'm not sure if there's any members of the public to comment, but it is a public hearing. So we did, we did have one public comment at the beginning at, at noon when we started our meeting from Natasha Kyler from RES, who was on the phone at that. that time. And she, she spoke in favor, urged us to to is pass she, this. Is she and, still on? I thought she was going to. Uh, are there, uh, Greg? Um, yeah, I, I, still I, I'm too, feeling pretty good about this. I'd like to see this move forward. I I'm, I'm, um, was just wondering, do we have any, any statement from Open Space and Trails on this? They're, they're the ones who first proposed this, is that correct? Um, and uh, are, would they be satisfied with this? Or is this something they've seen before? Well, uh, as far as would they be satisfied with this, um, I think they would accept the, or I think they'd be satisfied with the grant, certainly be satisfied with the perpetual easement. I think they would be settled for a lesser term. 
they are aware of the circumstances that have got, that have led to this uh, particular escrow agreement. And uh, as far as precedent for this with respect to other conservation easements in Pitkin County, there is none to hold a conservation easement that does not last in perpetuity. That is not something that the county usually pursues. Uh, and in this instance, the saving grace from accepting a lesser term is that this project likely will seek some sort of further review at the end of their special review approval, at which time in the event that there is not a perpetual easement in place, a plan for the entire property can be reviewed again at that time. But that's very speculative. Okay, thank okay. you. Kelly? Thank you. Is, um, is the Consolidated Sanitation District um, required in these agreements to initiate this process under a certain timeline or under a certain sort of good faith provision? Yeah, I don't have it right in front of me, Kelly, but yes, they, uh, they, I, I partially drafted it, but I can't remember it now. But yes, they're, uh, they intend it, they, they may have already reached out to the EPA at this point. Um, the, when this first came up, they were still trying to get to permitting and get to construction phase for the building season for 2020. That is not the circumstance now. Um, as I said, they're looking at construction in 2021. The, they very well may have the ability to reach out to the EPA before they even, this thing even gets off the, gets into the construction phase. And I will follow up with Bruce, Bruce Matherly and their attorney at the sanitation district to see where they are with that. Um, and kind of wish I'd done that before today now, but <laughs> I will follow up on it. Patty? Yeah, um, well, we got, we were being pushed for the 2020 building season and now uh, by no fault of our own was not able to happen. Um, I'm not happy deviating from the perpetual easement, um, and I'm concerned about EPA's involvement, especially since this section of the property really isn't where this is being built. It wasn't where the sand district used to dump their sludge. It's over on that bank, that cliff, and it's for the wildlife, you know, corridor. So I don't see why EPA would have a problem a granting, a, you know, allowing for them to grant to accept a perpetual easement that the Aspen Consolidated Sand District because it really doesn't affect where EPA said that they had control or funding for. Um, but all of that being said, I'm willing to just move forward with this because I'm tired of it continuing to come back to us and the amount of time our staff, our legal staff, Rye has put in mm -hmm. um, is ridiculous. Um, and we keep going over it and over it and over it and putting it on our agendas and taking it off and putting it on. and. Um, um, and I think that, you know, that, that, again, all of that being said, we need to move it forward. If not, then um, I'm ready to just say we're done and this project may not go forward. But let's, let's see where we go from here and see what they can get done. And let's hope they don't just say, well, now we have a choice of this easement or that easement. Let's just go with the one that's not perpetual and, um, and be done with it. But I want them to make a diligent effort to get EPA to allow them to do a perpetual easement because that's what we have done in the past with open space and trails and that's what we need to continue to do now. So I would say that one thing in our favor is the topography on the easement land is not suitable for really anything else besides just being there and being what it is right now. I can't envision that any use would ever be proposed for that different than just having it be like a wildlife corridor for wildlife to go down to the river to get a drink. Um, and that actually helps us out that there's, there won't be pressure to be doing some project on that land. Um, so let's see, this is a public hearing 
Um, if any members of the public on the phone wish to speak to this, and we have one hand being raised, 8771. You may speak now. That's Natasha. Is that you, Natasha? She needs to unmute. Let's see, Natasha, we're not hearing you. Uh, try pushing star six on your phone to unmute. Hello, this is Natasha Kyler representing Red. Hi, Natasha, we can hear you. It sounds good. I uh, just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Neal and thank you to the county commissioners. It sounds like we have some support for this and I appreciate that. Um, this is a matter that we do need to resolve to, to keep the project on track um, for 2021, which is kind of the best case scenario and, and really the only case scenario at this point. So I just wanted to say thank you for your help and support in, in advancing this matter and in just in general advancing the project to permitting and construction. So thank you. All right, thank you, Natasha. Any other public comments? You can raise your hand on the star, do star nine. And not seeing any further public comments, I'm gonna close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. So uh, we need a, I'd entertain a motion. I to approve. I'll second. Okay, George moved to approve. Kelly to second. Is there any further discussion? Kelly. Thank you, Steve. Um, I continue to want to see this project succeed and move expeditiously to help um, you know, advance our climate change goals in the region, um, which bringing the solar online will help us do that. Um, I also just want to note that, you know, the, the conservation easement run, would run to the benefit of open space, run to the benefit of the county. And so um, in our conversations with federal delegation, we may want to mention this and that we may, you know, need some help with the EPA for the perpetual easement that we would seek. Um, so and in the conversations with with our congresspersons, um, I just would ask you bring that up and I will do the same. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Some of my sentiments exactly too. Okay, if there's no further discussion, all in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Okay, unanimous approval. Um, Thank you, Rye, for all the work you've done for this. Thanks, Rye. Good job, buddy. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Okay. Moving on, we have a resolution adopting the updated 2020 elected officials transportation committee comprehensive valley transportation plan. And we don't have David Pesnachak here. Uh, GR or Rich, were you going to carry this item? Uh, no, I had not planned on it. Um, I can certainly, uh, uh, I can text and find out uh, where he's at. Okay, well, maybe what we should do is to take our break right now and you see if you can get hold of David and then We'll deal with this one when we get back. If not, I think we can just move We've it been forward. going for three hours. And we have at least four more to go. And we got a, some hours left to go. So we're going to take a 15 minute break right now and we'll be back at 3.15. Thank you. Stand up, stand up,
Ready? Okay. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, our next item on the agenda today is uh, the resolution adopting the updated 2020 Elected Officials Transportation Committee Comprehensive Val Valley Transportation Plan. And Brian Pettit is going to fill us in on this for since David Peschenchak is out of town. And this is our second reading and public hearing on this, Brian, so you'll know. Yep, thank you. Yeah, and I assume that uh, most of the questions were answered at first reading, but I'm Brian Pettit. I'm the Public Works Director filling in for David Pesnicek, uh, the Transportation Administrator. But um, this is to approve the 2020 Comprehensive Valley Transportation Plan, and it really sets policy and uh, policy level priorities for uh, expenditures. So that then staff can ultimately bring back to the EOTC uh, project level level priorities that meet these policy level priorities. Uh, so we're, we'll get more and more granular as we kind of work down the funnel of uh, from strategic plan down to project level transportation projects. Uh, but I think attachment two, the map, uh, is, does a great overview of what the uh, comprehensive plan uh, outlines. Uh, Town of Somas and Aspen have both approved the resolution and adopted this comprehensive valley transportation plan and we're asking the board to do the same. Questions from the board? Don't see any questions. I, we've looked at this so many times. I, we're all totally familiar with it. Um, and I know that uh, I think we all feel good about it. This is a public hearing. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment about this issue? Oh, we only still have the same couple phone numbers on there. Uh, anyone who wishes to comment on this would need to push star nine on your phone to raise your hand and then we would call on you. And I'm not seeing any hands going up on our attendees. So I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for a motion. Move to approve. <laughs> I'll second. I'll second. <laughs> okay, George moved and Patty actually beat out Kelly by a microsecond <laughs> on the second. So uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of approval say aye. 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 <laughs> okay, thank you, Brian, for sitting in for David. Thanks. Nice hat. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, moving on to our land use public hearing items. The first item is a resolution approving the Closer Investments LLC activity envelope, site plan review, special review, and GMQS exemption. And Suzanne Wolf is here to fill in for Tammy today. Um, they have asked to continue this. We need to have a discussion about when it would be continued to. So Suzanne can, and Suzanne's here in the room for us. <laughs> um, thanks, Steve. Suzanne Wolf. Um, yes, the date we're asking for is September 23rd. Oh. Um, we uh, anyway, there were some additional issues we needed to address and work on, so um, we've asked for the continuance. I don't know. Um, possibly Jody Edwards. Um, was going to be on the line if you had any questions um, he represents the closers um, but otherwise they've agreed to the the continuance okay so i will open the public hearing and we'll see um particularly to see if jody edwards is on the line or jody are you there could you raise your hand with star nine Push star nine on your phone if you're there. And any members of the public who wish to call in or. 
Hmm? Jody. Jody. Oh, Jody's on the Zoom call. Okay. Jody, we'll hand it over to you for comments and filling us in on this. Okay, Jody. Okay, sorry, I've got the audio going on behind me and I didn't, didn't know which one was going. Um, we agree with Suzanne, we need to get... Oh. Yeah, turn the audio off. Yeah, got it. Um, we would we are requesting a continuance to September 23rd uh, to allow us to address some questions that were raised, mostly by Tammy, um, uh, with regard to our application. Okay, and so you'll be, uh, we're we're planning on September 23rd. That that works for you and for the closers. It does. Yes. Okay. All right, good. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Does anyone have questions for Jody while he's on the line? Any commissioners? Okay, not seeing any, Jody. We'll see you on September 23rd. Did we already do public comment? Uh, this is, the uh, public hearing is still open. Uh, we'll see once again if anyone has raised their hand for making a comment about this item and seeing none i'm going to close the public hearing the public will be able to comment on this on september 23rd also so i need a motion from the board to continue to september 23rd so moved patty moved all second kelly seconded all in favor say aye 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 aye, aye. aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item. Aspen Valley Ranch Agricultural Facilities Parcel. And uh, I think Suzanne, you're gonna cover this one also. Well, I, yeah, I can just step in. And um, so, right, there's an ordinance and a resolution, but unfortunately, I guess the word did not get to you um, on Monday that this item was going to be continued. There was a noticing issue and it has to be properly re-noticed. So um, that has now happened for September 23rd. I know Patty looked pained when we mentioned that, but that was the first date that we could complete the noticing for. So that whole Aspen Valley Ranch item would be continued um, to the 23rd Okay. as well. Steve? Greg? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, well, do, you, do we have a public hearing on the continuance, or should I make a motion to continue this? Well, I will open the public hearing, just in case anyone is expecting us to be hearing it today. Um, I have a comment, though. Patty has a comment? Yeah, um, our agenda, um, we've, we've been, not that we don't understand that land use applications can be lengthy. It's just that if we have a lengthy agenda prior to land use, we get pushed into being here for quite some time. And um, we do have the fire department coming back that date. Now we have closure coming back that date and now we will have this one coming back that date. I just wanna bring that to everyone's attention. If everybody's okay with that, then I'll be okay with it, so. Pizza takeout. What, you're bringing pizza, George? You're coming to the meeting and bringing pizza? <laughs> pizza takeout. All right, um, it's not so much the food, it's just our mentation after sitting here for so many hours. But I mean, we've done it before, we'll do it again. I just, sometimes we could avoid doing it if we thought ahead, so. Well, we were gonna have three, potentially four lengthy items today, so. I didn't agree with that either, but that's what <laughs> happened, so. If yeah. the board's okay with it, I just wanna make sure that we're clear that Maybe we can try not to stack the agenda ahead of time as much. Okay. So uh, we will need a motion to continue this item to September 23rd. Let's see, Glenn, move. Glenn Horn, you're on. Do you want to make any comments about this, this application? You don't have to. We're going to continue it to the 23rd. 
I don't have any comments. It was a, 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 an accident that my email address changed and I didn't uh, get the notice and, and I didn't notice I didn't get a notice. Okay. It was nice seeing you, Glenn. Okay, so uh, let's see. This is, uh, let's see, I opened the, I closed the public hearing. We need a motion from the board. Oh, we have a motion. We need to call the question. We need to vote on it. So all in favor <laughs> of continuing I mean. <laughs> to September 23rd, say aye. 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 Okay. Next up, we have an ordinance approving an amendment to section 7 20 50, uh, paragraph C, geologic hazards, rockfall areas, and 11 10, definitions of the 2006 Pickin County Land Use Code, Title VIII. This is the first reading on this issue, and Suzanne is here to tell us about this one. Thanks, Suzanne. Steve. You get me again. Um, Catherine Kristoff, our planning engineer, was very involved with this and brought it through the PNZ, but she had her baby boy two weeks ago, um, so she's not joining us today, and I get to, uh, to cover <laughs> for her on that. Um, Glenn has a whole team with him, and when he comes on, I'll let him introduce his crew. I do think also Karen Berry with the Colorado Geological Survey was going to jump in if you did have any questions that you wanted to direct to her. So um, just so you kind of know all the, the players um, involved. I'll just do a quick introduction and then I know Glenn and his team are going to do a little bit more in-depth presentation to you. So I'll let them cover that. Um, so this is a citizen initiated amendment to the land use code to amend the rock fall areas um, provisions of the code. Um, basically, the, pr the proposal is to allow development within a low, moderate rock fall hazard area with mitigation, prohibit development within high rock fall hazard areas, um, and that's similar to what we do with avalanche. I think it's important up front to note that the idea is still that if you can avoid a rock fall hazard, you avoid the rock fall hazard. Both of these scenarios, we're just talking about mitigation if there is no alternative and you're in a low, moderate, or, or high rock fall hazard area. Um, so just a little background, and I think, again, Glenn's gonna give you more, more history, but just going through our codes, before 1994, we allowed development in rock fall areas with mitigation the 94 code and the 2006 code both specifically prohibit development in rockfall areas. It doesn't distinguish between whether you're a low, in a low hazard area, or high hazard area, or anywhere in between. It just says rockfall. Um, so it's pretty across the board. So again, the proposal from the applicant is to change that, treat it more similarly to um, avalanche hazards where we do distinguish between you know, low, medium, a lower hazard versus a severe hazard. And just to note too, that prohibition, if you are in a, a high hazard area, is a denial under the code. It's a prohibition, you deny, and then the language about a takings comes into play. If it's been denied, you could then go to a takings hearing to determine if development would be permitted or not. Um, in the, the packet, you did have some referral comments from the Maroon Creek Caucus as well as the Woody Creek Caucus. Um, the Planning Commission did support this um, by a vote of four to one. Um, the one nay vote was um, Jeffrey Woodruff, and he did provide a letter in your packet as well, I think addressing you know, some of the, his issues and why he, he um, provided, made that vote. Um, I think that's it for my quick introduction, and I'll let Glenn, you know, jump in with his team with some more information, um, and obviously happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, uh, questions for Suzanne. George? Uh, I think there are two questions. One is, um, where's the property that um, instigated this? Um, I think Glenn can address that for you in his, um, his proposal. It's out on 7th Street, generally, but he could basically okay. shout him out. Okay. I, it, I didn't see that in the packet. And then um, 
do you have any any comments uh, responding to some of uh, Jeff's concerns? Who's the chair of the PNZ? Um, I would have to get that in front of me. Um, I don't I don't know that I have any specific responses at this time, but. Um, Again, we, we had supported it as well as, you know, we've worked extensively with, with Karen Berry, um, with the CGS, um, and the language, she was supportive of the language we've proposed. So, um, again, I think that's, that's our position at this point. Um, again, I can, I can pull out Jeffrey's letter and try and see if there's anything specific I could respond to, but I don't have it right in front of me. Yep. No, that, 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 that'd be fine. We're going to be here for more than a few minutes, I'm sure. Uh, but it's always, it's always good to hear um, how ComDev responds to certainly some of the PNC's concerns. Kelly? Yeah, I have a question for Suzanne. Um, and this sort of, I think, goes a little bit to Jeffrey's comment. But Suzanne, did you, in your conversations with CGS or anyone else, come across like model? Um, language for the um, the conversations with CGS I was Catherine was involved um, with Glenn and his team um, you know again Art Mears and Chris Wilbur were both um, working with Glenn on this um, who are both you know you know, Rockfall experts. So they were looking at a lot of the other um, jurisdictions and their regulations in terms of making this proposal. And then we did have further conversations to refine the language with, with CGS. Thank you. Okay, further questions for Suzanne? Okay, seeing none, I'll hand it over to you, Glenn, to do your presentation. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, I'll try to address some of the questions that came up in the course of this presentation. Uh, my name is Glenn Horn, for the record and I'm the land use planner for Ian Sion. Uh, Ian grew up in Aspen. His dad is Marty Kahn. His mom was Sharon Kahn. Sharon uh, Kahn recently passed away. Ian now owns his mom's house, which is located on Shadow Mountain. It's uh, just to the west of the uh, Gromager parcel, accessed off 7th, 7th, South 7th Street. The existing house on the, on the property, Sharon's old house, is probably a teardown. Uh, redevelopment of the house is prohibited uh, by the code because the entire lot is located within uh, what is classified uh, by the experts as a low rockfall hazard area. However, the rockfall hazard can easily be mitigated. I want to introduce Ian uh, Sion, who's uh, on the Zoom uh, meeting. Art Mears uh, is here, as well as Chris Wilbur. Chris is in the office with me, as is uh, Gideon Kaufman. Gideon is a longtime Khan family friend and Ian's attorney. Art and Chris are highly respected natural hazard mitigation engineers. Art and Chris have worked in Picking County in the state of Colorado and all over North America doing uh, avalanche and natural hazard mitigation studies for uh, rock fall, debris flow, avalanches, typical geologic hazards in the Western United States. And in the course of this process, we worked very closely with Catherine Christoph, the county planning engineer, Suzanne Wolf, and uh, Karen Berry, the Colorado state geologist to modernize Pitton County's dated rockfall standards. At the outset of the process, we had a conference call with Karen Berry uh, to discuss the approach that we should take uh, to bring uh, the county's rockfall mitigation standards up to uh, what is really the state of the art in the science and geology of rockfall mitigation. 
Our work included a review of rock fall mitigation standards in multiple jurisdictions in Colorado, Utah, and the United States. Uh, we support the amended code standards as proposed by the county staff. In other words, the language changes that the staff uh, made uh, are supported by the applicant in this case. I'm gonna turn over the presentation to Art and Chris in just a couple minutes. But first, I wanna talk a little bit about the background on the evolution of Pitt County's uh, rock fall mitigation standards. As Suzanne said, Pitt County adopted 1041 environmental review standards in 1975 after the state passed House Bill 1041. Pitt and County mapped all environmental hazards in the county, including the geologic hazards. At that time, the county contracted with Art Mears to map uh, avalanche standards. Rockfall standards were treated in a similar manner to the other 1041 geologic hazards, such as avalanche, Manco shale, steep slopes, and alluvial fans. Hazard avoidance was required if possible. Development with mitigation was permissible if the rockfall hazards could not be avoided. Rockfall was treated like avalanche, Manco shale, steep slopes, alluvial fan hazards and the other geologic hazards in the code. In 1994, the Picking County commissioners were opposed to development in rockfall hazards. This was, the opposition was precipitated by a couple of land use applications at the time. Uh, the commissioners reacted and they changed the code in 1994 to single out rockfall hazards in an inconsistent manner with the other geologic hazards uh, that are addressed in the code. Development within a rockfall hazard area was prohibited, even if there was not a hazard-free area on a property. The county's uh, existing rockfall standards are the product of a political process, not a scientific engineering process. In the last 26 years, since the adoption of the county standards, the tools to assess and mitigate rockfall uh, hazards have significantly changed. The proposed code amendment is based upon standards in other jurisdictions, our review of those standards, a cooperative planning approach with the county and the Colorado State Geologist. It's a state-of-the-art scientific approach to rockfall evaluation and mitigation. The code amendment has been prepared by leading experts in Colorado. The state geologist, the county planner, the county planning engineer, and the planning and zoning commission all recommend approval. So with that as the background, uh, I'm gonna, I'll mute myself and turn the um, screen over to Art Mir, who's on here and Art will uh, make a presentation regarding how we came up with the proposed code language. Okay, I guess I'm here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Art. Okay, good. Well, um, hello to everybody. I haven't been here for a while, but it's nice to see some new faces on the board. Um, I'll be relatively brief and go through the uh, main points. Of course, the details are in the information packet that you have. So I won't I'll go through every every one of the each. I don't know if it's my Zoom since I had problems yesterday, but I, I don't, I'm not hearing Art talk. I think talk. Art is maybe looking to yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, share I'm having screen. A trouble too, because we're, I'm getting a, a delay. I hear all the voices and then 10 seconds later, I hear them all again and they're over top of the new ones. <laughs> maybe that's okay. So Art, <laughs> were you going to share your, share a screen at all? Yeah, I, yeah, I think I'll just go forward and do that. 
Um, can I can I share my screen and, and show you the and show the main points there? Yes, I think you're authorized for that. Go ahead. Okay. I've got I've got the PowerPoint up right now. Well, we're not seeing. And it. we're not seeing it. So what we need you to do is share your screen with the meeting. If you wiggle your mouse. Yeah, on... I did that. I did that for a starter. Is anybody else seeing it? Oh, here we go. Okay, uh, we're we go. seeing it now, and I think it said Chris Wilbur was sharing screen. So. Now if you could, oh, there we got it. Now we got the full screen. So we're good to go, Mart. Okay, well, good enough. I, I think there's going to be this, uh, this delay in two dialogues, one overlapping the other, but I'm going forward anyway. Um, the- Maybe so, maybe as a second. The, Art, you might be able to, if you've got two devices on, that could be the problem if you're hearing an echo, just, uh, you have the phone and the computer. Yeah, I, I only have one device on. Okay, sorry, didn't work. But there's an echo coming from somebody's feeding back. Yeah, I know. I don't have two devices on. Let's, can we just move forward? So yeah, just keep going forward, it, Art. I think it'll work. We'll just have to be a little patient with the tiny delays. Okay, well, here we, here we go. Let's give it a try. Um, I only have two slides. Yeah, and um, basically I wanted to uh, point out a couple of things that have already been pointed out by, uh, by uh, previous speakers, by Glenn Horn, for example. Um, what we're trying to do is, is fit. Hmm. This, is, this, is pretty, this is pretty confusing. <laughs> Hey, are you are you watching the meeting on on our YouTube feed? I, I I was, yeah. You may still have that open. You may want to close that down on a separate tab on your computer. Oh, okay, okay. Because we can hear you just fine. It must be that echo that's that's just messing with your head. <laughs> yeah, I I closed down the uh, the meeting web page. And, and now I think, I think this is working okay now. Um, in, the, um, in the other geologic hazards that are considered by the county, uh, as Glenn Horn mentioned previously, we have, um, well, first the overview provides Finally, uh, as a geologic hazard background, um, the county's approach is a very logical one as far as I'm concerned, and it's one that uh, should be modeled in many other places. Um, this isn't going to work. Somebody think, else is going to have to take think, over. I don't think he knows Chris. I think Maybe Chris. Maybe he can just talk to us. Just have him just talk us through it. All right, I think Chris is, is, is projecting your presentation. So maybe Chris or Glenn could advance the slides. Hey, Aaron, I have an idea. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we yes. can, Glenn. Okay, maybe Art ought to just call in over the phone and he can look at these uh, slides on his screen and do it that way. Can we do that? 
Yes. Okay, so Art, do you have a number there from, uh, or can someone provide Art with a number to call in? Oh. We, th we, we, we think Art dropped out. Glenn, can you or Chris um, jump in until we get Art back? Yeah, do I need to do it? Yeah, sure. I need to do it on your mic. Okay, come on over. In the shared screen. Not Art. Art is in Gothic. This is, there's another. This is. Hello, everyone. It says Glenn Horn, but I'm Chris Wilbur. Am I muted? <laughs> We can hear you, Chris. Go ahead. Okay. I'm going to take over from uh, Art's presentation. Um, basically, geo the approach to geologic hazards in Pitkin County is pretty much consistent with avalanches and other geologic hazards except for rockfall. And that is we prioritize avoidance first. That's the best form of mitigation. After that, if avoidance isn't possible, we recommend going to the least hazardous location. And then following that, we use mitigation to achieve an acceptable level of safety, geologic hazard zone. So what we report and submitted it to Glen Horn and describing a scientific approach to assess and quantify rockfall hazards and risk. We recommended dividing the hazard into high and low to moderate, which were not defined in the existing code, but do exist for floods, avalanches, and other hazards. Pitkin County, as you are well aware, has some excellent um, topographic maps and LIDAR data that allow us to provide much better rockfall hazard and other hazard maps than were possible in the past. In addition, there are software tools and excellent aerial photography to further improve our assessment of rockfall hazards. We looked at several other jurisdictions, mainly in Colorado and Utah, looking at elements of a rockfall hazard ordinance and combine those into what we thought would make a good solution for Pitkin County. Here's a list of the jurisdictions where we looked at their ordinances. Um, we, after coming up with a suggested ordinance, it was sent to the Pitkin County planning staff and the state geologists for review and comment. Their comments were entirely incorporated into the ordinance that's before you. And then the other big change since 1994 is that rockfall mitigation technology has improved substantially. We are able to achieve a much higher level of protection for structures and people, even people outside of their houses, than was possible in decades past. One last thing we wanted to say was that, and this is a little bit in response to Mr. Woodruff's letter, implying that the proposed rockfall code modification might not increase in public safety. And it's my opinion and Art's opinion that this code as presented will result in a substantial increase in public safety related to rockfall. I think that's the end of what we had to present. And uh, well, we do have one more slide to illustrate what a uh, 2000 kilojoule rockfall barrier looks like. This particular barrier is uh, above the Little Cloud subdivision. So with that, uh, I would open up to any questions for me or Art. S 
So, commissioners, any questions? I do have a question. I'll see if anyone else has one first. So, Kelly? Um, I'm not quite sure how to formulate this as a question, I guess. Um, it's just, I'll offer the way that I'm thinking about this. And, you know, when I, when I look at the list of sort of other hazards, um, they're kind of natural disasters, but rockfall is is the result of multiple things. So, you know, wildfire can precipitate rockfall, avalanche can precipitate rockfall, torrential rain can precipitate rockfall. Um, so it's almost like a higher potential, just given the number of things that can cause rockfall. That I wonder how is that how is that considered. Um, when we think about safety and, you know, looking at putting, putting homes in the way of, of areas that may not be able to avoid any level of rockfall. Well, I think that's a good question and it's a, a complicated answer that would take a long time, but, uh, I'll give it an attempt and let's, uh, and feel free to jump in here, Art, if you have some feedback. Um, obviously, it's a geologic process. It is basically an ongoing erosion situation. And the methods to assess rockfall are multifaceted. And that's similar to avalanches. We don't have a long enough historic record to know exactly where and when rockfall has occurred. And it's especially di difficult in developed areas because the evidence that is previous rocks that have fallen are often disturbed, moved, or removed. So in essence, the, the most important thing is evidence of previous rock fall. We also though assess the condition of the source rock area, including measurements such as discontinuities and their spacing so that we can characterize the size and shape of rocks. And then we have software models where we input that data and calibrate it to existing runout. And basically there, there, there's always some uncertainty in this. And one of my contentions with this particular ordinance is that we don't know exactly where that zero hazard line is and I don't think anybody does but with this approach we are actually going to mitigate in low rockfall hazard zones and the impact of that will be to provide protection even beyond that hazard line that we're we have some uncertainty about I don't know if that makes sense but uh I I think your your point really is that there's a lot of uncertainty in in the process and we we have no choice but to use all the tools available to us and do the best that we can and the fact is somebody has to draw that line and say where is safe and where is not safe and in, right now the process only has a single line and what we're suggesting is instead you're going to have two lines where we believe it's safe and one where we believe it is dangerous and by mitigating in between those two lines you actually make it safer outside of both of those lines i guess i would just clarify i guess my point is just that you know the some of these other hazards are kind of based on the season whereas rockfall you know there's an opportunity for it any time of year, multiple reasons. It's true, we can't forecast rock fall very well. Although there is a seasonality to it, it's not 100% correlated, but um, freeze thaw activity is uh, often a factor. But the mitigation me methods that are being used today don't require any sort of a forecast.
Okay, Chris, the question I have has to do with the the mitigation, the, the netting that is, for instance, uh, put there above Little Cloud. And I recall a, a photograph of a huge boulder that the, the rockfall apparatus had caught of just above Little Cloud. And then uh, looking through the regulation that the the people with this mitigation above their property would need to clean the rocks out every year. So in this the case of the little cloud one, it was like a huge boulder that would require either blasting or drilling, breaking it into pieces in place somewhere up on a very steep hill above above where the house is. I don't really know how how they would do that. I don't know if that rock was removed above Little Cloud. Um, it really bent, you know, it bent all the netting and the, the posts and everything quite a bit in that, that instance. But what would be the procedure for someone that, when they do have a rock come down and then having to remove it, how would they go about doing that? Well, that rock that you're speaking of was in fact removed and the rock wall barrier was repaired and inspected by the manufacturer. And uh, as you suggested, if the rock's too large to remove with a piece of equipment, it would probably need to be drilled and uh, broken up with either explosives or expansive material. Um, there are methods and we definitely recommend that these barriers be inspected annually. And uh, that's, this is the case with many forms of geologic hazard mitigation, debris flows. Um, you know, we, we do have an ongoing erosion process. I don't believe there's been another significant rock event since the large boulder that you're referring to at Little Cloud. Okay, thank you. Greg? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, thanks for talking, mentioning the Little Cloud um, and Steve. I've been just been thinking about the other areas in our community where we have rock fall hazards um, and there are homes. And I guess this is an existing home. Nothing can be done on the property uh, until, until they get some sort of rule change. Uh, but I was thinking about shadow. Um, uh, not Shadow Mountain, but the Ute Trail. Uh, that some rock fall up there needed to be mitigated, and we spent a lot of time and energy mitigating at the top. And I do know that some rocks have gone through windows of houses um, down on uh, on the Ute Trail. And I, I do know about boulders that have come off of Smuggler Mountain and, and damaged houses. And, and mitigation was done there through blasting and, and over the years. And think of all the places in our community where we have uh, we have we acquired an open space parcel on the top of Red Mountain recently that had rock fall mitigation requirements as part of it, and and so you know it doesn't come up that often, but it it does come up, and we see we see the the need for uh, you know for handling rock fall. So I'm I'm eager to understand this more and understand how. Uh, how I guess standardizing the code with other communities and, and creating something that meets a, a standard with our avalanche rules and other natural hazard rules would make sense. Um, so I'm I'm I guess I wanted to comment on that. We you know what's how often do we see rock fall? When I started asking myself that question, I I personally remember so many incidents around the community. So you think this is going to help? Um, I, I also hesitate. When I think of the uh, the idea that people are going to be putting up big rock fall mitigation walls and building in places they shouldn't, or at least we don't think they should, uh, so I'm nervous about this. You know, are we going to see an influx of proposals to build where they wouldn't have come before? I don't know if that was for Chris or for anyone else who wants to chime in. That's just where where I'm. And Patty has right her now. hand up. So let's call on Patty. Um, having spent, I don't know. 40 hours, 60 hours, 80 hours on Little Cloud during that application uh, many years ago. Um, we learned a lot about rockfall. We learned a lot about Shadow Mountains. But we learned a lot about bruise nets and how they work and that they do work. And um, 
In the other cases, if you deny, then it comes back as a takings and you end up with a bruise net at the end of the day, uh, in most cases. Um, there is a companies that come in that repair them, remove the rockfall, clean them out. There's a companies that do that. You just have to find them and hire them to come in. Um, they work. That big boulder behind Tom Lewis's house on Little Cloud proved that the bruise net did what we asked it to do. So I think in protection of public, the public, People come in with a new land use application or they want they have an existing home, they want to tear it out and put in a new home, then they need to mitigate for rockfall issues. And I think making a, having a code that makes sense, as we do with avalanches, et cetera, um, and using these forms of mitigation is what we need to do to move these, these applications forward. There's always an inherent risk that a rock will bounce over or a rock will slip through um, just like an avalanche, just like the one up Castle Creek and Conundrum that blew over the top of that avalanche wall. Those people did not want that avalanche avalanche wall have a launch. That's kind of a conundrum on words, another conundrum on words. Um, it went over the house and destroyed the top of the house, but it didn't take the house and it didn't take any lives. Um, there are reasons behind what we do to protect people from natu natural hazards. And um, I think this is a way to do it that makes sense. And um, we have a lot of history, we have a lot of knowledge in the room, and um, I think these code amendments um, are worthy of our consideration and moving forward. If I could, just to follow up on that, Patty, I thank you for saying that. I do appreciate that, and I, I didn't realize you were you were part of that discussion regarding Little Cloud originally. On, on I've got page five and page 531 of our packet, page five of Mirror's presentation, there's a, uh, a great graphic of the Shadow Mountain shadow angles and what we're looking at it looks as if we've got a 26 degree and a 30 degree shadow angle maybe another even higher or a smaller one um, around the entire base of shadow mountain which means that the rock ball could it looks it appears that it could roll quite a, a ways into the community into the town um, so rock ball is going to be an, a, a, if i'm interpreting that chart right and it's obvious we've had rock fall up here. Rocks show up in places that you never anticipate um, having fallen and rolled a long way. So um, I think I agree with Patty on that. So I have a question. I, um, Karen Berry, are you are you on the call here? I actually wanted to consult with you and see um, if there if this was a comprehensive look at the rockfall standards from the different uh, counties and municipalities around in the west where they're the town or the houses are right kind of by the bottom of cliffs do you think and i know you worked on this but uh, do you concur with that this is the best language that we could come up with for uh, new rockfall standards well, mo most communities treat rockfall like other geologic hazards. So they, they typically have the same standards for, for most of the hazards. Um, and in this one, this one's a, a bit different in that, you know, you're coming up with a definition of a high hazard based upon the 2,000 kilojoules, and that's really kind of the design of the geogroup fence that most folks are using. So that's really defining kind of what high hazard is. Um, that's, that's a bit different than, you know, other communities, but, um, you know, it, it, it is a reasonable way to look at defining the hazard. Now I have to say that, you know, a rock well below 2000 kilojoules will kill someone. I mean, that's, you know, but what it will do um, is that defining line then would require the geogroup fence or a similar kind of fence for a mitigation. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, let's see. Uh, Glenn and your team, do you have more to present at this point? Yeah, I have um, just want to make one comment about um, a benefit of the ordinance in that uh, there are homes that are located um, 
in Pitton County and Rockfall hazard areas that given the current uh, regulation, which prohibit development in Rockfall hazard areas, uh, it, it creates an unsafe situation. I'll, I'll give you an example. I worked on a, a property up in Conundrum Creek <laughs> at the base of uh, the side of, of Highland Peak, and there was an old A-frame there. And mm -hmm. uh, this, this was probably about 10 years ago. Suzanne worked on it with me. And the A-frame was built in 1962, I believe. It was just a small A-frame. And we came in with a proposal to redevelop that property uh, and, and develop some rock fall mitigation to protect it. Um, and it went to a, a, a takings hearing and uh, the decision of the board was to not to mitigate, but to say that, that there was a reasonable economic use of that property with the existing A-frame, even though it was quite old. And consequently, they turned down the request to mitigate because they said that there wasn't a taking. Consequently, you've got an A-frame there that people live in that's completely unprotected. Um, and the current ordinance that the, that the Pitkin County has um, is not effective in protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the uh, people who live in that A-frame or, or visiting that A-frame. So one of the consequences of this new legislation would be that unprotected uh, structures such as that A-frame or uh, Ian Sion's house, which has some dated 19, early 1990s uh, mitigation uh, would most likely remain unprotected under the current legislation because there's a reasonable economic use of the property. So it's not necessarily a taking uh, if they get turned down. So my point is that this legislation uh, will probably improve safety for some existing structures that we have in the county. Uh, and I would like you to take that into consideration when evaluating the proposal. Okay, Kelly. Thanks, yeah, Glenn, wait, um, before you go, I just want a little clarification because um, I, get, I get what you're saying mostly. Um, you know, mm -hmm. property owners could still choose to put up this mitigation if they want, but how how do you see this helping existing homes like in the event of like that a frame like what in the ordinance triggers that current or ian's home for example what what triggers that current home that that has has some benefit um to have additional protection under this ordinance i guess i'm understanding it as if you come in for new development then you come up to standard um, as part of your development application. So what am I missing? Yeah, I think the thing is, you have to look at some of these older properties such as uh, Ian's house, Sharon Tom's old house, or that A-frame, and wonder whether there's a an economic motor you know, that, that, that's there that would justify uh, the expense to put in uh, the rock fall hazard mitigation, because it is costly. And I, and I imagine if, if they came in and said, we want to put in this geo bridge fence to protect Ian's house or the A-frame, you would more than likely approve it. But I don't know whether there's the, the rationale or economic justification to make that kind of an investment in the property um, when the code prohibits uh, the redevelopment of those houses. Like the A-frame was built in 1961 and it, it's just sitting there unprotected. Now, if someone could come in and redevelop that house, there would probably be uh, the, the capability to do the mitigation at the same time, because the people that would redevelop it would have the resources to put in the uh, mitigation to protect the house. Uh, but the way the, it is with like that A-frame now, there's just no uh, economic reason to do it. Chris, do you want to add, add one more thing? Um, Chris Wilber again on Glenn's uh, microphone. Um, 
I believe Commissioner Greg mentioned the shadow angle map. And I'm, I'm really pleased that you studied it. And it's an interesting one because when you look at the code, I think the code might have used a 20 degree shadow angle for maybe possibly triggering a rockfall hazard study. And these 26 degree angles would suggest that the base of Shadow Mountain has a serious rockfall hazard problem and that the barriers that are in place right now and any future barriers not only protect those houses but they might actually protect houses down at the lower shadow angle, if that makes sense. It's just one more public safety argument. And I know people don't love the looks of these barriers, but they do provide protection from, for everything down gradient. And I, and I think that's an important public safety consideration and that that shadow angle figure might suggest that the hazard on Shadow Mountain, you know, is serious. I just wanted to add that because of the, the shadow angle is a bit of a confusing thing and, and the implication between the 20 and 26 degree does suggest a high hazard. Is it possible we could look at that on a share screen to to explain what the, the shadow angle is a little bit? And I see Art's on here again. Maybe maybe Art would be able to have better technology this time around. Well, I, I, if you can hear me, um, yes, I would I would like to uh, emphasize that I totally agree with what Chris Wilbur just said. In fact, to expand even on that, if we allow mitigation that's designed according to the new technology that's available, the new mapping, the new models and so forth, if we allowed mitigation in selected areas, that would improve the overall public safety. And that would be totally consistent with the overall objective of the Pitkin County Land Use Code, and it would improve it. Okay, um, I have a question. I guess uh, we're kind of into the discussion part of this right now, and I guess this is a legal question, and maybe John Ely could help answer it. If we approve these changes, like right now, we just prohibit development in in the areas where there's a rockfall hazard. If we approve these measures. And then there's an incident where there is a rock fall. We approve, say we approve a project, the mitigation is put into effect, and then there is a, a huge rock fall that maybe overwhelms, I don't know, bounces over the, the barrier or overwhelms it and destroys someone's house or injures or kills somebody then is the county liable because we approve the, this ordinance to um, allow development in that area? Well, that's a good question, Steve. Um, interestingly enough, the county is more liable if we refuse development in an obviously dangerous place than if we don't approve development in an obviously dangerous place. Uh, if we do not allow somebody to develop in, uh, in a dangerous location, uh, we're potentially liable for a taking claim. If we approve a permit uh, for the construction of a house in an obviously dangerous place, um, we, we, uh, we have no liability for the protection of anybody who goes into the structure or for the loss of the structure or, or anything else. So it's kind of strange. So maybe the question isn't so much are we or are we not liable, but what's the best methodology for the protection of people in general? Um, in other words, how do you recognize a site that is, it is obviously dangerous uh, when the obviousness might not be quite so obvious, right? So you, how do you know when the site is too, too dangerous and what do you do to mitigate appropriately when you have a site that can be mitigated? So that's probably the more uh, correct question if you, if you follow my drift. 
the the dilemma. I mean, there's a lot. There's an interesting uh, interesting sort of history with the code provisions as they exist now. As Glenn said, there was a change in the middle 90s or so. Um, it was uh, reflected in the fact that a lot of lots were coming in under the situation that Greg's uh, painted a minute ago. Uh, there were just uh, the so-called crappy lots. You know, they were you know, a lot of properties were coming in that were um, that were affected by uh, um, potentially hazardous concerns. Rockfall being always the, the major one, more so than say wildfire, which can be adequately mitigated um, in most, if not all, circumstances, or uh, wildlife habitat degradation, or uh, or um, or, uh, or any of the other areas of uh, State interest as defined in the statute, but rockfall uh, and an avalanche have always been the, the primary concern. So, um, in the mid '90s or so, the county moved away from 1041 regulations. 1041 regulations is, is a, a mitigation scheme where you utilize resources from the state to help try to figure out what the best mitigation path is, um, which is the exercise that ARC has gone through here to try to figure out well, what is the what is the best greatest way to mitigate rather than um, the way the code is outlined now or simply prohibiting development. So anyway, what the county did was we moved away from 1041 and we moved into Title 29, which uh, which we took the more uh, obvious approach, which is if, we, if we're not sure of the development and we'll have a, a bright line as defined in the code, which is not perfect by any stretch, then we'll just prohibit development, recognizing that the prohibition might precipitate the liability to the county for takings. We we had this taking determination process crafted into the code. Sometimes you have to recognize the takings, sometimes you don't. So if the property, as in the one Glenn mentioned a minute ago, is already developed, you don't have to recognize the taking and just say, we're not going to allow more intense use up there with a the redevelopment. Um, so, you know, which, which which avenue presents the most the, the most potential for protection of people who would um, be occupying the property or the structure that would be built on the property? The um, the, the absolute prohibition with a, a takings uh, remediation type of approach or the uh, 1041 approach that has a, um, a standard uh, mitigation, and that's a that's kind of a an interesting question. When we readopted 1041 into our land use code relatively recently, just a few years ago, we beefed up the standards that had been present in the previous land use code such that we require uh, a greater degree of analysis and site specific uh, inquiries and, and, and things like that. Um, basically, I think trying to get to the place where art is, uh, that what art is talking about. Um, the, um, the prospect, though, of not having a direct prohibition means you'd have to have um, some type of development on a lot of sites that the board in the past has shied away from. So, um, so that's an interesting uh, dilemma. The, whether or not to allow development or not doesn't preclude somebody from um, constructing safety measures like the antiquated A-frame that would have been a protected site if there was something more valuable located on it would still have been protected. Uh, the county code does not prohibit um, mitigation measures, whether it's berming or rouge nets or whatever. Um, and perhaps um, going forward, if you're allowing development on a, on a broader palette of properties, uh, perhaps we should consider a methodology to continually update um, mitigation methodologies such that um, even if the property isn't being developed and therefore, uh, you know, the, the cost benefit is there so you can spend money on the new, the greatest new thing, uh, we can require property owners to uh, continually upgrade and, and modify mitigation as, as the science changes. I don't know, but, but that is a dilemma going forward. How do you, how do you best protect people and, and, uh, and development on property, um, and that's a that's a tricky question. Um, the uh, 
it's it's more tricky than the actual liability. Okay, George. So, so John, just following up on, on that conversation, that discussion, um, if we were to approve this code change, and so it allows the opportunity for a property owner to um, even at least uh, think about um, a building site, they still have to go through this whole process, and they and, and it's the, and we determine what sort of mitigation measures must be. Uh, put in we could we can look at uh, location site location we can look at size of home uh, there's many different options we can utilize uh, to try to ensure that um, that we're able to make that site as safe as possible um, versus just currently now where we're just saying it's it's undevelopable right if you want to your analytic process has to has to sort of weigh where we are and where we want to go and and, and and develop those criteria or methodologies of review such that we're you know building the better mousetrap so to speak and and, uh, and 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 trying to incorporate or give the board the flexibility to incorporate as much mitigation as as uh, as the board wants in order to try to uh, balkanize a piece of property against any potential damage. You know, you want to be able to, uh, and you want to be comfortable with what you approve, such that you're not uh, having people walk into a, a dangerous situation without any knowledge. You know, the county a few years ago started to require a warning uh, or disclaimer placed on approval plat that theoretically would put people on notice when they acquired the property when they did a title search. They would see this type of disclaimer or warning. Um, but in reality, people who go into properties and, and enjoy improvements on properties assume that they're built according to some code which ensures safety. And nobody's really taking a look at that um, to any great extent. So what you really want to do is you want to, in the approval process, create the, the best and most adequate mitigation to protect property and life. Right? It, it seems like um, the example that was mentioned earlier that actually Art Mears was involved with was the, the home up, up in Conundrum. And, and there's a case where the probably there's no way a house should have ever been built there except for extreme mitigation. And the extreme mitigation uh, helped out. You can look at the, uh, the Cliff Lodge at, at Snowbird as another example. I mean, uh, there's, there's ways to, to mitigate if um, if the applicant wishes to spend the, the amount of dollars that would be required. And as long as they meet our standards uh, to ensure that they're able to mitigate adequately, then it seems like it, it's, it's feasible for them to, to um, put, put, put an application forward. Well, certainly the code language that we have today doesn't recognize changes in technology, uh, building techniques and so forth that that allow for adequate mitigation and protection of folks. And, you know, the the, uh, the, the the bright line denial, so to speak, doesn't recognize the, the abilities that um, engineers and, and, uh, and contractors have uh, and, and the, the, the methodologies that are available to them, uh, you know, in today's world. So the, the, the blanket prohibition in the code certainly is is out of date. It hasn't been examined in years and years and years. Um, the question is really is how do you how do you provide in the next rewrite of the code or the code amendments uh, such as you're considering now the greatest degree of flexibility to require whatever uh, is appropriate in the site by site sort of uh, analysis. And uh, and back to uh, some of Jeff Woodruff's uh, comments. I think he commented on the fact that perhaps before we pass this, we really uh, look a little more closely in terms of what's, what some of the other communities have actually done and, uh, and copy the, the, the uh, you know, plagiarize the, uh, the good stuff and, uh, and make, and make ours as strong as we can. So I don't know whether we've done that, that work or not. I haven't. Okay. I, I've got one more question for, uh, it could be, 
for our staff or it could be for the applicant in Ian's house would it be considered in a low to moderate rockfall area in a high rockfall area or outside the rockfall area where the house is located using the standards of the proposed uh, amendment we have put that one to Glenn I'm not familiar with the property since this is just the code amendment, so, so Glenn could yeah Glenn do you, do you have you figured that out or someone on his team <laughs> Chris Wilber on Glenn's microphone again, and yes, we did an assessment of the property, and it would fall well within the low to moderate hazard. Um, and kind of back to the point that we've been discussing elsewhere, right now it is not adequately protected. People in the yard and in the house are not, in our opinion, adequately protected. Okay, thank you. Uh, Greg, you were putting your hand up. Yeah, thank you. This is a good conversation and, and, and more and more questions keep coming up. And, and one of them is, is just for, uh, I'd like our, uh, our staff to help us anticipate how any decisions we make today are going to affect um, applications going forward. I, you know, we live in the Rocky Mountains with a lot of steep slopes. I don't know what we have in terms of unbuilt inventory for lots out there that would probably have had prohibitive uh, rockfall conditions, but are we going to be uh, creating the possibility that the technological fix will allow a lot more in the way of applications to build in places that uh, we would have all thought in either impossible or crazy in the past? And and I don't know if that uh, should inform this conversation, but I'm concerned about um, maybe a lot more inventory coming online with with uh, the idea that they're going to they're going to be able to build someplace where maybe they shouldn't. So, with that in mind, uh, we need to understand much better, or at least I do, how we're how we're going to address that uh, going forward. And it's possible that this this amendment would would do that for us. But I want to make sure we have our eyes open and we can anticipate what the consequences will be. Okay, Patty you first. Can, if Suzanne wants to respond, oh, to, that. To, respond to that. Um just uh, quickly, Greg, just I mean, maybe to help you have some idea. I just tried to think through my head of, you know, applications I remember that dealt with rockfall. Um, Little Cloud is obviously everybody's big example. That goes back to the early nineties and it was under the pre nineteen ninety four code even. Um, but then I thought about the reader property on Shadow Mountain, which went through a takings <laughs> um, and which allowed then for development with mitigation. Um, there's a property east of Aspen across from North Star, a similar thing, went through a takings, um, was allowed structural yep. mitigation. Um, the conundrum site that Glenn mentioned, um, I'm sure I'm missing a few, but those were the three I came up with over the last however many years. We have done a few constrained site TDRs for um, rock fall up the crystal. Interestingly, there were three I found in the Crystal River Park subdivision that were all subdivided, you know, old pre-county pre subdivision review subdivisions um, at the base of those cliffs. Um, you know, in those cases, that was one hazard. They also had several other hazards that overlaid with those. So. Um, again, there's definitely rockfall hazard up the crystal. In that case, I think a lot of those scenarios would be existing lots with development looking to redevelop. Um, and then, right, we've seen a few in terms of new development, but I guess, Greg, I don't see there suddenly being an onslaught of applications that now that we've opened the doors, I think we're still saying, if you can avoid it, you need to avoid it and you have to show us that. Um, if it's a high hazard, we're still, you're still going to end up in a takings procedure to get to see if development's appropriate or not. But otherwise, some of these other ones that are low and moderate where you know, we can you know, accept that you know, th this is a hazard that it's okay to develop, it's appropriate, we can look at the mitigation as part of site plan review. I know I think one of the comments has been you know, this will be outside of scenic review, we won't look at it. Obviously, it, it is a scenic impact. We'll look at that. Um, you know, if, if this, the, the best solution is to allow mitigation, 
you know, we have to weigh out that with the, the scenic impacts, obviously. But, um, but anyway, I guess I just don't see it. I, I, I think it being a more reasoned approach to, to the hazard. Um, and I don't know that we'd see a difference in terms of how many applications we're getting as a result. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Suzanne. I think my question about uh, wanted to include, you know, what regarding scenic review, and I think Jeffrey mentioned that uh, scenic review would be uh, would be uh, negated, or or we couldn't we couldn't you know uh, impose a scenic review on on something like that. So that's that's one of my other questions. Thank you for at least bringing it up. Okay, we're going to do Patty, and then we'll go to Kelly. Yeah, there there are issues, um, and John Ely helped me out, but um, with takings and mitigation, and um, we did it with fire, with wildfire. We were seeing takings after takings, and so we built the wildfire issues right into the code. So people just had to do the wildfire mitigation. Saved everybody a lot of headache, a lot of time and energy. Maybe some of the planners weren't happy because they didn't get, get to go to the next step with their applicant. but. Um, I think the same thing here. I think we need to take into consideration, though, um, when we do rockfall mitigation, it needs to be protective of the neighboring properties, not just the property, because you don't want to disperse the rockfall into somebody else's yard. It literally gives them your problem. Um, and I think the scenic review is important. The maintenance, of course, is important down the line. But um, um, I, I would like to do, and I don't have it in front of me because I, 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 it's on my computer, but. I can't spread it out like I like to um, between we have this is there's two reads right correct between this and second reading to get more information to see how the language is recommended by the caucuses is incorporated into this code language um, I think there's a lot of important issues that were brought up that we need to take into consideration and um, and, and I think allowing people Greg there's probably property out there that haven't been developed yet but it doesn't mean they couldn't come in with today's code and then have to go through all the steps of takings and mitigation, et cetera, et cetera. This just puts some of the language into our code um, and gives people some clarity and some guidelines. Um, and, I, and I think John Ely's point about technology, you know, technology has been changing and how to mitigate avalanches, rock fall, debris flow, everything. So I think it's time that we looked at bringing some of these changes forward into the code language. And I, I think I've got a little more homework that I would like to do before, if it moves on first reading between now and second reading and asking for some more information and guidelines. Okay. Kelly, and then Art, I did see you had your hand raised. Um, Kelly, do you want to defer to Art to comment first and then get to your question or comment? No, I'll just jump in real quick because Patty and Greg have, have you know, begged a lot of what I've, I've been thinking. I'm glad this is a two read because I still need to like sort of think over this. You know, I'm a little hung up on the fact that it is a crappy lot, no longer a crappy lot because of technology improvements. Um, you know, so thank you for all the very thoughtful and detailed conversation and background and Suzanne filling in the picture a little bit on this. So, um, yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm still thinking all this over. Okay. Okay, Art? Yeah, and one, one maybe a last comment before my internet crashes again, um, <laughs> that is to leave you with the idea and the fact that if you adopt this revised code and allow mitigation in selected areas, you will be accomplishing one of the um, primary objectives that we all have, me, the planners, county, and that is we will be reducing the overall risk to people from rockfall. And I think that's something we really want to do. We all want to do that. And the modifications of the code would do that. George? So, uh, Steve, I'd like to make a motion to move this forward on first reading and have staff uh, give the staff some time to um, make sure that um, all the comments we receive from the caucuses, uh, Jeff's comments, looking at uh, some of these other uh, communities that have been presented, uh, make sure that we're getting the, uh, the, uh, the state of the art, uh, the best uh, policies possible uh, in terms of updating our code. 
I'm gonna second. Say, yeah, do we, is this, this is still a public hearing though, even though it's first read, right? Because No, listed. that's what I, I had that question. Oh, yeah, it's listed under public hearing. It says so land use public listed. hearing for today and at the second that's reading. Fine, I'm sure. So, um, and then I had one other thought a possible tweak to the to the ordinance that would be that an existing house would have a kind of a different standard perhaps than a brand new house on a brand undeveloped lot could potentially have different standard an existing house that's in a bad place we want them to be able to protect their property and if they want to redevelop the property rather than just prohibit them from doing that let them do the mitigation and uh, so that could be a different standard yeah, i believe if, if i have an existing house and i'm going to come in and redo it i go by the standard that exists i don't get a different standard if i have an existing house and i'm leaving it alone i don't have to do anything unless i want to and then i have mm -hmm. to follow the code is that so, right suzanne so yeah. that i mean that i'm just uh, tossing that out and if you, you could mull that over and then at the second reading respond to that and maybe we don't want to do that but i yeah. wanted to toss it out as an idea yeah I, I wouldn't support having a code different code i everybody follows the same code and if i want to come in and redevelop my existing house i have to follow the current code period right. yeah, i agree with that yeah, so I agree with that, but i thought john easily had it of course uh, he, earlier he, yeah, John, you had your hand up. Did you have another comment here? Hi, um, Steve, just in regards to the public hearing, um, given that this first reading is noted for a public hearing and given the dialogue and the potential changes, I would uh, recommend the board entertain the public hearing today, but then continue it uh, so the public hearing can continue to uh, the board gets closer to a finer, final final. Uh, uh, product uh, and to cut it off today okay okay so I at, at that I am going to open the public hearing if there's any members of the public who wish to comment on this today it is your first opportunity we will continue this public hearing to the second reading also so you could call in then so I see three well, there's another name on there uh, that I don't recognize. If anyone who is on the call wishes to make a comment or if anyone's wa watching and wishes to call in and make a comment on this, uh, you have that opportunity right now. Those of you already attendees on the this meeting could do push star nine on your phone to raise your hand. We have to have a date certain so i'm not seeing anyone raising your hand mm -hmm. keep in mind you can make comments when on whatever date we continue this to which is our discussion now suzanne <laughs> well um right now it's set for second reading on september 9th um so that's your next meeting um again if you if so then you would just if you approve on first reading and set for second on the ninth, then you can also continue the public hearing from today to the ninth. So is, uh, given the questions that have been asked, is September 9th too soon for staff to and come up with the answers that we've asked? I'm, I, I, you know, I, I guess, I, th I think it's just sort of touching base back with the information we, we have already. I'm not sure if you want me to review um, 15 different land use codes um, in other jurisdictions, then that's probably not reasonable for me to do um, by the 9th. Um, but I do feel, you know, that that, I mean, that's the work that the consultants have done in coming up with this. I can certainly circle back with Karen Berry um, mm -hmm. and discuss a little bit more with her um, if she has other thoughts about, you know, language we can improve. Um, again, I mean, that, that was kind of my thought um, on, on moving this forward. Okay, so September 9th is when it's scheduled for right now. 
I guess we, I mean, we could always, we could leave always it, continue again, leave it for the ninth. And then if for some reason we could continue it beyond that, if we had to certainly. Yep. Yeah. We could continue to September 23rd. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why you're smiling. Good idea, George. I'm right in there with yeah, you. Let's go for the 23rd. So, uh, make it a party. Glenn. It's not a friendly amendment. <laughs> Glenn Horn. Kelly has a friendly uh, amendment. Steve. <laughs> Get out of here, Glenn. I can't. We can't hear you hardly. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. How do how do how do we figure out how to mute Glenn? Glenn, we can't hear you. Yeah. We can't lip read either because you have your mask okay, on. Okay, go for it now. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, We've already researched these other jurisdictions and what we can do for you for the meeting on the 9th is write a short summary of how these other jurisdictions have approached the problem. And we also looked into what's going on in Boulder County. So we could put that together relatively easily because we've already done it. And uh, just put that in the memo to you uh, for the next meeting. Okay. Get, get it to Suzanne as soon as possible then so she can purview it preview or purview. thank you on behalf of Suzanne for that Glenn um, <laughs> of course what I'd love Suzanne to do is come up with an inventory of all the uh, I still think they're <laughs> gonna have all these stealthy cliff side properties coming out of the woodwork but that's my own paranoid fantasy so that means we'll that, continue till next year at this time <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would support that next year <laughs> so Kelly, did oh. Kelly, you suggested an oh. amendment. Is were you were you serious? No, no. I said that um, continuing to the twenty third is not a friendly amendment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Steve, Steve, we got a motion. We got a second. Public comment is done. Let's let's move on. Here. Public comment is continued until. Yeah, we're continuing the public comment. Nobody wanted to comment today, so That's I cool. will call the. Uh, Vote now. All in favor of continuing to September 9th? <laughs> Actually, Steve, it's I mean, a, not continuing, but this second, isn't continuing. Second reading on the 9th with continued public. We hearing. have to approve it for today, and then it's heard again for the second reading on on September 9th. Yes. Yes, I say aye. I'm calling All in question. favor, say aye. Yes, aye. 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 Suzanne, this is why okay, we don't nobody opposed. Okay, thank you. Um, Please, let's move to the next one. We got one more item. I'm going to let's do a five minute break right now because we still have a little bit of time. We're going to be on here. Thank you, Art and Thanks, Chris. Art. Ian, we didn't Chris talk Lynn. to Ian, but Ian was on there. And Suzanne. So, five minute break. 4.50, we'll take this up.
Okay, we're live. Okay. I said go. I wonder mm -hmm. what mic is that? Okay, we're back. This is uh, Board of County Commissioners' works uh, uh, regular meeting on August 26th. We're to the last <laughs> item on our agenda for land use public hearings. This is the Emma Fields LLC application and it was continued on July 22nd until today. So there are two parts to it, an ordinance uh, amending the, some titles of the land use code, specifically creating a definition for accessory agricultural use and listing ag accessory agricultural use as a special review use in the unclassified zone district and an amendment to the Pickens County zoning plan. The second part of it is a resolution granting special review approval to Emma Fields LLC for an accessory agricultural use. So, Leslie, we're going to hand it over to you for doing the, your part of the presentation. Okay, thank you. So, today, what um, I will review where we are today, which Steve, you did a pretty good summary about that. I'll introduce the applicant's proposed changes to the resolution and then turn the presentation over to the applicant's team. So um, this first slide up that I have is as a reminder, this is the property, oops, this, this is the property in question in the outline of red. It is zoned unclassified, the only property in Pickin County that is zoned unclassified and is roughly eight acres. Um, so Steve, as you mentioned, um, it's an ordinance for the land use code amendments and then a resolution for the special use review. Um, if the BOCC approves the ordinance today on first reading, staff recommends that the board continue the public hearing of the resolution for special review to consider the, the resolution concurrent with the second reading of the ordinance, which we have scheduled for September 23rd, <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> so in your packet, staff and the applicant responded to issues that the board raised at the July 22nd meeting. So the first issue uh, is water. The applicant provided a water supply and wastewater treatment report dated August 4th, 2020. And as I said in my memo, the county attorney's office found that the report does not confirm that there are water rights consistent with the proposed use. I know the applicant's attorney wants to address this issue with you as well as our attorney. Condition number five in the resolution requires that the applicant shall demonstrate that water rights have been obtained prior to the submittal of any permits. Uh, um, so this is uh, an existing conditions map of the property. And um, at one point in time, there were two access points to the property. So here's Highway 82. And there was a uh, driveway here into the property, and there was a driveway here into the property. And um, excuse me, Leslie. Leslie, can you just go full screen? Is there any way you can blow that up for us? How's that? That did it. Okay. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Greg. So. Um, as I said, here's Highway 82, and um, there are two driveways into the property. And the applicant is proposing to close this driveway, and the use of this driveway meets CDOT standards uh, for queuing and spacing off of the highway. So um, the definition of agricultural accessory agricultural use was questioned at our last meeting as to whether it was actually capturing the proposed use. Could it be used in other zone districts in the county? And did it really preserve agriculture in the county? 
I will let the applicant discuss their vision of the property and how they believe this works to preserve agriculture in the county. However, I do want to point out an amendment to this proposed definition, and that is in red on the screen. Um, I've added uh, the sentence, a minimum of 30% of the land area must be cultivated during the annual growing season. And the idea behind adding a minimum amount of land that is required to be cultivated is to ensure that an amount of agriculture will be preserved on the property, um, particularly this property and uh, future properties if other properties want to use this definition. And if this is proposed in um, other zone districts in the county, um, staff would recommend that it's proposed as a special review use in the zone district that's being proposed, and it might be appropriate for other properties. So for example, um, one of the intents, one intent of the AR10 zone district is to support small scale agricultural activities. This text amendment as proposed may be appropriate on a piece of property in the AR-10. However, one would have to pursue uh, a code change and a zoning change to make that this definition a special review use within that specific zone district. This is only being proposed for the unclassified zone district so at this time. Me, can I clarify that? So and this parcel is the only parcel in the unclassified zone district because there is no other unclassified zone district in the county. Yes. So this code amendment, this change here with the accessory ag will only affect this one property. Well, the definition is universal in our code, but this definition is only being located in the unclassified so zone anybody district. Anybody else who wants to use it would have time. to go through another process. It's not an automatic. It doesn't just overflow into the rest of the code. Yes. So right now what we're doing is specific to this one property. Yes, okay. yeah. as a special review. Right. Question from George. Well, just to follow up on Patty's, um, if we were to rezone this AR-10, um, which would be uh, uh, conforming, then, then the applicant would still have the ability to go through the, uh, a special review process. For this accessory ag use. If, if the property were, right. Re, right, so the property would have to go through a rezoning to AR-10. Uh, the entire yeah. AR-10 AR zone district would be analyzed, and every property owner in AR-10 would be notified that the, a zone change is, uh, a change to the AR-10 uses are proposed, and then they would go through, um, if, if it was proposed, special review. Then, so you're doing a zone change to the property and you're changing the zone district language in the code to create ac accessory agriculture use as a special review. All right. So zoning and why is the property not being rezoned? Um, as I said earlier, this property is the only property in Picking County zone unclassified. The property surrounding the prop this property, all the land surrounding it, is zoned AR-10. The Down Valley Comprehensive Plan did contemplate a rezoning in 1987. However, that did not occur, and since then, a variety of small businesses have occupied this corridor from Basalt to the Snowmass Conoco. And staff has anticipated a new master plan process to better inform what a rezoning on this property would look like, as well as in the, you know, taking into account the entire corridor in that master plan process. Uh, that master plan process was jump started. Individual property owners were uh, interviewed. Staff did some community meetings, and then. Um, with other priorities um, in the Community Development Department, Long Range, as well as with COVID, that master plan effort has been set aside for now. Um, it's been staff's opinion that until the master plan process for this highway air corridor uh, is completed, we are reluctant to recommend rezoning the property. Staff supported this application initially because of the historic uses on the site. 
most recently the Four Seasons Landscape Yard and Business. Staff believe that through the special review process that the constraints placed on the Four Seasons could be applied to a similar application. Um, another critique from July 22nd is the plan that's being put before you is, is too nebulous. And as um, we explained, the applicant has this property under contract and in, in, unless the applicant knows that the county is comfortable with his proposed use, they did not want to invest a lot of money in a real specific site plan for site plan review. The applicant did provide the board a memo outlining their vision of the property and how they came to this definition. Um, and staff's recommendation does include a requirement to submit a site plan for review uh, before any removal and redevelopment of the buildings can occur. This site plan that I have up on the screen for you is um, uh, was um, provided in that memo that the applicant um, uh, sent to the board. This is just, again, a very high level conceptual um, uh, plan that they've put together. A general site plan, like I said, is this one is provided, but we have not, staff has not verified the existing square footage on the site and whether all that square footage is permitted. Um, and any kind of verification of square footage and what can be replaced on site would be part of that site plan review process that we would do based upon a proposal from the applicant. And finally, um, after the previous meeting, the applicant continued to refine their proposal and work with adjacent neighbors on the project. An agreement was reached and that agreement was sent to the BOCC Monday morning. I sent that to you via Charlotte. Um, this agreement is an agreement between some neighbors. Um, and um, based upon that agreement, the applicant's attorney has redlined the resolution that reflects uh, the, the, the resolution is very specific to the special review. Uh, the applicant's attorney has redlined the resolution. Um, and I provided that redlined resolution to you all first thing this morning. It didn't come redlined. Is this it? It didn't come redlined. Oh, the, 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 no. it did, the blue line didn't show up? No, there's no line. It's black and white. Okay. Um, so in review of the red lines that were provided mm -hmm. to, to me, um, the red lines are very similar to our conditions of approval that we had in the ordinance. It's more of a, a, a tightening down of the conditions that we had as part of their negotiations with their neighbors. Uh, we would add one condition of approval related to special events. And I'm happy to go over those changes with the board now. However, the res we're again recommending that the resolution, it would be um, considered and adopted at second reading of the ordinance. And so that would give us time to do a do a red line copy that you can read when we send it to you. <laughs> I, try. Um, I also want to say that uh, midday today, we got a, an email from a neighbor, and I believe the BOCC was copied on that, was an email from a David Lumpkins. Um, I have that, I'll make sure Jeanette has that for the file. Um, and uh, any questions from the board or turn it over to the applicant. Greg. Uh, lastly, I just want to say I, I can receive the red the red line on mine. Um, so maybe there's a setting on Patty's that no, will allow her to see it. Or uh, you've got a printed. Oh, she's she's still using the old analog legacy style of information. That's why I'm so far ahead of you. Oh. All the time. <laughs> my okay. my copy was not redlined either. The one that I saw. Okay. Uh, other is, questions just for... Just to interject on that issue, Leslie, um, and commissioners, Who is if it? you Wait, have... Who's speaking here? 
It's Mary Geiger. This the is Mary attorney. Elizabeth Geiger. I was just going to say how if you can't see it, if if you do have it in Microsoft Word, you do need to click on the lines in the left margin to expand to open the red line. <laughs> So no, I have it, it right here in front of me as printed out because I have my packet right here in front of me. So I will figure it out if I need to. Okay. Thanks okay. for your help. Because that, that, it is hidden at first, so I apologize for that. Okay. Um, other commissioner questions for Leslie? Okay, not seeing any Leslie at this time, so... Uh, take it to the applicant and Luke are you going to be presenting yes I will um, uh, actually this is one, I'll, I'll go first um, okay. Matt let me um, once uh, once Leslie's done sharing the screen I'll bring up our presentation and then I'll let you kick it off okay one second and uh, yeah thanks thanks everyone for uh, allowing this, this opportunity. Uh, let me get my PDF up here. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can, Luke. Excellent. Let me uh, get it in presentation mode and let Matt take it away. Great. Thank you, Luke. Thank you for your time uh, to let me introduce in greater detail this land use application. Um, as you're aware, I'm, I'm Matthew Patel and I'm a practicing emergency physician and also a mechanical engineer. Uh, I've been able to juxtapose both those careers because my father operated his own engineering construction firm since the 1970s. In fact, it was my father who first exposed me to Colorado when I accompanied him uh, on a project he had with Adolph Coors in the late 70s. This led to multiple trips over the years for recreation uh, to Colorado and ultimately led me to purchase a property um, in Old Snowmass in 2015 where I intend to become a, a permanent resident soon. Um, since 2015, I've made many new friends in the Valley and appreciated uh, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of the residents uh, you know, that I met. Um, I found that uh, these residents work hard, but they uh, um, play hard as well, and, and they soon inspired me to utilize my experience and those around me to create uh, the business enterprise that we uh, have presented in this land use application. Um, it was done with very careful thought and uh, with a very specific eye on, on this parcel of land. Uh, when I first um, came up with the idea of this, this uh, project, uh, I was working with uh, the county on another land use application and, and we kind of theorized where something like, like this could go um, because my vision um, for this kind of project um, is something similar you would see um, you know, in upstate New York or if you're driving in the Silverado Trail in, in California where you see these um, great agrarian properties that, that also um, have some, some processing. Um, so, so my vision um, for this is, is to really create a, a showcase um, for the initiatives of the Valley, um, you know, when it comes to sustainability, uh, to environmental stewardship, um, everything that we do, um, you know, is going to be focused on, on those tenants. Um, one of the things uh, in the presentation that, that Luke and Dave will speak to is, is the concept of, of LEED certification. But I wanted to clarify that, you know, when we talk about LEED, it isn't just in, in our building materials, um, solar orientation, um, you know, uh, use of, of efficient uh, lights and water fixtures. But, but it, it's more than that. It, it's actually uh, deeper into our process. Um, you know, our companies developed a more efficient uh, distillation technology where we use less water. Um, you know, we don't consume water um, for cooling. Um, our process uses all closed fermenters with CO2 capture. Um, our waste spillage is, is taken to uh, proprietary uh, reactors uh, to generate electricity for the project and, and then clean water at the point of discharge. Um, and also importantly is, is the environmental stewardship of the land. Um, you know, we're, we're well aware that um, an eight acre parcel can't sustain, um, you know, an operation like we propose, but uh, 
you know, one, one of my early friendships, you know, uh, um, was with the local grower, and, and I watched, uh, um, you know, what they were able to do in the valley by, by uh, taking initiatives the county developed with open space, um, you know, creating, um, you know, a great sustainable regenerative farming enterprise there. Um, and, and they're just right down the, uh, the street, and that's what kind of gave me inspiration in, in, in naming this project here in the field is, is to tie into this area. So, you know, the goal of this project is, is to uh, showcase, you know, those technologies, you know, in this high profile location along 82, um, but also collaborate fully with, with the local growers to um, increase their sustainability by, by giving them a, a source uh, um, for us to. Uh, to use that uh, product in later processes. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, um, because of the COVID-19, we were somewhat restricted in, in the outreach we wanted to do, um, you know, with the neighbors. So I, I think that, you know, the lack of information, um, you know, with, with the neighbors kind of created a lot of angst and concern of what would the impact, you know, be to them. Um, you know, one thing, um, you know, that's very important for us is that we're thoughtful neighbors um, you know, but, but, but two, we want to try to improve, you know, the conditions, you know, there. So, you know, we hear the concerns of, of, of the impact of traffic. We feel we're going to fall uh, well underneath the, the historical um, operating parameters for that parcel, but we're also proposing to improve uh, the paving at the intersection of Highway 82 and Hoagland Ranch Road, improve the lighting for safety, and then also participate and work with CDOT to establish an acceleration lane to improve safety along that corridor. Um, you know, we, we also uh, have been well aware of, of uh, concerns over odor, uh, noise, pollution, and, you know, we have done our best to, to explain in detail um, to the members, you know, that, that will listen to our project in detail to, um, you know, uh, allay their concerns there. Uh, we were fortunate that, that some of the uh, um, community leaders in that area have spent some more detailed time with us and, and we we're able to turn, um, you know, those uh, vocal objections into now hopefully vocal supporters to continue that uh, program of community outreach. Um, I've read each and every one of the letters, um, you know, that, that um, have voiced concern over the project. Um, and, and I'm happy to meet with, with uh, any of them personally to kind of uh, discuss, you know, their concerns and, and how the impact of the project, uh, um, you know, uh, will fall well under, you know, the thresholds that, that they're concerned about. Um, I appreciate um, the due diligence that Leslie's put forward in this project. This has been a very, you know, lengthy project and, and um, you know, has it, spent uh, considerable time with us working through, uh, you know, introducing us to the town of Basalt to uh, work with this project while they were going through their Down Valley plan and then continuing to work uh, with us to, to try to make sure that this this particular project was well suited for this parcel. And I, I think that it, it, it was well thought out. Um, when we went through P and Z, um, you, know, uh, you know, they gave uh, Leslie uh, accolades for coming up with a great uh, fit for this, this particular parcel. Um, along 82 that's high, highly visible that could be a great ambassador for you know the initiatives for the county and what we're trying to do here and especially with the um, collaborations we want with the local farmers to try to support um, you know those initiatives of the county as well and, and we were happy to receive that unanimous uh, seven you know zero vote so um, you know we would like to participate um, you know on any basis to share as much information in, in detail about any of our process um, you know, we've been doing that with the county all along, and, and you know, I'm going to turn this over to uh, you know our team to answer some specific questions, uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm available to circle back and answer any specific questions about you know the process and, and the distillery and you know what our vision is. But you know, truly, it's a, it's a farm to bottle operation that, that is going to try to represent the uh, uh, goals and, and the initiatives of the valley, you know, in the highest manner. Luke and Dave, I'll turn it over to you to kind of walk through the uh, improvements in the site plan. Sure. Thank you, Matt. Um, on the updates that you see on the screen to the conceptual site plan since uh, since the last meeting, 
um, as a direct response to the neighbor's concerns about various activities on the site. The design team uh, has revisited this plan and uh, reorganized how the buildings are laid out on the site. We have the same basic um, layout sort of west to east in terms of agricultural zones on the western half and more developed zones on the eastern half. But what we really looked at is, you know, what is the character of the neighborhood to the north of us? Uh, you know, obviously we have the highway um, to the top. Um, so as a response, um, we pushed the uh, less intensive uses uh, up to the northern part of the site, up here. So uh, the caretakers unit has, has pushed up to the neighborhood side. So it's, it's kind of a buffer and uh, kind of the start of this gradient from less to more intense uses. The distillery itself, as well as the warehouse building, has been pushed as far as we can uh, towards Highway 82. So more intensive use, uh, you know, down towards uh, the highway where there's more noise. And then we have the administration building, which serves as, as kind of this intermediary use between the residential portion up here and the distillery portion up here. Um, just to go through this real quick, um, obviously we, we, we have real strong goals to restore and revitalize this site with, with ecological sensitivity um, enhance the rural character of this stretch of Highway 82. Um, I'll speak a little bit more to, to the, uh, the form of the buildings, and they're kind of agrarian style here shortly. We have some perspective views that will uh, speak to that uh, more visually. Uh, one thing we, we thought would be nice is to, to possibly give back part of this site to the neighborhood and down on this uh, southern part of the site here at the corner, across from the Rio Grande Trail. We thought it might be nice to have a pocket park. Um, it could be enjoyed by, by folks coming up and down the trail or for neighbors. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we have the, the gradient of kind of intensities of uses across the site. Uh, these are a couple of views to show you uh, how the massing of these buildings is broken down and matches scale of buildings nearby, um, scale of our agricultural buildings in the valley. Uh, we don't want one big building. We want a series of smaller buildings so that the scale is, is nice and fits in with uh, the existing context. This is the distillery building. Uh, we have a warehouse building here. This is the uh, administration building and then the caretakers unit over here. From the uh, highway and bridge side, you can see uh, how the site is organized. One one thing we really in, in particular paid attention to is the orientation of these buildings. So they are oriented on the true east-west axis to really uh, provide a lot of solar access to the buildings to take advantage of uh, solar on the roof and daylighting uh, throughout the buildings, as well as providing some really nice uh, internal corridor spaces. Um, all, all of this design philosophy is really, you know, centered around the fact that, you know, the buildings are almost secondary to these outdoor spaces that we're creating, these courtyards, the farm itself, uh, and the pathways through connecting these buildings. Uh, coming up, uh, from basalt towards Aspen, this is just a uh, kind of a conceptual massing to show you uh, what you would see from the highway. The open gabled end of the distillery building, we imagine this could be glass and you could see some of the activity going on there. At night, maybe there's a little bit of light spilling out that, that shows you that something interesting is going on. Uh, the other buildings, the courtyard space, um, the silo here, Kind of as a marker, but but perhaps to store our room once we uh, get it delivered, and then that pocket park. The view then from the other way, uh, you can see under the bridge, the distillery building uh, comes into view, 
And then as you go up on the Hoagland Ranch Road, uh, in from the Rio Grande Trail, uh, nice views of the, the, the sides, the main face of these buildings. And this is the entry into the property where you get nice views through the center courtyard here, down valley to the mountains beyond. And also uh, at the end of the distillery building and the admin building, some, some views into the building to kind of give people a sense of what's going on inside. Um, we thought it was important also to, to speak to the materials that we'll be using, uh, that we're proposing to use on the buildings. Uh, this is obviously just kind of a first pass at what we're thinking, but um, we've, we've told the neighbors that we don't want any pre-manufactured buildings. We don't want any uh, you know, steel buildings that are unsightly. Uh, we really want to use sort of these natural materials that are uh, you know, present in agricultural buildings, um, agrarian buildings, some of the uh, older buildings around the valley, but interpreted in, in a contemporary manner. So, um, you know, those previous images I showed, those are really just conceptual images. We aren't proposing red buildings, blue buildings, anything like that. We want uh, buildings that, you know, perhaps it's uh, wood siding, so kind of a range of, you know, blacks to grays, uh, it's a nice, more natural kind of red, cedar, uh, reclaimed wood is something we've been thinking about. And then in a limited fashion, obviously, uh, we'll need some structural elements, so perhaps some poured in place concrete foundations, uh, black and steel elements, uh, some, some, some patinaed uh, uh, cork and steel, and in a limited capacity, mostly for roofs, probably like a standing seat metal. Nothing will be shiny, galvanized. If, if we do use metal in these applications, it will be uh, painted metal, like this, this black or dark wood. Obviously, we need to uh, be considerate of all building codes and uh, you know, keep in mind fire-resistant materials and everything we do. So uh, that will be a strong driver for, for all of these decisions we're going to make when we jump into the site planning process. Um, as David, or sorry, as Matt mentioned, and uh, David and I have been working through, um, sustainability is, is critical to this project. Net zero is, uh, is, is great, and we're hoping that we can get there uh, with the display. But net zero really focuses on the energy use of a building. Um, LEED is a little more comprehensive in, in terms of uh, looking at the context of the site, uh, looking at reusing um, site amenities, healing the site, uh, protecting and restoring habitat, perhaps. Um, it also looks at water efficiency, both in the site and in the buildings, as well as energy uh, materials, recycled materials. Also, sustainability could be approached in an educational way. So perhaps there is an opportunity at the pocket park to have some educational elements for the community about water use, uh, what it means to you know, live in the, in the West where water is such a scarce and, and essential resource. Um, as, as Matt mentioned, uh, it's not just about building uh, sustainable, sustainably, but it's also about operating sustainably. Um, you know, it's the whole lifespan of the distillery and how it operates from day to day and what it can do to um, protect resources, water, energy. Okay. Um, and just to finish up um, phasing, we've gone over this before, but first step will be to, once we get approvals, once we get um, a demolition permit in hand, uh, we would propose to demolish the existing buildings on the site, recycling what what we can, if there's anything that we can recycle. And then very quickly, we will jump into the site planning and schematic design phase in anticipation of a uh, site plan and uh, scenic view protection review with the county. Um, there are some interim 
steps that we can take, uh, including uh, some grading and cleanup of the site once the buildings have been demolished, repairing um, uh, the irrigation system on the site and planting some cover crops to get the, the, the ground uh, sort of healed up. And we'll be working towards first phase would be this distillery building. So with that, um, I'd like to hand it over to Alan Kalik, who is our uh, water engineer. And he can go over uh, the water, the well, and the wastewater. Sorry. <clears throat> Thanks, Luke. Again, my name's Alan Leak with Respec. I'm a professional water engineer. I've uh, been in this business for over 35 years. Uh, what we want to really make sure is that this project not only is sustainable for the development, but also sustainable within the community itself. You know, this map that was included in my report shows the adjacent wells in the area uh, that are the, the wells that the neighbors have had concerns about and are the wells that I evaluated when looking at the uh, aquifer properties and water supply conditions for this site itself. So when I actually looked at these wells, uh, kind of some interesting facts came out from that investigation. Uh, we have several wells and Matt, I'll go ahead, or Luke, have you uh, go to the next slide. So this is a listing of those wells that you saw on that slide. Uh, giving the owner's information, the distance from the Four Seasons well, which is the existing well on site, giving some information about when they were permitted, when they were constructed, some information about their construction and any kind of pump testing or static level, uh, water level information. And, and what you'll find when we get to the next slide that I want to point out is there are kind of two different uh, uh, I'm going to call them aquifer conditions. You've got the alluvial aquifer right around the Roaring Fork River, uh, which is where the existing well is. And the wells in those areas are typically 80, 90 foot deep. Uh, they have very good yields. Uh, and the materials in the well logs are consistent with uh, alluvial aquifers, gravels, boulders, uh, materials that are very conductive to uh, being able to hold and pass water through the groundwater table itself. Uh, and then you've got the wells further up uh, to the northeast uh, that are in a little different area. And, and this is actually represented well uh, by the study that was done for Pitkin County to define water sustainability within the Pitkin County area. And really what you see, the difference here is where the existing well is, is in an area that was labeled in that Pitkin County Groundwater Resource Study as generally good local phreatic aquifer. Uh, there's limited variations in groundwater levels, and it has a high permeability, high storability type of aquifer conditions, which is a little bit different than, than the ones to the northeast, which are primarily drilled uh, a lot deeper, around 160, 180 foot deep, even 200 foot deep, uh, have water levels that are actually lower than the water levels in the alluvial aquifer and are drilled mainly into the maroon formation. So it's a different type of formation uh, that those wells are in, which then has some separation between the water ability for water to move between those two formations itself. So I thought that this slide was, was, was particularly informative about the alluvial aquifer versus the other well locations. And, and what's really important about this is, again, trying to understand what the conditions are of the aquifer and the potential impact to the adjacent wells themselves. And so one of the things that was important was to go ahead and do a, a well test uh, on the existing well. And this is a report from the uh, uh, well tester that was done back in June. And the real key items out of here is that this test was run at 20, a little over 20 gallons per minute uh, for 12 hours. And during that time period, the water level in the aquifer dropped less than 15 feet. But what was more important is that when they turned the pumps off, as you can see down under recovery, is the water level recovered 
to 90% of the level it was when it started within 10 minutes. So in other words, after 10 minutes of non-pumping, that aquifer level was two feet below where it was when it started pumping. Uh, this type of aquifer test is highly representative of a very good alluvial aquifer that has a substantial amount of water, both for production and for long-term uh, volumetric uh, use. The other key thing out of this is we'll get to what uh, Emma Fields has agreed is that this was at 20 gallons per minute uh, and running for 12 hours. So when we get to the terms and conditions that we've agreed to, uh, the plan is that we're only going to use the one well. Uh, we're not going to pump it more than 15 gallons per minute. So that's you know 25 percent less than that well test was and no more than 187,000 gallons per month, which if you divide that out into a, a daily use, it basically says that we wouldn't pump that well at 15 gallons per minute more than about seven hours in any given day. So from that standpoint, the well test that was done was done 25% higher than the rate and was done at a, a volume that was almost 50% higher than what we were proposing. So based on that information, you know, it's really important that this well is not going to impact the neighbor's wells itself. Uh, what we propose to, to meet these terms is that we'll provide the neighbor parties copies of the pumping log records so they can track along and see that Emma Fields is meeting this, this requirement. Uh, we do know that wells don't last forever, and if we ever have to replace it, uh, we're going to consult with the well driller to relocate it so it's as far away from the neighbor's wells as possible. If we can get it more than 600 feet, that would be great. Uh, 600 feet is only a magical number in that the state engineer uses that as, as a presumption of non-impacts uh, to adjacent wells when they permit new exempt wells. And then also to make sure that we don't go any deeper than what's necessary to achieve that yield itself. So these are conditions that uh, the applicant has agreed to in this proposal. Go ahead. Uh, we have a question from Kelly. Kelly, go ahead. Thank you, Steve. Um, thanks, Alan. I appreciate the additional information. Do you know, I have two questions. Do you know um, what was the time period before the well reached 100% after the pumping stopped? And then my second question is, um, with regards to this formation that this well is located in, is, is 600 feet um, useful? Is that the best, you know, it's, it's a generic standard applied. So is this, is this standard being applied in a more or less conservative way based on this formation that the well is drilled into? Thank you for your questions, Commissioner Curry. So I will answer both of those. Uh, the information I have from the well test is exactly what's reported on there. So based on that information, what I anticipated is that when they first started pumping it, there was this, uh, an initial drawdown as a typical alluvial aquifer. So maybe after a half an hour, it had drawn down uh, maybe 10, 12 feet, and then it stabilized out uh, over the next, uh, I would guess, 11 hours. Uh, to the point where they were almost at just a, a, a stable aquifer condition that they could continue to pump at 20 gallons per minute is, is what I get out of this information, especially when looking back at the recovery level. And this information is useful that in this type of luchio aquifer, the area of influence or the area of impact ends up being smaller than what it would be in a tighter aquifer which has a, a larger cone of depression. So if you can think that you stuck a straw down, starts uh, sucking water out of this, uh, the water levels adjacent to this wells would start to decrease in almost like a funnel type of configuration. Uh, the, the looser formation, the very good production, that funnel is very tight and narrow. In a formation that has a lot of clays, a lot of tight sand, sandstone, that cone of depression, that cone is a lot broader and thus would have the potential to impact a larger area. So that's why I feel very comfortable 
was saying that even the 600 foot limit is probably too big for this one. Uh, it wouldn't be too big for a, uh, an aquifer that's maybe in a sandstone or, or, or a very much tighter formation. Uh, Patty has yeah, a question. Just, just real quick. So this well test was done in June when we have relatively high water, we have water in our river. Is that correct? It was done in June? That is correct. So it wasn't, done, it wasn't done recently when we have drought issues and low water and are really concerned about the level of water in the Roaring Fork River in that stretch. Just, just to make that point clear, because that's of concern sure. to me. Thank you. understand. Yes. So again, you know, these are the limitations that the applicant has agreed upon uh, as moving forward with this project. One of the other questions was, is water really available from Kester Ditch for this project? Uh, this is a copy of the share certificate that's owned by Four Seasons Yards would be transferred to Emmett Fields uh, uh, upon closing. Uh, that does provide them, you know, 25 shares out of the Kester Ditch Company. Uh, I understand that that represents about a quarter of a CFS of, of flow uh, out of the total amount of water available uh, to the ditch and maximum. Uh, and certainly the amount of water use on this property is substantially less uh, than what could be supplied by the shares owned by uh, Four Seasons and ultimately Emma Fields. Uh, so I believe very comfortably that, you know, the ditch company will allocate this water according to their share requirements uh, equally to the shareholders. I also understand that uh, historically a while ago that there's about five acres of land that was being irrigated by these shares on this property. Uh, and we're only proposing in this case to irrigate about three acres of land. So it would be a reduction from uh, past irrigation uses. Kelly? Thank you. Um, this question is probably for Leslie, but <clears throat> um, I, didn't, I didn't see anywhere any confirmation that the Four Seasons is transferring these. So I guess we take that on face value, but I want to understand, was there a condition that limits um, the use of the well to certain uses and the use of the Kester ditch water to the agricultural uses? So that in that ditch runs dry, the well is not being used to irrigate? So if I could answer part of that is the limitations that we have on the well would make it very difficult to irrigate more than what's being proposed to be irrigated from the well, which would be the, uh, which is actually very little, if anything, it's mainly for the uh, in-house use of the caretaker's residence and for the distillery itself. So if the applicant wanted to use that well to do outside irrigation, it would severely limit their ability to produce their product. Okay, let's move on. I just want to, this is Mary Elizabeth Geiger, and just uh, Commissioner Curry, just to add to that, uh, your question about whether the uh, shares are being transferred. Uh, they are per the contract, and if the commissioners need to see, you know, you know, some other evidence to reflect that, then we can provide that between the second reading if uh, you guys want to see it. George? Yeah, just to, I don't know if uh, we got a, a, a complete answer to Kelly's question. So the well permit, uh, do we have in, in the language that the well permit is not uh, – allowable use for irrigation uh, fields uh, we clarify that i mean typically uh, if it's a domestic well it can't be used for irrigation ag irrigation purposes so um, I, i'd like to have that clarified from kelly's question sure uh, i think i think i can maybe speak to to that this is a really old uh, the well permit that's currently in place is quite old 
And so as you may be aware, the older well permits, if they were permitted for domestic use, uh, the state's usually taken the position if that included irrigation at the time, then it could be permitted, you know, the irrigation can continue. However, uh, for this particular well, and John Ely and I have had some conversations back and forth about this when he was asking about the, whether the legal water supply was sufficient for this proposal, um, the well will be re-permitted, if you recall, with the basalt contract to allow for this distillery use. And so in that, I mean, there's no intention uh, to be using this for any outside irrigation, um, though for maybe minimal landscaping. But as Alan pointed out, we've agreed to limit the usage on a monthly basis to the point that it would really pretty much prohibit distillery operations if there were any outside use. So if the commissioners are inclined to want to add an additional condition um, regarding the use of the well, I think that's something that the applicant can certainly um, consider and would probably be amenable to uh, because the whole point of having that ditch water is to be able to use it for the agricultural um, part of the project. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would suggest that we, uh, we uh, do not allow the well to be utilized for any crop um, crop or irrigation uh, for those three acres. Can, can I cl clarify something? George, can Howdy. I can I clarify that too? Um, but I'm looking for the wastewater issue. Are they going to repurpose wastewater from the distilling process into use um, for irrigation? So is that kind of a second-hand use of the water for irrigation? That I'll is, let Alan speak to that. Yeah, I think but, but, but that is uh, correct. Um, so so um, the waste spillage will, will go to a, uh, a a system of, of bioreactors, and at the end of that, uh, the uh, the end product is water that that can be suitable for irrigation. Um, you, you could actually take that and, and take it to the RO system, but that would use energy and actually get water that you could use again for the distillery. Okay. But the intent is that um, that would be used for um, irrigation of, of landscaping or, or crops. But uh, um, it, it has a, a use that, that uh, you know is not a contaminant. Right. So, so technically, the water that we just said should not be used for irrigation will be used for irrigation because it'll be treated wastewater. Well, but it's not coming. Um, it's not the first use. Right, right. Yeah, well. I just wanted that, to clarify that. Yeah, I so appreciate that, 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 that clarification. Be. Yeah, and you certainly could put in there that, uh, you know, it would be restricted to subsequent use and not the initial use of the, of the water itself. So a couple of the other Concerns and issues that come up was concerns with odor about the wastewater treatment facility. Uh, the applicants proposing to use a closed system and here to the CDPHE air water air quality water air quality commissions regulation two, which regulates odors and emissions. Uh, this is the specific language out of regulation number two. And what's really important is that the applicant has to demonstrate to the air quality commission that it will use the best practical control method. And that <coughs> requires us to document and show the applicable odor control options are available, uh, the basis for selection of those, and utilizing the options that's the best practical treatment, maintenance, and control currently available uh, for that facility itself. So it forces us to prove to the commission that we're going to be able to adhere to regulation number two, odor emissions. And that's really important for the applicant and for the neighbors uh, to make sure that this facility does not create objectable odors. And it, it is the whole intent of that regulation to make sure that that cannot occur. Patty? Yeah, I, I need to comment on that too. Apologize for commenting on everything. But, you know, we had an issue right across the street with odor. And the, the, the terms of the condition of approval were that were no odor. There will be no odor. And so um, that's what they had to comply to. So I think that that's what we need to comply to. There will be no odor. 
um, that because it'll go across the highway, it'll go to the next door, all the way around. Um, and I don't want to be part of that process again like we were with the marijuana grow site. Um, it was very difficult, very time consuming. The other part of that too was there was a complaint system that wasn't on an annual basis. There was a complaint system at the time. I don't think the neighbors should have to wait for a year to complain about smells that are coming from this operation. There needs to be a process that's set up much like the one across the street where we had a system of registering your complaints um, at the time so they could be investigated. So again, you know, the applicant's going to have to comply with all local county CDPA rules and regs regarding the waste processing and odor control. Uh, we're not going to use evaporative ponds for the waste. Uh, we're going to commit to using the best practices in waste processing. Uh, any outdoor waste storage will be within an enclosed system and hidden from view uh, with your privacy fences or architectural features. And we said that, uh, you know, at annual review, neighbor parties may raise the issue and may ask for a special use permit to be withdrawn or condition approval amended if a violation has occurred. Right. We, we feel it's very important that we meet uh, the odor requirements that, that we're planning to meet. And, and I appreciate that. I'm just saying from the experience we learned across the street, I would like to stipulate in here, there will be no odor and it won't, won't be part, it can be part of the annual review, but we need to have a, at the time of the complaint, a way for the neighbors to register that complaint um, as we did across the street. I mean, we're in the same neighborhood with the same neighbors and um, we have a situation of concern about odors emanating from this new operation. So, but if the applicant is comfortable with this, I'm just letting the applicant know I am not at this time comfortable with this. Uh, next. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the use of reclaimed water and biosolids for the agriculture use. As you're probably well aware, they are both regulated and required compliance. Uh, regulation, reclaimed water use is regulated under Regulation 84, and it has strict water quality and application requirements required permitting uh, by CDPHE. It requires the use of agronomical application rates to prevent surface runoff and subsurface infiltration. And those regulations, uh, I know personally, are very strict from one of my uh, water and sanitation district clients who use reclaimed water on golf courses and commercial buildings that they're very strict on exactly how that is done. Similarly, the, the biosolids are regulated under Regulation 64. Uh, it has strict quality and application requirements and again requires permitting from CDPHE, uh, requires use at agronomic, agronomical application rates uh, in order to protect public health and prevent discharge of pollutants into surface and groundwater. And the use of biosolids for agricultural use on this property will comply with the Class A biosolids requirements, which is the most strict requirements for use of biosolids. Uh, we feel very comfortable that this project can meet these requirements. I think, as I mentioned uh, in the previous meeting, uh, my engineer on this uh, used to be the director of biosolids for Metro Wastewater in Denver uh, and was responsible for complying with this regulation both for the production and odor control of biosolids and the application of Metro Wastewater's biosolids over thousands of acres uh, near Byers, Colorado. So I feel very comfortable that we will be able to meet these requirements very easily. And I believe that everything that I have to uh, talk about, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, on these topics before we move on. I, I do have a question about the use of biosolids. Um, this is the first I've heard about this being used on this land. You're using Kester ditch water, you're using well water for, um, you know, the distil distillation process. Bringing in biosolids, which is basically what they used to do for the Aspen Sanitation, Sanitation District land up on McLean Flats is uh, a whole new 
uh, proposal to, to me, unless I missed something in the earlier application. Commissioner Cha, I think I can address that, is that the biosolids that they will use are only the biosolids produced on site. They will not be hauling in biosolids for this project itself. So again, it's a sustainable use that allows the biosolids to be used in an agronomical, economical, and efficient way. It minimizes the haul off of waste and the traffic generated from that. And, and it would meet the biosolids regulations for the beneficial use of those. Right. And one thing to add is that uh, any sort of domestic sanitary sewer uh, for the caretaker's unit, for the admin building, any toilets, things like that will be going into a separate, separate system. So this is a byproduct, a byproduct of this distillation process is what you're trimming your biosolids. Like for example, a potato mash if you're making vodka. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So and there'll be no odor from that, right? <laughs> so you're not talking about human biosolids. No, they're talking about no. biosolids generated from the distillation okay. process itself. Okay. Um, that's correct, and the applicant would stipulate to that. Leslie? So um, Cindy Hubin asked me to ask a question of Alan Leak. Um, do the surrounding agricultural uses in the property surrounding this property, do they contribute to the well recharge? And is this well seen to be sustainable without those operations in place? Uh, Commissioner Curry? So most of the water is likely not all of the water that would be used from the applicant's well likely comes mainly from the Roaring Fork River as, as the alluvium and flow is flowing down. Uh, there may be some recharge that occurs from use uphill, you know, use from Kester Ditch and use of water on the Kester Ditch. Uh, but I don't believe it is a significant source of water given the location of this well in relationship to the Roaring Fork River. Does that answer her question? Yeah, I think so. Okay, answer. thank you, Alan. You're welcome. Thank you for the time. Uh, real quick, I know it, this is this is going along. Um, also included in the um, revised resolution in our uh, agreement with the neighbors. Um, we touched on truck traffic, which I know is a big concern. And uh, one of the stipulations is that um, until there is a westbound acceleration lane on Highway 82, uh, we would just use straight trucks, no um, uh, you know, trucks like with trailers or anything like that. Um, one thing I didn't mention in terms of phasing that we here is this is a, a very um, long process. This is a step in a long process and as Matt mentioned uh, he's starting to work with the other neighbors um, and CDOT to get this acceleration lane in and chances are very likely that the acceleration lane could be in place prior to this distiller even being up and running. But, but can um, I, uh, Luke, George has a question. Yeah. George? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll make a comment. Having spent 11 years on the Intermountain uh, Transportation Planning Region, um, knowing that there are projects throughout the region taller than me, this has never even come up as, as an idea. And so to think that CDOT's going to come up with some funding for this when there's a list as tall as me from that has actually been prioritized, I think is a pipe dream. Uh, if I could interject, um, actually, oh, and, uh, the yeah. genesis for, for the acceleration lane is, has been something that the Roaring Fork Meadows was, was working on that predated us. So um, what it doesn't include is, is um, you know, additional paving along 82, but apparently there there is uh, area that, that's already paved along 82 that they would restrike uh, to accommodate this uh, acceleration lane. Um, part of uh, what we agreed to with, with uh, Roaring Fork Meadows was um, with that intent, which would actually uh, improve some of the asphalt 
at the intersection of Highway 82 in Hoagland um, with the idea that that um, area that, you know, essentially looks to the pull off right now, if it gets restriped as a, um, an acceleration lane, that would be the purpose is to better accommodate that mm -hmm. use. So um, th that, that was something that was being worked on by the Roaring Fork Meadows that, that you know, uh, we agreed to improve the lighting at the intersection um, to install the asphalt at that intersection, but the restriping and, and that coordination of CDOT we're doing in conjunction um, with, with that neighborhood initiative to try to improve that area. Okay, Patty has a question. Yeah, this, this is uh, on the document we got from Garfield and Heck under trucks and traffic. Just for clarification, semi-tractor trailers will be used for deliveries no more than four times per year. All their deliveries will be by straight trucks um, until an acceleration. So you're telling me that they'll use straight trucks until an acceleration lane is striped um, for the westbound entrance. Um, they'll be just using these straight trucks. I, I can speak. I can speak to this from an operational standpoint. Um, the uh, seasonal um, deliveries that, that would encompass um, that language of the semi-tractor trailer would be, in the essence of, of, of if we needed a, you know, a grain delivery. Um, it, again, because of, of the nature of business and how businesses uh, develop. You know, we, we don't anticipate even meeting that kind of volume initially that, uh, um, you know, we feel that, again, the straight truck uh, uh, language would accommodate our business enterprise and, and uh, you know, in the event that, uh, you know, this, this becomes something of heightened concern to us and the neighbors, you know, obviously, you know, um, you know this is a safety access uh, issue for us and, and if that, um, you know, lane isn't sufficient to uh, handle that kind of traffic, then, then we would we would fall back to just continue um, smaller deliveries. Um, oh, okay, you know, so you're saying that sem sem okay, yeah. my question is semis will or will not be used at any time during the year until the acceleration lane is striped, or permitted and striped? Right, we would not be using um, a semi-tractor. Okay. I just want to make sure that's clear in number four that's on the... Clear. Yeah. Luke, I have a clarification question. You, you're talking about the agreement with the neighbors. The way I read the agreement, it was two neighbors out of all several dozen neighbors. Uh, could you clarify who this written agreement is that you're basing all of your yeah. your things on? I'll let Matt. I'll I, let Matt I, I can speak to that, and if Mary Elizabeth wants to interject, she can. But um, that agreement was done um, with uh, the Roaring Fork Meadows HOA, so it encompasses that aggregate, and then it also included separate um, to that um, Dave Hodgkins, who owns the two parcels uh, um, th that are adjacent to that open space where that, that pond is installed, and I believe he owns the property. Um, maybe in that PUD and in Holland Hills as well, but he, he had multiple properties that he was representing. But um, the, the aggregate, um, you know, of Roaring Fork Meadows was, was also um, under that, that condition of agreement. Is that correct, Mary Elizabeth? That, that is correct. And I, uh, I know we've been, ta we've been talking about neighbors and our, our hope is when working through some of these, uh, while working through these terms and conditions that we added into the proposed resolution, that is a result of these discussions with Roaring Fork Meadows HOA and Dave Hodgkins, um, that a lot of the concerns that we understood from the July meeting and from the public comment that's been received do uh, center around the water and the traffic and the odors. And so, we're hopeful that, you know, what what we've crafted here might alleviate some of the concerns of the other objectors. And I've heard from a couple, and I'm not sure if they're on the phone, so I'll let them speak for themselves. A couple of folks did reach out and say that it did um, alleviate their concerns. And 
that we haven't heard from others. So, you know, again, I think when you get a public comment, you'll obviously hear whether or not it did. And one thing I was just going to add, uh, Commissioner Clapper, that uh, I applicant is okay with adding a term and condition um, instead of having the older um, issue only being brought up at you know the annual review to actually have that uh, sort of same complaint process that you have for the cultivation facility across the street so that it can be in a sort of real-time basis um, and we can work with Leslie on that language but that's something that applicant can agree to and also agree to a statement that there will be no odors. I mean, their, you know, their intention is using what's out there that is of the best practices and best management and that is, you know, odor free. So just wanted to follow up on your question about that earlier. Um, could you clarify what property is Roaring Fork Meadows? Luke, maybe putting a map back up would help. You're talking about a map? Yeah. It might have been Leslie's map. Yeah, I mean. So it's the former Barda, Barda Ranch? Yeah. It, yeah it's okay. this property to the, to the southeast, correct? Okay, so that's Correct. the and Bardas. Then, that's the Bardas farm, then. Okay, thank you. And Luke, yeah. I think. And then you, Dave Hodgkin owns this yeah. property up here. Yeah, I was going to. We've had mixed reviews from some of the neighbors within that HOA too. Right. So. Okay. Right. Um, go ahead, Luke. You need to go a public yeah. comment or two, Steve. That would be great. Yeah. Um. Uh, Again, in the uh, resolution, we, we speak to the hours of operation. Uh, that's in also the uh, agreement with uh, the, the papers we just mentioned. Um, I believe that that sums up our presentation, unless, uh, Matt, you want to close with any remarks, or Mary Elizabeth, if you have anything uh, you'd like to add um, before moving on to public comment. The only thing I was going to add is, um, and I don't know if John Ely is still on the phone, it appears that he may be, um, but I know Leslie had brought up at the beginning with her presentation that uh, the county attorney's office had had some concerns about the water, and I do believe we've worked through that, but I'd like for John to confirm that for the record. And I would just add as, as a concluding remark is, is um, you know, we, we take, take to heart, you know, the, the neighbor's concerns and, and obviously, you know, th this is a project that I wouldn't organize in, unless, you know, we planned on, on being, you know, uh, neighborly to, to all around us. You know, it, it's important for our project, it's important for our brand identity to to not only be a good neighbor to our direct neighbors, but, but good neighbors to the valley itself. So, um, you know, I, again, I've read each and in, in, in every one of the letters, and uh, you know, I'm hopeful if this project advance that we can show through through our continued good faith that um, you know we're, we're going to recognize and, 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 and deal with uh, anyone's concerns. And I appreciate Patty's comment that if something's raised to us. You know, really I'm not the type of person that will say, well, let's no, wait for the end of the video. I'll, I'll sure. say, let's, let's get on top of this and, and mitigate this if it's impacting somebody negatively. So, um, you know, okay. thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll go to George first and then Kelly. Um, maybe, maybe I missed this, but um, I know you've got some caretaker units on there, but I also thought you had, I think, six FTEs. and. I haven't heard anything about um, employee housing mitigation. Yeah, so I guess I can speak to that. Um, you know, uh, when we, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the distillery, basically it would include, um, you know, a master distiller, an assistant distiller. Um, you know, my, myself would be involved in administrative uh, work. Um, we would have agricultural workers that, uh, you know, would, would be on property. Um, and those numbers will vary, um, you know, depending on, uh, 
you know, uh, what's going on seasonally with us. I but, can't hear. Uh, you know, as far as the distillery operation, that'll be run by two. Uh, we'll be doing some administration work. Um, there might be a controller that might be on, on, on property as well at times. Again, as, as we ramp up, um, that's where the numbers uh, will be. But, uh, um, you know, from the distillery operation, it would be two full-time employees. So, so Leslie, do they need to uh, meet our um, employee mitigation um, requirements? So the employees that they're proposing are less than what are have been currently approved for the property. So that's why staff did not um, find that they needed um, any employee mitigation. And Matt, um, if you could speak up a little bit more, we're having a really hard time hearing you. Okay. Okay. Okay, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I need I need some points of clarification, please. So this is probably a little bit towards Leslie. Um, following up a little bit to George's point, I can you clarify for me since this really isn't a site plan, and you mentioned in your introduction that you guys have not confirmed the square footage currently on the site. Um, what what is that's being represented here in terms of buildings is subject to change between you know their special use approval and their formal site plan well it it could technically all change um but we would look at um the aspect that 30 percent of the property has to be cultivated we would look at our scenic um, guideline issues, um, neighbors would be noticed. Uh, we, again, like I said earlier, we would dive in and really verify what square footage on that site is legal square footage and what they can replace and not replace. We have a little bit of a template before us because in um, 2016, I think there was a, you know, the Four Seasons came through a couple different review processes for um, demolition and replacement, and there's documentation as to how much square footage is on the site, how much was acknowledged, and how much they were going to replace. They're, they came through and got a special review for a caretaker dwelling unit. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we would look at in any site plan review. and. Um, but in the resolution, we do have a condition of approval that all material, materials and representations made by the applicant shall be adhered to. So is this a material okay. represented by the? You know, I, th I think it's, it's really hard, and, and the comments we got on July 22nd from the board were the, you know, this just feels so nebulous and it's not something we can wrap our arms around. So I know the applicant, you know, didn't want to get to this point with this site point, conceptual site planning, but are providing it to kind of give a sense of what, what could occur on the property. Okay. And then I had um, two other questions. One is probably just something I've missed in my review over the past few times, but um, thinking specifically about the code, the addition of a new code definition, um, was this, was that sent out to caucuses for input and has there been any collaboration with any of our um, small ag folks who, who might themselves take a real interest in that definition of the code um, and perhaps trying to, you know, speak it for other zones in the county? To other caucuses, no, it is not. Um, this was, again, this only applies to this one piece of property. Um, they did, uh, the applicant did reach out and we did seek a referral comment from the town of Basalt because they had just completed their comprehensive master plan update and we have a referral comment from the town of Basalt and we uh, wove those comments that they gave us into the conditions of approval. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So Steve, 
stepped out and um, I'm, I'm the vice chair for our, our applicant center. So I'm gonna take over the meeting until he returns. And so let me check Kelly? in with, yeah. Yeah, I just want to, um, uh, Suzanne and I were just caucusing over here a little bit. And if, if this site plan aspect of this project is, um, is still a little too squishy for the board or you want to put some definitive aspects on the site plan, um, we could always we could always require that site plan could be done by the VOCC versus an administrative review. Great. Okay. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate that. It'd be helpful for me to clarify what you know what's concrete moving forward, and you know we want to manage expectations about what could or could not change. Um, okay. So let me check in with other board members to see if there's any additional questions for staff or the applicant. And I see Steve returning so then he can turn us to the public hearing before we do that. But are there any further questions from board members at this time? Patty. Well, I, I don't really have any questions. I just have issues that have not been addressed, but um, I'll wait for, I think we need to get to the public comment to to see where, where the public stands. If now we have total agreement from all the neighbors, it'll be a lot different, and I'm still hearing from neighbors that aren't in agreement, so I think we need to turn to public comment. All right, Steve, I'm giving the meeting back to you. Okay, I'm gonna open the public hearing. Uh, there are three callers on right now. Other people who are watching can phone in on the number that's listed on our agenda and also on the grassroots screen. So we'll go first to the phone number ending in 5660. And if you could unmute yourself and then you could have the floor if you want to make comment. Star six, is that correct? Star six to unmute. Let's go to phone number 8486. Do you want to make public comment? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would like to make a public comment. So, I, uh, so could you identify yourself, please? My name is Michael Murison. I on the property in the Hoagland Ranch HOA. And uh, I'm calling because I'm concerned that this is not accessory to agriculture what? still, that we're working to uh, a process to where this is just a distillery with a little garden on the side that uh, we made um, that there was changes in the uh, original code, the original zoning amendment that said, you know, primary ingredient had to be grown on site. And now that we're just, seems like the change is gonna make this into just a property that can simply have a distillery. And also, um, you know, we are still concerned about the water and uh, wastewater, <clears throat> wastewater uh, management is also a huge concern for the neighbors. And now we're hearing about biosolids being dispersed, which I have not fully, uh, I'm not buying into the fact that those won't smell given the sunshine. Um, and there was the, brought up the question of will the water when the water test for the well was done in June, it was high water. And it's definitely been a drought this summer. And will the recovery of the wells be the same in late July, early August as they are in May and June? So with all that being said, I still oppose this project. Since it's still, pretty holy or has a lot of holes in it. Um, you know, Matt or Mike or the uh, Emma Fields, they're 
you know, trying to make it feel really good. But I'm still concerned on the under, you know, the underlying content is not great for the residents of Picking County and the neighbors surrounding. So that's really all I have to say. I want to thank you all for your time. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, we'll try phone number 5660 again. Do you have a comment? Okay, they hung up. Uh, phone number that ends in 7209. Hi, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is Christina oh, Helm, and I am the... Can you hear me okay? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this is Christina Helm, and I'm the president on the board for the HOA for Holland Hills. And um, we did hear exactly just that, where, you know, one of the things was a lot of things were addressed um, for the, uh, like, immediately adjacent areas, but not a lot of things with Holland Hills. However, I mean, I do appreciate Matt has um, come to the table and answered some of the issues in our letter, as you all know. And so, I, I mean, I did notice that, and I, I greatly appreciate it. My concern is the same thing where it was brought up about the water, you know, at not being measured at a low time. Again, I'm going to be the first person people are going to be calling with water, <laughs> water issues. And so, you know, I would like to see, is there a way to get that, you know, as they go through demolition of buildings and everything, have that tested yet again, you know, I don't know. Um, the other thing was, I've got people who are a little bit scorned right now where, and they ha answers have been answered right now, but the thing is it took a meeting to find and a letter to finally get answers. And in some of our Zoom chats, which seemed very neighborly, very nice, um, I kept saying, we want either a plan B or if something happens, we don't want to be the person forgot about. You know, we want to be the people who like, we come to you and, say, you know, there's a limit, you know, there's 30 days, you need to respond to us or something if something happens so that things don't keep happening, you know, this it, it's not, it doesn't snowball. And so I'm a little concerned because it's been hard to get a response um, from things like that, even from easy talks. And now it's like, well, we're about to be neighbors. And I just want to make sure that if something happens, we're not waiting to have to go to the county and go to Big Brother, we can get this taken care of and get these neighbors taken care of quickly. Okay, is that all, Christina? I think so, yeah, the biosolids, that's the first time we've ever heard that, that's another thing too. And so, um, and then the other thing I saw, this is the first time, um, organic. Um, I wanted to ask about that because I know you can't have organic and then regular because of cross-contamination and pesticides and chemicals and so, I'm sure there's going to be some sort of a buffer. I don't see that. Obviously, it's not in the drawings. But how would you do that, and how would you have runoff from contaminating the organic? It's a pretty picture. It's a nice thought. You know, organic would say the wastewater is not so toxic, um, but it's not the organic side that's close to the houses <laughs> or the ditch. Okay. Thank you very much, Christina, for your comments. Uh, well, thank you, guys. Thank you. We'll go to Butch next. Hey, how you doing, guys? Hi, uh, Butch. Thanks for having the meeting. Um, Butch, yeah. could I get your full name again for the record? Roger William Orban the <laughs> second. Thank you, Butch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm still concerned about the water and the smells and. Everything Mike said was great. Um, well, I'm from, yeah, Holland Hill. Um, no, I'm from Hoagland Ranch Historic PUD. I uh, live next to Mike. I'm the vice president of the HOA. Mike's the president. And uh, very concerned I'm right in back of the um, first scene distillery. So 
Um, very concerned. Um, I had the I had a fence raised for the um, what is it? The, well, it's just for buildings and noise. Yeah, because they put a building there, right there by my property. So um, noise and buildings and uh, all the influx of traffic. Not too fond of that. Um, I would think that the distillery would have to um, have water shipped in. Uh, the well is um, domestic well only. So I don't believe that the BOCC should um, grant commercial use of that well, seeing as there's so many houses attached to it, the aquifer. Um, I, I would say they could only use water from another source, but um, so I'm still opposed to this. Uh, sorry to Emma Fields, but I don't believe this should go down. Okay, thank you, Butch, for your comments. Uh, let's go to phone number ending in 2005. It is 2005. Maybe 1099. Or maybe I'm looking at something else on here. When okay, 1099. Oh, they're up at the top now. They just need to unmute. Hello. Hello, we can hear Hello. you. Hello, uh, this is. This is David Lumpkins. I'm a property owner in the Roaring Fork Meadow. And uh, first of all, thank you for the thoroughness of this process. Really quite impressive what what you all do on a on a day to day basis. And I'm I'm afraid the concerns that I'm going to express are somewhat unoriginal. They're <laughs> a lot of the same concerns that everyone else has expressed, starting with just the, the, the definition of uh, accessory agricultural activities, um, it, it is very clear that there's no dimension of this that is agricultural in nature, uh, zero. This is a manufacturing operation, <clears throat> and it's going to have some, some acreage planted uh, for, for principally aesthetic reasons and to, you know, create a fiction that meets the permitting requirements, but there, there's no dimension of this that's agricultural. <clears throat> and I am just confused at the extent to which the uh, commission is trying to, you know, uh, go through uh, mental gymnastics to suggest otherwise. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Now, that's not dispositive. If, if the major objections could be addressed, uh, maybe it's worthwhile to, 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 to make that, um, to make that adjustment, to, to the, uh, um, literal interpretation of what the words say on, on the page. But, but the other objections are very important. First of which is water. <clears throat> and what the gentleman communicated today was, um, a significant improvement over uh, the last meeting and, and what he said would, uh, was pretty persuasive. If we can rely on that, and I'm well beyond my technical capabilities to have an opinion that is, is worth paying attention to, but one of the questions I would ask is, is a 12-hour test adequate? And this is going to be a 24-7 operation. They're going to be drawn from this well on a continuous basis, and, and it is a test that's limited to 12 hours adequate, and, and it is a test that's limited to the impact on that one well itself adequate, as opposed to uh, determining any impact on, on the surrounding wells. Now, if it's, a, if it's a completely different aquifer, and we can satisfy ourselves that that's the case, that's, that I think sort of addresses um, the, the issue. <clears throat> Um, but uh, I, I think some expert on the, the side of the BOCC needs to review this whole issue of water because this is, this is a binary issue. If, if we don't get this right, the impact on the surrounding neighbors is absolutely catastrophic. These are residences, 
and they got to have their water, and and their their rights are more important than the you know potential new entrant to to the neighborhood. Uh, next issue, traffic. <clears throat> um, this is a very concerning issue. This is a dangerous intersection. It's a dangerous section of 82. We all know about the fatality right down the road earlier this year. Uh, Hoagland Ranch Road is a steep grade. It's very treacherous in the winter. Uh, and there have been a few minor accidents uh, involving people sliding into other cars. Um, <clears throat> and and, and that, that could potentially be very concerning because if you've got commercial drivers coming in and out on a regular basis who are not uh, familiar with the uh, with the with the risk, and they come down and you know end up running in the back of a car waiting to get onto the highway and pushing them out into the highway in, in the winter time into you know 60 mile an hour traffic. That's that's a that's a terrible situation. Okay. And David, uh, you know, you, there, there David, wasn't you've used with, up your time. <clears throat> Um, sorry, oh. sorry to cut okay. you off, but we we have other people still to talk here. Thank you for okay. your comments. All right. Okay. Next, we have uh, the phone number ending in five six six zero. Do you wish to speak up for the public comment? Five six six zero phone number. Let them know they need to do star six to unmute. Push a star, uh, either unmute your phone or push star six on your phone. You could unmute your phone. Okay, let's go to phone number ending in 5776. Five seven seven six or five six six zero. If you're having difficulty getting on and can't unmute your phone, um, I'm not sure what to do. You could still send a written comment, perhaps. I don't know if we're going to reach a decision today or not, but um, okay. Let's uh, stop the, I'm going to close the public hearing for today then. I don't, I think we had everybody talk who was able to connect. Hello? To. Hello? Yes? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Oh, okay, finally. This oh, is uh, Margo Pendleton calling. And I am on the board of directors for the Holland Hills Homeowners Association. Um, I've been listening to a lot of this stuff. I, Holland Hills has 52 lots, two fourplexes, and one 12plex, all owned individual owners that enjoy their water. And we put, we put a whole lot of money into building our water system. And I am, I've listened, I've read the water reports. You know, I'm not a numbers person, so I get a little confused in it. But the, it does say that... Um, the maximum rate of water withdrawal is 20 gallons a minute. Um, and at that rate, the well should be operated four hours a day. Well, that was in the report, the water report that they sent. Um, and the other conclusion was everything was satisfactory to run this, this um, industrial use. I don't believe it. And I, and I saw the well report that came up, and I agree with Patty, yeah, we got a lot of water in June. We don't have much now. Um, a blind man could see we don't have a whole lot of water and it's getting worse. So I don't believe that that thing is gonna recover all year round as fast as it did on June 8th. I'm very concerned about the also using your treated wastewater for a supplemental irrigation. I don't know what all this stuff means, but it sounds like salt to me. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's the new environmentally um, idea for getting rid of whatever the stuff
stuff is that is created from distilling, but it doesn't make sense to me. What I am afraid of is they will need more water than they're claiming, even though they are changing the well designation to um, – because they've got a, an application in for a commercial well, which I believe allows them to pump more, more gallons. Um, I don't hear any mention of that, whether they've just decided not to use it. Um, then yesterday, I got this agreement that came out um, that David Hodgkin organized, and the Holland Hills members are not even mentioned. I find that very strange. Um, it says under the water uh, usage, any wa additional water beyond this amount will be supplied from alternative sources. Well, what the heck does that mean? Um, is that in a new well? As I move over and drill a deeper well, do I truck it in? Or do I just keep taking water out of the existing well? I need some answers to this. I feel very concern that we should not let this process go forward. This water thing could be catastrophic to our neighborhood. And you can't just, you either got to put some restrictions on them, there are tests or something that they can't, that, that you can visually see on a, on a monthly or quarterly or whatever basis to how this is going. But to just pass this through without saying anything about this water getting some really firm things about this water. I don't know if the Starfield and Heck thing will do it, but, you know, are we included? doesn't say so. It says everything around that area, and a lot of it belongs to David. So I don't know what to say. That's all i got to say, but I, I would really hope you not approve this at this time. And I also agree with the gentleman that, that spoke before, that the agricultural use is, give me a break. It's an industrial use. Okay, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, thank you, Margo. Uh, let's go to the number ending in 1422. Could you unmute yourself? Okay, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Donette Smith. Um, I've been in the Valley since 1998, and I've known Matt Patel for uh, going on four or five years now. And over the course of uh, our friendship and just getting to know him, I've witnessed a very, uh, a very diligent and uh, a caring individual and team that he's built that I really believe um, they'll be doing something incredible for this part of the Valley, this upper part of the Valley. I believe the community and Really, the neighbors will benefit from um, this project, and um, just want it to go on record that I fully support the project, believe in what he's building, and I believe it will provide a, again, a long-term benefit uh, to the Valley. Okay, thank you, Janet. No, uh, phone number ending in 3222. Oh, they hung up again or got cut off. They've been on there twice now. I think we've talked to everybody on there. Oh, the phone number ending in 5660. Butch has his hand up again. Butch, is it your wife that wants to talk? We could let her talk. I can't have you talk again. We've known Donette for. No, I don't want to. Okay. No. Yeah, I guess Lynn doesn't want to talk. Okay. I just wanted to say I've known Donette for 20 years. Okay. And um, I, I hope that she doesn't go through this. <laughs> okay. I love you, Donette, but no. Nope. Thank you, Butch. Call Donette on The phone number seven. Oh, that's Christina Helm again. Christina, if you have another family member, I can't have you talk again. Yes. But... Can you can you still hear us? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it <laughs> Okay. You can yeah. still hear us? Yes. Okay, so really quickly, and I also have my, my husband, and he's also with the Metro District. And one of the things we would like to clear We'd up like to hear him is that 
Christina, we need to okay, hear your husband, one second. not you again. He just, I just had him take a child away to the room. Um, give me one second. <laughs> So I've got him with the other, I've got him with the baby. So I, um, anyways, there are other wells in the Holland Hills area where there's Christine, private wells, Christina, but there are tax office for, but Christina, didn't do it. Excuse and, me. Uh, Christina, we can't hear from you again, but from your husband. But we need to hear from him now because a different has... person. Um, okay, there's the phone number three two 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 again. Give you another try. You need to unmute your phone. I guess they are just having trouble or just have been wanting to listen in perhaps. Bye. Okay. Three, two, two, two. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Tina Shaw. I live in Holland Hills. Uh, we've been very concerned. We are on a well uh, on our property, and we're very concerned about all of the things that that Margot has brought up, and several okay. of the other. Three, two, two, two. Go ahead. So Hello. Yes. yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tina Shaw. T Tina, we can hear you. Hill. No, she's got to turn off. Oh, other. Tina, you need to turn off your television I'm or your uh, connection to the grassroots. Very, one of the things that. Okay, we need to get this under control, guys. Margo has brought up. And several of the other. Three, two, two, two. Go ahead. Tina, we're getting Hello? feedback. Yeah. You need to turn Please. off whatever else you have going there and just talk on your phone. Turn off the oh, Tina, TV. Tina, turn off your television. I, your, I, uh, I did. I did. <laughs> okay, we need to do something about this because we're all getting a little frazzled and a little fried up. You need to turn off whatever else you have going there and just talk to your phone. I have. I did. <laughs> okay, I think we better. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tina. I don't know what how to fix the technological problem there, but we can. It's incomprehensible because it's all the feedback coming back on us. So um, I think I'm going to close the public hearing at this time um, and bring it back to the board for questions, comments. Um, can't, okay, Kelly, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I still think that there are unresolved um, items with regards to this application. Um, you know, for one, this still just really strikes me as a spot zoning, given this is the one parcel in the county for which this one zoning language change, code language change will apply to. Um, I, I think it would help. So that's a concern I continue to have, um, you know, perhaps seeking additional input from some other um, some of the other interested things that I mentioned earlier might help with that, but um, I think it would help me between now and the next hearing also, if Leslie, could you bring forward the language in the code that refers to industrial uses and manufacturing uses, just to sort of compare it um, side by side with the language that we're referring to so that we we are very clear-eyed about you know whether we're talking about agriculture or industrial or manufacturing 
um, would help for that. Um, I'm not sure I'm ready to advance this to second reading yet. Okay, thank you, Kelly. George. Um, I don't know where to begin. Um, water obviously is, is a big issue. And uh, I agree with the comments that testing a well in June uh, where you've got high water uh, is going to be different than not even, I wouldn't even say July or August, but where we're going to see, and, and I'm on a well, where we're going to see a, a difference with this route is, is meaning to us is by looking at testing in January because that's going to be the test. And here, here you've got an operation that is going to be needing to utilize water year round. And so I, I don't know how we can um, count on a test that, that happened in June when we're not going to see the results of this drought until January. Um, you know, I went through this process uh, with the, with the um, grow facility, uh, I had similar concerns, water, odor, industrial. Uh, I was overruled by the board, and uh, the neighbors had to deal with those impacts for two years. Um, and I just don't think it's fair to have the neighbors have to deal with uh, another impact like this, even though we're going to try to regulate and watch to ensure that odors don't exist or water is going to be plentiful. I, I, it just isn't fair for a residential community to have to deal with, with these issues. Uh, I believe that it is basically a, uh, an industrial use. It's a, it's a brewery, um, and it's just probably not in the right location to be in a, in a residential neighborhood. So at this point, I, I can't support going forward with it. I'll jump in. Patty? Yeah, um, I continue to be extremely concerned about the that stretch of the Roy and Clark River. I'm taking my mask off, you guys, because it's I, Steve. Sorry, but I've got to no for um, with the Roy and Clark River at the water levels. We have spent a great deal of time and energy and money in Picking County to try and keep water in that stretch of the river, and we did it because of the quality of the river, the health of the river, the aquatic life, the recreational use. You know, and um, to de to have, be concerned about that water level being drawn down further at any time of the year is really bothersome to me. Um, I'm concerned about the neighbors' wells. We got a call from the Crystal River Valley from neighbors who are having trouble with their wells, wanting the county to supplement them with water. We don't want to get ourselves into another situation like that. It's very critical. This is a water-intensive use. I appreciate Mr. Patel's working with the neighbors, trying to come up with a workable solution, but there are still neighbors out there really concerned about their water in the future, and we have to be, we have to understand and support that. Um, I have a concern about, it's not gonna be open to the public, but there's gonna be private tastings. So we're concerned about highway safety there, but we're gonna bring people in and have them sample vodkas or whatever we don't even know what the product is bourbons or tequilas or gins and then put them out on a section of highway that we're already saying is dangerous i'm concerned about public safety with that um and in support of kelly i do see this as a spot zoning issue and if we're going to change the accessory agriculture because i am hugely supportive of our sustainable ag and our young farmers in this valley we need to look at the broader picture and not just do it for one property even though those other properties those other sustainable ags on different zones would be able to take advantage of they still have to go through a special process so I, I, that's a great concern to me so right now um i agree with george i'm not comfortable moving this forward um, if we, if the applicant wanted to continue it to a date unknown, to be determined out there, I don't know what the obligation is for that, to do more water testing in low water seasons, to try and address the issues of the private wells, and to, to, to really contemplate whether or not they want to open this distillery for private tastings 
and parties with this beautiful park and these beautiful walkways and amenities and sculptures. Um, I'm just greatly concerned about it. Greg? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I guess I'm, I don't want to pile on entirely because I have to say, I really uh, like what I heard in the presentation. I, I admire the vision that uh, Matthew Patel's brought to this. Um, but I, it's also, it's pretty hard to interpret what's actually going to happen because it's not fully cooked because they're not fully committed yet. And I understand why they, they don't own the property yet, but they're, so they're fishing. And, and uh, I think they've done a great job in putting together, you know, an idea. And I, and I was, I was beginning to really appreciate certain aspects of it. And, and I want to thank you for bringing it forward. Um, I do have some questions about, uh, you know, how, how does the use of this site differ from what happens just down the road and, and the rental and the, the other places, the other commercial operations that are right on the highway, just down the street. And, um, you know, so it's, I think a lot of the concerns people have, uh, they probably have the same concerns about existing businesses that are already operating in the same ways. And, and so I really want to be fair to the applicant. Um, so having said that, I want to encourage them to keep going. It sounds like you've made progress with your neighbors and you've made progress in your conversations, uh, but maybe it's not quite there yet. Um, I would love to know what the wells are telling us right now, what a well test would tell us now or in January, as George says, because water is by far the most important thing uh, right in here. Um, I wasn't present when the, uh, the grow facility was first installed just down the road, but I do recall how difficult it was. And I remember hearing from my fellow board members and uh, you know, with the reviews and having to put in the odor mitigation equipment, which I think was in the range of a million bucks or more to try to mitigate the odors. Um, and they had water issues. I don't know if they're still, if they're trucking water in or maybe they're pumping it out of the river, but they, that all the same issues came up. So I'm, I'm hearing what my fellow commissioners are saying and I'm, I'm heeding their words and I'm, I'm feeling very cautious about this. Uh, so I think we need to employ what we've learned from the previous experience. Um, uh, I want to see if there's anything else here. I think that's it for my list of questions, but in general, I'm in agreement, and I don't know if we're going to continue this or if we're going to, uh, I don't know how to proceed. I guess everybody's got their hand up. I pushed a button somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, Kelly, you're next. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, going first, I hadn't fully formulated all my thoughts, and I, I respect all of you who have been so articulate so late in the day <laughs> on this. But um, so I do want to, um, you know, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit because I know we also support, um, you know, diversifying our agricultural um, production in our valley. And I don't want to lose sight of that. And that also that the, whoever owns this property has certain rights. And, you know, they're, there's been no objection or there's been no calling into question the legality of the right of the well or the right of the Kester ditch water. You know, if that one ditch runs dry, that's going to affect their operations a whole lot um, different, you know, differently than any regulation would. So, you know, there's, I think that I'd like to see the conversations continuing. I think that, um, you know, if there could be some focus on a, a lever or an agreement that would cause the applicant to quickly adjust if there's any negative impact to other wells, similarly to how we've tried to set up a trigger for um, negative impacts related to odor, um, that's some language coming forward on that. I think working with the going to find out, you know, what type of negative effect would they experience that would cause a reaction from the applicant that's acceptable to all parties um, and you know continue those negotiations along those lines might help to get at that um, because even if this is an AR10 zone district you know they would have a residential well they would have opportunities to irrigate for agriculture so that's not different here in this application 
and um, you know, I would like to just see some fine fine tuning because you know I'm not trying to do mental gymnastics here, as, as one um, commenter mentioned, but I am trying to balance the property rights of, of whoever owns this property with um, all of the neighborhood concerns, and I, and I do continue to think we can find that balance. Uh, George. <laughs> yeah, I just need to um, comment on some of the last commissioner's comments. Um, uh, this area is a non-conforming area. There are commercial uses. Those commercial uses are not using water. Uh, those commercial uses are not um, industrial. They're small businesses. So it, it, you're, you're not talking uh, apple. You're talking apples to oranges. Um, if it was an ag, you utilize as an ag property, uh, you use you use the water that you have, and when wa and when the water is turned off, your your ag is done. Steve knows that, and I know that. Uh, if you rely on the ditch water and you get a call, you're 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 out of luck. And so, uh, again, you can't tell what's going to happen with our water in, in August or September. You're going to know more in January, and that's going to draw down and affect any existing water tables. So if you want to wait to January and do another test, that's fine. This is not an owner of the property. This is someone who, who's thinking about purchasing property. And, um, you know, the, in, the possible impacts down the road for a residential community, I think that Marco said um, 22, 52 lots, uh, 24 duplexes, one triplex. There's a lot of uh, residential owners, renters in, in this area. This is not, this is not a... Emma Farms, Emma Fields is, is sort of a misnomer. This is as much close to Emma as, as Woody Creek, and I think they're trying to build on Emma as an agricultural community, which it is, which it is versus a residential area in the Mid Valley uh, with a lot of small commercial uses. So I, I'm not going to support it. Okay, um, I do have comments. Uh, two people on the applicant's team wish to speak. Um, Mary Geiger, I'm going to call on them and then I'm going to make my comments. Uh, so briefly, Mary, Mary first and then Matthew. Sure. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I, I just wanted to, as, as you know, I understand the water being a huge concern um, and I, I definitely don't disagree that we won't feel the effects or see the effects of this drought until a couple months from now um, because it takes that much time for it to, you know, work itself through the river. So that being said, you know, one thing that uh, Alan Leake and I had talked about uh, prior to this meeting, you know, knowing that water was going to be a hot topic, uh, is trying to incorporate, and I can't remember which commissioner uh, mentioned this, Something though similar to with the odor complaints, but to have we could build in a requirement that in the field has to uh, do more, you know, once operations start, um, have a test done at three months and at six months to measure the water levels. Uh, even we can have an observation well, whether we pick a couple of the neighbors wells to use as the observation wells to see if there's an actual you know what effect it has on those particular wells in question or have an observation well um drilled for that purpose and uh i've got i'm probably messing this up from an engineer speak point of view uh we would work on though some language for that sort of term and condition because i get it and i think we can't we do have the limitations of the 15 gallons per minute self-limitation as well as 187,000 um, gallons per month um, self-limitation. So we always stay within those, but then have this monitoring available um, and, you know, see what happens. I mean, if, if the river drops or the water table drops that much, it's going to have an effect on this well too. And that might be something to have to go back and look at. So, uh, 
I would like to offer that as another term and condition, um, knowing that in this distillery would not start operating immediately. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I did uh, look up the definition of light industrial that's in the land use code. And I do believe this is really distinguished from that because that says that it's a use engaged in the manufacturer predominantly from previously prepared materials of finished products or parts, including processing, fabrication, assembly, and treatment and packaging. And here, you know, these we're starting with a, you know, straight from a grain or an agricultural product. We're not starting from a prepared product and then making something different. And so I'd just like to offer that distinction um, for some of the concerns regarding whether this is really just industrial or if it's related to agriculture. Um, and finally, uh, we did get, you know, public comment from Harper Kaufman, who owns the Two Roots Farm and Emma, in support of this um, proposal, and, you know, that they feel that other local growers would benefit from this. I know that Mr. Patel, or Dr. Patel, excuse me, has talked with local growers about uh, getting product from them. So, I think to to say that this really moves away from agricultural, and remember it's accessory to agricultural use. Uh, it is, you know, distilling starts with an agricultural product. So I just wanted to offer those comments and, um, you know, we can also certainly go out even next week, I realize it's not January, but do another pump test too, which might provide some insight as to what's happened between now and June. Thank you. Okay. And I appreciate all of you. Know, it's been a long day. Thank, thank it you. has been a thank long day, and, 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 I'll, no. and I'll be brief. And, and speak loudly, Matthew, so we can all hear you. Okay, sorry about that. I, I appreciate it, that it's been a very long day, and if there's one thing I am, it, it, it's a good listener, and I've, I've listened to not only the comments of the concerned neighbors, but, but the debate here amongst the commissioners, and I appreciate all the dialogue. You know, a couple of things. Um, you know, one is... You know, I'm, I'm not a person to bait and switch. So, you know, when we generated these numbers for potential, you know, water consumption, you know, these are scenarios that might occur in year four of a successful operation. It, it's it's not a situation on, on day one, um, you know, are we going to be pulling that kind of water volume in. Um, again, this is a, a special use permit that's reviewed annually. So I agree with Mary Elizabeth, the idea of setting up monitoring wells, looking at our ramp up, looking at our impact, doing other pump tests at particular times of the years, we can be, um, you know, uh, adaptive to, you know, the concerns of the water consumption of the project. You know, again, the, the tenant of this project is sustainability. Five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, I'm sorry, it, in, in environmental stewardship, and, and that's the, the goal. And, you know, speaking to, to Mr. Newman's comment about, you know, the Emma Field, again, that's the caucus I was in. That, that was the origin behind the name. And, and this is about reclamation of, 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 of agriculture as a visual set point, you know, for the valley. I, I'm not saying that there's mixed uses there, but I'm trying to create a beacon of, of what, you know, you know, historically occurred there, but, but create a sustainable business that'll, that'll help other local growers that have 10, 15 acre plots to collaboratively um, have a use. You know, there needs to be processing facilities within 15 counties that support these farmers, and this is one avenue for it. There's not many pieces of land available for these kind of projects. You know, to think that something better is going to come for this parcel that makes more sense, that fits with, you know, the vision of the county, I don't know what it would be, but I have hard money in it. So to think that I'm just doing a, a passive look at it is unfair. And the amount of resources I put together, uh, you know, to engage the professionals to put together the detailed proposal, I, I think speaks of my commitment. Um, you know, so I'm not just, you know, kicking tires and seeing what happens. I'm committed to the project. I think it'd be a great beacon for Pitkin County. They don't have anything like it. And I think it would speak to a lot of uh, different people in different ways with, with what we could do there. But um I'm willing to adapt to whatever standards without being cumbersome to the county, um, you know, but we, we'd like to get, you know, started, and, and it's hard to advance the project until we can get started, but, but you would just say my word that we would work with you on whatever monitoring process we would need to, um, to, to 
you know, follow through on, on our commitment to environmental stewardship. Okay, thank you, Matthew. And um, I'm going to speak now. Uh, to me, this feels like an industrial process. When you look at the two other distilleries in the valley, one is in downtown Carbondale, the other one's in the Basalt Trade Center. Both of them use agricultural products to produce what they're producing. The, the Woody Creek Distillery uses potatoes that they grow on you know, area farms and then they take it to, to the distillery which is not in a residential neighborhood, it's in a more of a, you know, it's in a business park kind of area. I think that would be a more appropriate type of area to put um, the distillery. I, I don't think it fits into um, AR-10 kind of a residential neighborhood like is in the Holland Hills area. Um, you, show, you showed pictures of the Two Roots Farm. If you were proposing to do a copy of the Two Roots Farm on this property where you would actually be processing the, the vegetables that you're producing on the ag land in a small processing facility, I don't think we'd be having this discussion right now. I think everybody would say that's perfectly fine because you would be processing the food you are growing on your own land. In this case, if, if this property was a thousand acre grain farm and could produce a whole lot of grain and you wanted to have the processing, the distillery in one corner of the property, it probably would fit into that kind of operation. But as it is, you're going to have to be trucking in grain from not that hardly any people in the Roaring Fork Valley grow grain anymore. You're going to end up bringing in grain from hundreds of miles away, most likely. You'd be able to stimulate some local food production in the Roaring Fork Valley, and I commend you for trying, trying to do that. Um, I don't think this is the right property for doing this on. Um, then when I get to the issue of the spot zoning, uh, with this being the only unzoned piece of land in all of Pitkin County, it was identified in 1987 that it needed to be rezoned mm -hmm. and I don't know why it hasn't been rezoned yet. Um, that would be the first step I want to actually see for this property is to rezone it to whatever is determined by the, the basalt area master plan process that is underway. And I'd like to hear from the staff when, what's the timeline on uh, finishing that master plan process. I'd like to expedite it and get that discussion done and, you know, move forward on this property getting, you know, maybe it won't be zoned AR-10, maybe it would be zoned what the, the other non-conforming uses are down, down the highway towards basalt. But I think that's really the first step that we need to do. I'm not totally opposed to doing the agricultural accessory uses type of language in the land use code and potentially adding in a distillery or you know that kind of a processing thing in that zone district um, but at this point I'm not ready to say that uh, I would approve applying that uh, agricultural accessory use to this piece of property I think it's actually premature. So um, I'll leave my comments at that and bring it back to the board. George? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion and we'll see how it goes. Let me just pull it up here. I'd like to make a motion to uh, deny the ordinance adopting amendments to section 11-10 and section 3-80-30C of the 2006 Pitkin County Land Use Code, 
Title VIII of the Pickett County Code, specifically creating a definition for accessory agricultural use and listing accessory agricultural use as a special review use in the unclassified zone district and an amendment to the Pickett County zoning plan. I'll second. Okay, it's moved by George and seconded by Patty to deny. Um, John Ely has his hand up. Thanks, Steve. Uh, George and um, Patty, as a second, I'd ask you to consider uh, rather than denying this application that you simply not accept on first reading the proposed code amendment. Uh, I'd also uh, suggest that you make a finding of fact that the unclassified zone district is not appropriate for this property by its very definition as plain as the described in the land use code and that the unclassified zone district is not in keeping with the down valley master plan for this property um, and that as a consequence of the zone district being inappropriate the amendment itself is inappropriate for this particular property that the zone district and the amendment would apply in the county only to this property and by the terms of the zone district would never be applied anywhere else in the county and that as a consequence of the potential zone district you are creating accessory use which is greater than in scope and an impact than any pr underlying principle use. Um, with those findings of fact and the the change of the action from deny to not accepting on first reading if that's acceptable to uh, George uh, as the maker of the motion and Patty as the second, um, I would uh, I would recommend that. I, I will amend my motion to uh, the wording given by our county attorney, and I'm sure our county clerk will be able to scribe that in for the record. And I will second George's motion. Okay, Patty accepted George's um, amend, amendment to his motion. Um, is there further discussion from commissioners? Pa uh, Patty, Kelly. <laughs> John Ely, um, chewing over what you have presented, I guess where I'm confused is that this zone is in keeping with the Down Valley master plan because that's what it is and that's what has not been updated so what am i misinterpreting here the unclassified zone district in the land use code is defined as a zone district that includes properties in the county which have not been rezoned for uses because of their distance from development areas and or a lack of a land use plan those two prongs that need to be present for this zone district to be employed or not present for this particular property. It's simply an anachronism. It was called out to be, uh, or should have been rezoned after the Down Valley plan in 87, 89, whatever year that was, and simply was not rezoned. It should not be unclassified now. And because of that description associated with the unclassified zone district, Quite frankly, there are no properties in Pickens County that fit that description. The zone district will never be used again. Okay, does that satisfy you, Kelly? Greg? Anybody else have any comment for the I'm, comments? I'm I'm fine. I'm I'm uh, no comment. Okay, um, I will make a comment. I think we all know where this uh, motion is heading for approval by the commissioners. Um, Matthew, this project you've come up with is pretty innovative, and I thought, think you, I know you put a lot of thought into it. Um, in another location, it could actually be a perfect spot for it um i urge you to keep looking for you know look for a different piece of property in the roaring fork valley to build the distillery it could potentially be tied into actually this property with this property producing some of the food for it um, so i don't want to be totally 
negative to what you have done because it's pretty innovative and uh, you have some good ideas there. And we are always trying to encourage um, alternative agricultural uses in the Roaring Fork Valley and producing more lo locally produced food and th those kind of things. Um, Kelly. So, you know, I can literally agree with what um, John Ely has said, and I've represented my concerns about, you know, the spot zoning and the, and the way, the manner in which that this, this zoning definition has come to us. Um, functionally, you know, this kills their project, which, um, you know, vote, or functionally voting yes to not to not accept, um, you know, functionally kills their project, which I'm not sure I'm ready to do yet because I want to honor all the work that has been achieved in every step that this project has moved forward. That's where I stand personally. Now, what this seems to do then is by finding that if we would carry, carry that non-acceptance language through towards future applications of anything there, is this now, and I guess this is the question for Johnny Lee, is this now hanging up this property until our planning staff finalizes their master plan for that area? No, not necessarily. No. There is a viable master plan that's already been done. It has been a while since it was written, but there is nothing infirm about it, and it is controlling for this particular area. The property by the by by virtue of the zoning the property is a, a singularity there is nowhere else in the county as you yourself said kelly and, and actually pointed it out to me i thought there were a couple of other instances of this zone district uh and i was wrong so the 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 down valley master plan does not recognize this type of a use on this particular property or within the area of this particular and so what needs to occur is either a use that is consistent with the existing zone, which is unclassified, which is the anomaly, but it would not increase the anomaly by looking to modify the zone district in order to shoehorn a use in that does not necessarily conform with the plan. So you would have to look at rezoning the property, which can be done individually by an applicant or property owner or by the county itself. But the zone district that would be employed on this property would be a zone district that is not an isolate, not a, a singularity in the county, and would so therefore would be more applicable to other properties and would be in conformance with the underlying master plan, the Down Valley plan. Because if the zone district is not, then what you're doing is you are getting pretty close to the, the edge of the cliff on spot. And so what you really calling out is somewhat exactly what Steve said, that the property is not currently zoned the way it should be, that it should be AR1, AR2, something, something appropriate for that area. And that uh, appropriateness would be judged by the surrounding quality of development in that area. It would be a reflection of how the neighborhood has changed from the point in time of this zone district, which antedates the down valley plan by a long shot um, and it would be something in conformance to the plan that we do have or the next plan if the property isn't the zoning isn't changed before there is another uh, master plan or a revision to the down valley plan. so all of those things being present create a valid zoning for the property and could at that point then consider well this agricultural uh, use ex or agricultural accessory use is this appropriate for other properties in the county or is this the only location where it's appropriate and if it's appropriate for other locations it should be at least something that you would anticipate would be considered for the straight out agricultural zone districts in the county uh, where currently there is no such language as being proposed for the unclassified zone district associated with any of our straight on agricultural 
So that would be the process forward. It does not freeze the use of the property by any means um, at, at all. Uh, and, and so the path forward would be something like that, as opposed to trying to amend a zone district that is, uh, like I said, it's on its way out. It, it will never be employed anywhere else in the county. It's by its own terms, it just doesn't fit in. Mm -hmm. Okay, Steve, I have a real So it, it definitely, it stops, the, it stops this particular project, you're correct, but it doesn't stop planning for the use of the property, which might even include something like this, but it would be done under a different auspices. It would be done with, uh, in, a, in a manner that would fit the neighborhood as opposed to inviting a use that perhaps does not in the judgment of the BOCC. So, and the reason why I suggested um, the not accepting as a versus denial is that the only real action in front of the board for today is whether or not to accept on first reading a proposed code amendment as opposed to reviewing and passing on the special um, the special review approval. So John, my question real quick Howdy. for the applicant, um, by not moving forward the ordinance adopting the amendments, when can the applicant bring forward an application after more information, more water testing or whatever? I know if we did a denial of the application itself, there's a waiting period before an applicant can bring back something, which is six months. Is that correct? But in yeah, this but case, really... in this case, we're simply not moving forward on first reading the ordinance, adopting amendments to sections, whatever. So that really doesn't affect the applicant's specific application. I'm seeing you it shake your head the... like I'm right. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, 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 does affect the specific application because the specific application is contingent upon a code amendment. Without the code amendment going forward, the application as it exists has no place to go. No, no, I know that, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't put him into the time frame of having to wait six months or whatever to bring back a new application. That's why I was nodding my head. That's okay. correct. The that's that's all that's only student. where I was going. Okay. Kelly? So then the path forward for the applicant would be to um, apply to rezone it and in a way where such a use would be allowable. That would certainly be a predicate. Whether or not the Board of County Commissioners determines this use to be appropriate in any zone district is a question to be determined later. The same issues would be present in a different zone district that are present for this particular use. It's simply that the zone district puts forward the, the initial decision point in this application. Okay, can we okay, maybe- Okay, further commissioner comments or questions? Seeing none, uh, you know seeing none, I'll call the question all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm opposed. Okay, four to one with Kelly being the nay vote on the motion. And then next, that makes item number 12 or 17 be a moot point, right? The resolution granting special review approval? Well, that particular item was not um, on the agenda for action. It was something that was trailing the code amendment. So the code amendment would have to be passed on right. second reading before the item could be considered. But I'm saying is we don't need to take any action on that resolution. No. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you all for your time. I really appreciate the effort, the time, the knowledge, um, the planning, the preparation, and I do appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank all of thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have one more item on our agenda, and that's open discussion. Is there any open discussion? I have one really quick one. Do we have any more information about Senator Bennett coming to visit? And if so, when, where, what time? Was it next week he was coming, Kelly? 
I haven't. I don't. Uh, I it, was the, <laughs> that, it was the second and third. Second or third Charlotte was in touch with his office, but I haven't heard from Charlotte, okay. so no new information. All right. I'll just check in while I'm out of town because I'm going to get home because I'm leaving for really early in the morning. Thank Bye. You, Thank Suzanne. you. Thank you, Thank you, Leslie. Um, Rich told me that he had to drop off, but he sent an email updating about highway cleanup and also requesting that the um, no idle signs be placed in the car pickup lot at the airport. Just so he asked me to report out yeah. on that. And I wanted I sent him back a thank you because I did ask for those no idling signs and that they're going to just try and work out a really short span cleanup just to make it damp it. They're still following through with the letter to CDOT, um, requesting that CDOT, who's getting money to clean up the highway, come up here and clean up the highway. So we're getting there, Greg. We're getting there. Greg gave a thumb up, thumbs up. And now I would really like to make a motion to adjourn, please, folks. Second. Okay, it's moved and seconded to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you, grassroots. Thank, Thank you. you all. See you soon. Bye, Bridget. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Whoops. Thank you.